Welcome to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Well, I'm so glad to have three current veterinary students from the University of Florida here with me. We have a first year, a second year, and a third year to talk to you about what their experience has been like so far, what they wish they had known, and how the adventure and the journey is going for them. And I'm going to let my guests introduce themselves, starting with our first year student. Hi, my name is Erica. I went to the University of Central Florida, and currently I want to do small animal medicine, but I'm not sure exactly what within it. Awesome. Thanks, Erica. And now our second year student. Hi, my name is Amanda. I did my undergraduate degree here at the University of Florida, so I've been a gator for quite some time. Uh, When I grow up, I want to be a small animal general practitioner, but I'm leaving my options open at this point in time. Hi, my name is Tyler. Um, I am a third year and I went to Florida State University for undergrad. Um, And right now, I think I would like to do a rotating internship in small animal after I graduate and then probably pursue emergency medicine um, and possibly a residency in dermatology. You'll notice we don't have a fourth year student here today, and that's because during the spring semester of your fourth year at UF, you spend it on clinical rotation. So all of our fourth years are wearing their white coats and preparing to graduate by working with their patients in our hospital. All right, so now let's get into it. Um, You know, today the whole point is to let pre-vet students know uh, what the four years or the three years that we have students represented today are like at UF. So I'm going to go ahead and start with the interview process. I actually interviewed twice. I did not get in my first time around, but I do think that was a great experience to get prepared for the interview the second year. My second year was one of the best days of my life. It was so uh, laid back. The interviewers were so kind to me. It was a really great experience overall. I was really happy with it. I think my interview went really well. It was very conversational. As soon as I walked in the room, they kind of told me like, okay, sit down, like get comfortable, take a breath. Like they made they made me feel comfortable as soon as I walked in. I had a similar experience. Um, I do think that it was very conversational, but um, they also did ask uh, controversial questions that you know I had prepared for. So I I was excited to be able to answer those and, and share with them what I had prepared for. So it sounds like everybody had a conversational experience, a positive experience. So you got through that scary moment and then you got your acceptance letter. We'll go ahead and take you all through the first three years. I mean, obviously expected it to be hard, but I guess coming straight from undergrad, like I wasn't expecting the the change in the schedule where you have almost like a final exam every couple weeks. I'm used to taking like semester long classes and then you know, you kind of have time to prepare for the exams. Um, But this is very fast paced and it's a lot of time management and keeping up with the material. You don't really have a lot of time to slack or um, to push things off. But outside of that, since first year is is everything in the classroom pretty much. Um, I've gotten involved with clubs and organizations outside of the classroom that's allowed me to get some actual like hands-on experience. So with Operation Catnip and volunteering with the Shelter Med Club and Project Heal, I've gotten to do things such as like perform my first neuter, which was really cool to do like the first semester of my first year. I wasn't expecting to get that in. So it's really it's been a roller coaster, but I've I've loved it so far. Yeah, I'm glad, Erica, that you brought that up. So UF has a very interesting schedule where we will provide many classes each semester, but on a very uh, quick timetable. So the great thing about that is, you know, you don't have to wait till the end of the semester to take all of your exams. You'll take them every few weeks, which is intense because you're learning it quickly. But then once you're done, you are done. So Amanda, let's come to second year. So second year, I hear, is pretty intense. What is the difference (laughs) between first and second year? Well, I think Erica hit the nail on the head. Um, A rude awakening was first year, but second year, it's another rude awakening, I'd say. (laughs) The analogy that a lot of the professors use is that it's like you're drinking from a fire hose. There is so much information that is coming to you that you have to be able to absorb. And what I've really learned is picking out what's important. So, of course, you have to study for the exams and the nitpicky information, but uh, what I mostly focus on studying is the clinical aspect of things and how I'll apply things once I'm on clinics. Second year compared to first year is much more, um, we start learning the abnormal animal and the disease processes and how to treat them. So it's been a lot more interesting and I've been able to apply a lot of clinical experience to the classes that we're taking. So hang in there, Erica, you'll get there. (laughs) 
Tyler, tell them and tell our audience what clinics are like. As you can imagine, um, applying everything you learn first and second year is it's it's a lot of information to try and absorb and then apply. Um, but it's uh, it's a learning process in every rotation. So it's every rota- you, most rotations are two weeks long, um, and usually the first couple of days is spent trying to figure out the rotation and kind of how each doctor works and what information is most important to them. The doctors really allow you to. Um, be the doctor and formulate plans and treatments and making decisions whether, and, and learning if those decisions are something that's, you know, the right one or the wrong one. I know if I were a vet student, I think I'd like clinical, the clinical rotations the best. Um, but, you know, for the first two years, that's not an option. So we're going to go back to Erica. Erica, uh, you're in the second semester now of your first year, as we've said. Uh, talk to me about what students can do before they get to vet school to prepare for the change. One piece of advice that I have for um, people looking to go into vet school is that not get too stuck on one type of study habit because I've found that with all the different classes I have a different routine for each one just based on how the material is presented, how the professor teaches. It takes a little bit of time to get used to kind of like, okay, this is how I'm going to study for this class and this is what I'm going to do for that class, but kind of being able to be flexible in that regard I think has helped me to do well in my classes overall. So you guys can't see this, but when she, when Erica mentioned having different study habits for each class, all three of their heads were nodding like, yes, that is true. (laughs) I've heard that from many students that how you studied in undergrad is not necessarily how you're going to study in vet school, and it does change with each um, class, which means you do need to be flexible. You need to know how you study. You need to be willing to change things up so you can't be rigid in that way. So great advice, Erica. So Miss Amanda, uh, you're getting ready to go into clinic soon. So tell me how students need to be thinking about how they interact with humans and people and client communication and education because that's what you're getting ready to do. So how are those pieces important for clinical rotations? Well, um, believe it or not, the clients pay the bills and walk your pets through the door. So we have to be able to talk to clients and be able to um, extract information from them in a way that you can apply it to the patient at hand and figure out what's actually going on. Um, We actually do a lot of communication skills in our um, clinical skills course. We have um, mock uh, client interactions, which are honestly kind of nerve-wracking, but they're a great job at preparing you to um, ask open-ended questions, kind of ask leading questions to get answers out of your client, because if you ask a question with a yes or no answer, that's just how they will answer. So it's, um, you know, great learning how to extract information from people. Yeah, that's a great point. So let's go ahead and give an example of uh, questions right now, Amanda. So um, pretend I'm a client, would you? And go ahead and ask me a closed-ended question so our audience would know what that would look like. Um, Has Fluffy been vomiting? No. So that's a closed-ended question. It's a yes or no response. It doesn't give us a lot of information. I mean, I guess it's good to know that Fluffy's not vomiting, but, you know, she doesn't get anything from that. So let's hear her ask an open-ended question. Tell me about Fluffy's diet. Oh, yeah. You know, Fluffy's diet's really interesting. I put Fluffy on an all-vegan diet, (laughs) and uh, I feed her, you know, five times a day, and we usually sit together at the dining room table. So that told her so much more, didn't it? It really gave us an interesting look into Fluffy's lifestyle at home. So open-ended questions are your friend. You know, we've talked a little bit about what the three years look like at vet school and some of the highlights are that you know we have an interesting curriculum and you have opportunities to go and work in the hospital but now let's talk about some fun things Pre vet students tell me that they're worried that once they get to vet school, they're not going to have a life anymore. They won't get to participate in their hobbies anymore or have fun, and they're constantly going to be sitting and studying. And while that might be true for some folks, I'd love to hear from you guys and find out is that true for you? I think that finding a good group of friends in the beginning or just kind of falling into a good group of friends really helps with that. Uh, what I was most surprised about in vet school is that the competition is it's not really there anymore. It's a kind of a family environment. Of course, it's not all school. We still go out for things after school, go exercise together. Um, There's a lot of fun things that we can do to keep the sanity, but finding a good group of friends and remembering that it's not all competition once you're in vet school um, is a great way to kind of keep that peace. Tyler, you're in a relationship. Talk to us about how um, you're still able to have a, a healthy relationship while in vet school. 
you know, I, I think that it's different for everybody, but she's super supportive and really helps me out, you know, helps me with making lunch and dinner and taking care of our animals and being able to and allowing me to be able to study and have that time. Um, so it's been extremely helpful for me. We play in a kickball league every Wednesday night, um, and that's something that we've been doing for over a year now. We've won five championships, um, so and that's been a, a huge, you know, kind of support system outside of the vet school. So it's really important for you guys to have a strong work-life balance and get as many relationships established as you can before vet school starts. But just know that once you get into vet school, maybe you join a sweet kickball league and you win five championships. Ugh. Now I want to know what you wish you guys would have known as pre-vet students. Um, I wish someone would have told me that even though it's going to be hard, it's no longer this amount of grueling information. Um, like for me, when I was an undergrad, I thought that physics and biochemistry were the hardest classes ever. Once you get to vet school, you're learning all about something that you really enjoy. So I wish someone would have just prepared me for that and um, told me that it wasn't going to be as stressful. It's, it's stressful as you make it. One piece of advice that I have is to make sure to take the time to build relationships. Don't just focus on like your grades and kind of like your resume, but build those relationships with your peers, your friends, your employers, um, anything, because ultimately they're going to be the ones that are helping you throughout this journey. Um, I think the best piece of advice I could give is to remember that everything that you're learning or experiencing is going to be applicable uh, later on in life. Um, so I was a, a manager at Panera Bread actually during undergrad. Um, so I got tons of great customer service experience. Being a manager and dealing with a lot of not so happy clients um, has really helped me out when I'm dealing with giving not so good information to, to people. Um, so Definitely keep that in mind when you're, you know, working somewhere or learning something that you think is not going to be very helpful. Um, remember that it's not necessarily the information, but sometimes what you gain from that. I did not know you were a manager, Panera. That really suits you. I yeah. can see it. I can see it. <laughs> Going off what Tyler said, um, one of the best pieces of advice a mentor gave me was that you're no longer studying for tests. You're studying for your career. So everything that you're doing is preparing you to be the best veterinarian that you'll be able to be. Yeah, and I think, so Tyler bringing up that he was a manager at Panera, to me that's something unique. So what was unique about your ladies' applications that you think, because a lot of times pre-vet students think, oh, I'm not going to list this on the application that has nothing to do with vet school. And so Tyler could have been like, well, you know, soup doesn't have anything to do with vet school, soups and <laughs> salads, but guess what? That customer service experience really counts. So what on your applications did you maybe consider not putting on there and then you did and you're glad you did? Um, I actually volunteered in a human hospital, I wanted to be a human doctor, let's say that, um, when I was in high school. So I had an outrageous amount of hours that uh, was kind of a good explanation as to why I didn't have as many veterinary hours. So I think that if you had a passion prior to vet school, putting that on your application and being able to explain it is, you know, a great way to show how you made your way to vet med or, you know, what you liked about the other field or didn't like and kind of got here. I think it's great that Amanda uh, tried human med and found out that, you know, humans are gross and she wasn't <laughs> into it. are going through your vet school and pre-vet journey, you're going to hear a lot of stories from different folks. And sometimes the stories on paper don't make sense. They, it didn't make sense how they got here. And that hopefully will give you encouragement that there's no right way and there's no one path to get here. Can you paint a picture about what vet school is like or compare it to something where people can be like, oh, vet school is like this? I think that it's kind of like a nine to five job, but it doesn't end at five. Um, you are in class for most of the day, at least currently, um, Erica and I are. And once you get home, you definitely have to study. But that being said, um, it's really important to have your own stress relieving um, activities. And when I get home, I take like two hours off of school. I don't do anything for a little while. Yeah, kind of building off of that, like my friends and I joke, kind of like once you're done with the school day, it's like, all right, now our second shift is starting. So you have your day shift and your night shift. So you feel like you're constantly going. Um, but also you do have to kind of take time for yourself. So you, at least three, four times a week when I get home, I make it a point to go and take my dogs on a long walk. That's kind of like my break for when I get home. 
Yeah, Amanda and Erica really nailed it on the head for class time. Um, and regarding clinics, um, the best, you know, kind of analogy I can give is um, just imagine starting a new job every two weeks. You know, it's, it's you know, with, you know, it's something within the same kind of area, but you're really being thrown into a completely new job every two weeks. You know, the service expects different things. The doctors expect different things. You guys, that was so exactly what I was looking for because I can totally picture this nine to five and then, uh uh-oh, here comes my night shift and, oh my gosh, I have to learn a new job every two weeks. Well, I want to thank my guests, Erica, Tyler, and Amanda for being here today and taking time out of their night shift, as it were, of their (laughs) career and their future career. Um, As always, you can find us at the veterinary education portion of the UF College of Veterinary Medicine website. I'm Alex Savolino, your pre-vet advisor, and we'll see you next time. Welcome to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Savolino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. I am so excited to have Dr. Jaron Jones with us today. He is our Director for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, as well as our Learning and Organizational Development Specialist. Jaron, thanks for being here. Happy to be here. So today our topic of discussion is what is diversity, equity, and inclusion? Sure. As we know, um, for those of the students who are getting ready to apply, hopefully y'all know, diversity has become very important to our college. Um, We talk to students about their understanding of diversity and the type of diversity they bring to the table Mm -hmm. um, on the application. And you're actually on the admissions committee. So you really understand the application process and what it means to review an application. Our goals today are for you to help us understand what it means, what students should be thinking about, and how it applies to their life. Why is diversity important to you? Why are you in this position? (laughs) Uh, Why am I in this position? Uh, Well, because diversity is very important in terms of uh, bringing uh, an array of perspectives and lived experiences into veterinary medicine, Um, whether it's socioeconomic status, race, gender, age, class, sexual orientation. Uh, There are several different perspectives and lenses that we live life, and we can bring those experiences to create new global solutions uh, within veterinary medicine. So if we have a lot of people who fall within the same characteristics or lived experiences, we may be trying to solve the same problems with the same perspectives, or we may never identify issues and problems that we don't know exist. And so it's always great to have a wealth of experiences uh, present within the college, both from student, faculty, and staff side. Okay, so the two things I hear you saying are, I want diversity in any field. Because yes. one, if everybody is thinking the same way, has come from the same background, same experiences, mm-hmm. we're going to approach the problem in the same way yeah. or in a situation. Or, or similar, in a similar context. In a similar way, sure. Mm-hmm. And then the second reason would be, if I don't have a diverse uh, group of, of folks and from different backgrounds, mm-hmm. they might not be able to identify issues that could arise. Sure, yeah. Um, and then also thinking about, you know, the, the client services side of veterinary medicine. You know, if we're going to represent the global population in which we serve, everyone owns animals and pets. And so you want to make sure that you have a diverse group that can reach all populations. First, you know, it's going to start in the classroom, is mm-hmm. what I hear you saying. We want that thinking mentality of coming at problems and, and issues from different mindsets. But then once they become the veterinarian, mm-hmm. we need to make sure we have veterinarians who can represent our clients. You mentioned some demographic characteristics. Can you go over those again and then maybe things that aren't typically included that people don't think about? Sure. Uh, So normally you think about like gender, race, um, maybe age, uh, but you could think about sexual orientation. You can think about socioeconomic status. So, you know, how much money you earn in the household. Uh, If you're first generation, so if if you have parents that have gone to college or if you're the first one, like those experiences are different. Um, say you worked full time your entire life throughout college. That's that's a different experience. Um, if you speak different languages, uh, if you're if you're an immigrant, uh, there's several things that people don't normally think about uh, that actually add to the diversity of a class. So mark me if I'm wrong, but mm-hmm. the way I've been explaining it to students is they could approach the essay from an inverted pyramid. So they could picture a triangle upside down. Mm -hmm. And if they start with, this is 
what I think diversity, equity, and inclusion means. Mm -hmm. So they, then we know they understand what the topic is. Sure. Then as they funnel down, they talk about why it's important in veterinary medicine. Mm -hmm. So what we've already discussed, client communication, uh, coming you know, to issues and problems with different backgrounds or thinking about things in different ways. Mm -hmm. And then you know, just how diverse vet med is, not just the clients um, and the patients, but the actual parts of the field. So government, um, working at, you know, as a lawyer, working as um, a member of the military, research, general practitioner, all of those different parts of the field. Mm -hmm. And then finally funneling down to how they, what they do to the class to make some, to add diversity to it. Yeah, and I think that when you think about how you add to diversity, uh, I think that several of the responses that I was seeing was them trying to express their diversity, when rather uh, they could also go into discussing why diversity is important and how they can be an ally for diversity, how they can be a champion for diversity. Those are the ones that really stand out. Do you feel like there's ever a situation where a student does not have any diversity to bring to the table. Yeah, never. That's that's absolutely not the case. Everyone has something to bring in, in the realm of diversity. And so for those students who are getting stopped in their tracks thinking, I still I still don't know. I don't mm -hmm. have it. I don't mm -hmm. I don't have anything like that. What are we telling them? They definitely want to review the definition of diversity again um, and, and do research within diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, because if you're looking at the surface level definition, that's probably where people are getting stuck. You'll start to find that there's more, uh, there are more resources to help you understand that, oh, this, uh, this thing about me, this lived experience is different. You know, we all have a different story to tell. Uh, we all have our unique experiences of how we got here. Um, so owning those unique experiences is key. So if you feel like you're not diverse, you're not deep looking deep enough within your story. So I think our homework then today, mm -hmm. listeners, is going to be research what diversity, equity, and inclusion means, mm -hmm. and then start digging deeper and applying that to your life and thinking more just beyond boxes you had to check when you signed up to take the SAT or the GRE. Dr. Jones, mm -hmm. I'd love to hear what you think makes you diverse. Okay, so we did this activity at our first year leadership experience uh, with Ms. Pat Lowry. She runs a lenses workshop, and she gives us a set of uh, lab bifocals, and she gives us a permanent marker. And she says, you know, start writing these answers to these questions. Um, and some of the answers that I wrote were just descriptors about yourself. So I'm tall. I played sports. I'm athletic. I'm an African-American. Um, i first-generation Ph.D. student. I have a beard. You know, uh, I've traveled a couple to a couple countries. Um, I don't have much educational debt, you know. And so she had us write all those things down on our glasses and then put put them on. Now, we could still see the people in front of us, but we had all these words written in front of us. And so then we would exchange that with someone else. And it was a way for us to recognize that we all look and live life through our own set of lenses. Mm -hmm. And so we have all these descriptors about who we are and what lived experiences and perspective we bring into uh, veterinary medicine or any field that we are a part of. Um, and so it was a real good way to help you start to think about, you know, oh, well, these are the things about me. And these are some of the things that may make me different, but also make me similar as well. So when you guys are thinking about your application and your interview, and you're starting to prepare um, for your future profession, something to think about when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion, that equity piece that Dr. Jones keeps referring to, he's talking about being an ally for others. And the thing about veterinarians is you have it in you to be an ally already mm -hmm. because you love animals and you want to be an ally for those who can't, who don't have a voice. We want you to bring that even further to humans as well. So I know a lot of you out there love animals more than humans, but guess what? It is a human profession. So when you're thinking about, you know, I want to be a vet to help those animals who can't speak up for themselves, start taking it a step further and think about what, what kinds of people can I help? What kinds of, what kinds of opportunities do I have that others haven't had? And how can I try to help them have those similar opportunities so they can also be successful? So Jaren, you know, what are some oops moments that you think can happen with diversity and equity and inclusion? Are there some times where it's like, uh-oh, something, whoops. Yeah, I think um, when you make the assumption 
that you know how to help someone mm, um, mm-hmm. rather than asking them, how can you help them? Oops. Um, so uh, <laughs> it happens a lot. Um, and it's unintentional. It's with good intent. Yes. But it, I always talk about impact versus intent, making sure that the impact that you have matches the intent in which you hope to have. Because we're assuming intent might be a lot higher than the impact. My intent is really, really good, but then my impact is like, oh, oh, that was not what I meant. Right, exactly. And so what I recommend people do is that uh, when they recognize a space where they're trying to help, yes, go to that person sure. personally and ask, how can you help? Uh, because maybe they may not want what you think they need. Yes. Um, and also it could end up, causing more harm than good for that individual of course and so you never want to make assumptions you always want to ask more questions and ask more stories yes and and have effective communication so the good thing about an assumption would be at least you're thinking and you're cognizant and you think oh this might be going on i'm assuming Mm -hmm. this Mm -hmm. but then the next step is to go to that person Mm -hmm. you know if you feel comfortable in saying, hey, I, I noticed this, yep. um, it struck a chord with me, is there something I can do for you? Yeah. It lead with intent. And now we're gonna play a little game with Dr. Jones. Yeah. I'm gonna say a statement and I want you to fill in the blank. Okay. The first thing that you think of when I say my, my statement, okay? Okay. Diversity is? Awesome. <laughs> diversity is not? A melting pot. You usually hear that a lot where they say, you know, everybody gets in and makes this one, like, I don't even know, cheese spread. No, it it is more like a fruit salad. Every piece makes something delicious, but each has its own flavor and nutrition that it brings to the overall experience to the palate. Okay, so what I hear you saying is if we are calling something a melting pot, we want everyone to just kind of meld together and you can no longer have those individual differences. Everything ends up tasting the same. Right. That is great. I love that. It's more of a fruit salad. Mm-hmm. So refreshing. You'll live longer. <laughs> you sure will. And because you'll be having all that diversity of thought and we'll be able to fix all these problems. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank Dr. Jones. Thank you for being here today and thank helping us me. understand a little bit more about diversity, equity, and inclusion. You know, your homework, uh, listeners, is to do some research into what diversity and equity and inclusion means, why it's important for veterinary medicine, and how you can not only bring diversity to the table, but how you can be an ally for others. I'm Alex Avellino, your pre-veterinary advisor, and we will see you next time. Peace. Welcome to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I am Alex Avellino. I am so happy to have a senior student with us today, Miss Katie Cardenas. She is a fourth year at UFCVM. Katie, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you? I am good. I'm really glad you're on the show because we've had first through third year students on and it will be really nice to get a senior perspective today. And tell me, how are you feeling that it's almost time for you to graduate? Uh... It's a little exciting, but also scary because I'll actually be an adult. (laughs) So, yeah, you've worked four years to, well, I mean, your whole life, really, to get to this moment. If you were a baseball card and we flipped you over, what are your stats? So where did you go to undergrad? What focus did you have in vet school? Tidbits about Miss Katie. So I went to the University of Central Florida, go Knights. There, my major was biology, though originally I actually was uh, pre-med. So I was like a molecular (laughs) biology major. Okay. And then I switched. (laughs) Didn't love it? Uh, It was just more on, because like I got, I've always been with working with animals. So when I was 16, I started working at a sea turtle hospital. So I was doing sea turtle rehab and then I volunteer at animal shelter. And so I always loved animals, but I've always loved medicine. And so I kind of had it ingrained that, oh, I'm going to be a doctor. And then I kind of had a class where we had to kind of go, over every kind of health profession, you know, there is. And they kind of told you, like, this is the career. They would actually have speakers from um, those, like, career paths will come and talk to you and then tell you, actually, this is what you need to get into this program. What I liked about vet 
med is like you get to be, you know, the pediatrician, the oncologist, you get to be the dermatologist, you get to be the surgeon. So you kind of get uh, a little bit of everything. And then I also like exotic medicine. So you even get even more of a bit of everything. So I think that's kind of ultimately what made me switch. I love that UCF offered kind of an exploratory health professions course. Everybody listening at home, if you are, if you're interested in vet med, I hope you stick with it. But if you're not sure, uh, do some exploratory courses, see if you can hear from speakers and professionals in the field so you can get turned on to what you really like. What are some things that you did in undergrad and high school that you think helped prepare you to make it to almost graduating vet school? For undergrad, I think having a wide variety of uh, things I was involved in and uh, jobs helped because uh, during my last year of uh, UCF, I actually was working three jobs and shadowing (laughs) and doing research. So I think like that, that was too extreme, but I think that kind of um, help me learn like how to balance stuff because like uh, I would go on the weekends I would go to the beach and do sea turtle work and then I would have a, a morning lab animal job and so I'd do that for a few hours and then every every other week I would babysit whoa <laughs> lots of networking I so, hear going yeah on. so making lots of connections and just uh, also finding interests outside of just like you know your plan career path because I got involved like I got interested in um doing like photography and getting more involved with that you know having a hobby and just like keeping that despite like getting the hours and stuff like can go a long way So you have a class of 114. Uh, You know a good amount of them, I would say. Tell me if they're, without using anybody's name, any interesting stories or things that happened to them in vet school where you're like, well, this was interesting, or we didn't expect this, or this is something people should think about, or the class as a whole. I mean, I guess, like, because my class, we started with, uh, like, two students from the previous class. So that was, and then after first year, we lost five students to um the below class so that's one thing that you kind of don't expect but you're like oh it happens that you know some people just don't do well their first year but you know they come like uf is very keen on once you're accepted they want you to finish the program and so they provide the support and so sometimes it may mean that you have to you know repeat a year but um so that was kind of interesting it was one of those things where like oh you don't think of it it's like oh you know they're actually like people here they're going through it and then after that kind of first hard first year they have you know they've gone through every other year without a problem so yeah that's an interesting point everyone's always like will I fail out and you know like Katie said UF really wants to keep our students we want them to do well and whether that means Mm -hmm. remediation or repeating a year it can happen it does happen people move through it and you move on Okay, so let's talk about best moment of vet school so far. When you think back on the four years, what are the moments you'll remember? I think the moments I'll remember are the ones like spent with my classmates like outside of uh, outside of school. So when we would have uh, an event just to go down to Midtown and just like socialize and just even like little stuff like going to a classmates like annual uh, Halloween party. It could have even just been like us like watching a movie together. But I think those are the memories that stick with me the, the most. Are you telling me you don't remember every grade you got and all the time that you studied and spent in the lab? I remember some of that, but most of it, I feel like I had a good balance. So. See, this is, that's exactly what I want to hear, that it, vet school and professional school, you know, you're in it to take the courses and get the grades, but what you remember the most are the time, the fun times that you had and the people that you spent them with. Yeah. Let's change gears. Okay. Talk about the job search how you chose a job, what that process was like. Walk us through, you know, you've worked your whole life to get this job. What was the process like? 
So I kind of started like around August when we went back into the classroom. The AVMA has a career you know, app where they have job postings and stuff. And you can also put up your resume because I kind of knew the areas I wanted to, you know, work in. So I would kind of just search like those cities to see what kind of openings they had. How did you know what areas you were interested in? Because you're going back to Orlando. Yeah. So Um, how did you know, like, why Orlando? uh, For me, because like I love the city when I live there. Um, Also, I have my brother and my two sisters will be living there next year. So I have family, you know, nearby for support. So it kind of, for me, was like the one city in Florida that I could could settle on. Okay, so for Katie, it made sense for her. She's lived in the city mm-hmm. you know, from UCF, so she knows Orlando. Family is there, so knowing where you're going and having the support there was important for your decision. Mm-hmm. Okay. One of the hospitals that I, because I, I ideally wanted uh, a small animal and exotic practice. That was my kind of number one. But I was also finding I had an interest in emergency, because so I was kind of looking at both of those options. And one of the uh, small animal exotic practices in Orlando had put a, a job posting for associate uh, veterinarian, and they were actually like new grads welcome. They really were looking for a new grad. And so I kind of just sent, you know, a cover letter and my resume uh, to them and kind of heard back about two weeks later. I got like a little phone interview, and so we scheduled for a more in-depth interview uh, like two months later when I could go to Orlando. And then that kind of evolved into a working interview over Christmas break. And so during that time, I was also kind of looking at other options and stuff because, you know, I could have very well like gone on this working interview and hated the sure, practice. Yeah. So I was um, shadowing one of my old mentors in um, Orlando who works at an emergency clinic and just kind of seeing, you know, which route I would prefer as a new grad. But it was nice because she, uh, cause she it was a big referral uh, hospital, so they got all the practices in, you know, Central Florida. So she was able to tell me, oh, this is a great practice. Oh, Stay away from smart. this one. So, Good. so having, you know, rely on old mentors and stuff for advice, like, definitely comes back to Oh, that's help. a really good Good idea. Yeah, because you made a lot of connections. So you were able to find someone who was able to give you an inside scoop on all the practices. That's great. What kinds of interview questions did they ask you? Um, Oh, God, they asked me like they asked me this typical like, you know, what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? They also um, tailored it to my resume. So because I'm completing the aquatic animal certificate and the business management certificate. So with uh, the practice uh, that I interviewed with, I had a lot of questions surrounding like business management and kind of, you know, what were my goals and stuff and kind of what I covered in the curriculum, what kind of courses, you know, and what we actually did. But yeah, and then it was also a lot of it was like, you know, what are your goals for the next five years? You know, what are your area of interest and stuff like mm. now? And what are you looking for in a mentorship relationship? So so it sounds behavioral. It wasn't so much, hey, how do you pull blood on a dog? Yeah. Okay. Well, because actually the person who interviewed me was the practice manager and wasn't like a, a veterinarian. Okay. So. so they want to know who you are as a person, what's your background, and what are your goals? Mm-hmm. Awesome. Katie, pretend you are a pre-vet student. What do you need to hear an almost graduating senior student tell you about vet school, about the process, encouragement? What would you need to hear? Um, Enjoy it. Uh, You don't have to. You spent like the last four years, you know, trying to get the best grades, trying to get all the experience and stuff uh, just so you can get into vet school. But now it's like you're here. Just enjoy it. You know, do things that you're truly interested in, Um, you know, study, but also take time for yourself because I think, you know, work-life balance is very important in vet school. Um, you know, you ultimately don't need to get straight A's again. Like you, like a C, C equals DVM. So, um, if you get a couple C's, you'll survive. Mm-hmm. <laughs> For sure. Um, Cause you know there are some subjects that are just harder than others. For me, anesthesia was just I could not understand. <laughs> I was interested in it, it just like just did not click. The okay. physiology just was like nope. Yeah. In one ear, out the other. Yeah. But you know, 
you just have to kind of, you'll get through those hard courses, but just take time to enjoy, you know, what you're truly interested in and just be open mind, like have an open mind to, you know, the different aspects of vet med. Cause you never know, like you might be interested in being a horse vet, but there, I have many classmates have, have completely changed. One wants to be a cardiologist and stuff. So like, you never know where you start, like where you're going to end. So just be, have an open mind. So you're about to be a veterinarian. Yes. What kind of veterinarian do you want to be known to be? I want one that's known to be, you know, compassionate. One that um, people will go to because they they trust that I will provide the best, you know, care for their animals. You know, truly, like, I want to be known as a veterinarian that um, will treat, like, their pets as my own. So I kind of just want to be known as, like, the compassionate, you know, veterinarian. Compassionate Dr. Cardenas. Mm-hmm. Oh, you're going to be a vet. I'm so excited for you. Well, thank you so much, Katie, for being on the show today. We've enjoyed watching you grow from mm-hmm. a tiny freshman to a big senior, class of 2019. I'm Alex Avellino, your pre-vet advisor. We will see you next time. Welcome to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Welcome back to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, and today I have two wonderful members of the UFCVM community, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves right now. My name is Camden Rubin, and I am a veterinary cardiology resident. And my name is Alex Fox Alvarez, and I am a soft tissue surgeon. So I have these two gentlemen with me today to talk to you guys about their education and where they went to school, how they got to where they are, what their specialties are like, because, you know, there are options after you get your DVM, right, guys? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Dr. Fox Alvarez, Alex, if I may. Yeah. Let's start with you. Can you tell us what your educational journey has been like? Because I know you're a little bit different, and I think the students would really like to hear about your, you're missing a degree. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, My wife likes to remind me of that and make fun of the fact that she has more degrees than me, but... Um, Sure. So you can cut that out because it's kind of lame. No, I loved it. But um, so I I did my undergraduate split between uh, Florida State University and the University of Florida. What was your major? My major at Florida State was biochemistry and biology. Um, And when I transferred to University of Florida, it became zoology. But the way that I did my undergraduate was so that I I kind of front loaded all of my prerequisites for vet school. And I figured I would apply a year early, and I also figured that I would not get in my first year, and then I could just finish my undergraduate degree and then hopefully get in my second time around. Um, But somehow I was very fortunate, and I actually got in a year early, which um, was awesome because it kind of saved me a year of my life. And additionally, um, in Florida, for you Florida students listening, the uh, Florida Bright Futures program covers four years of college or equivalent. So um, my first year of vet school, they actually covered um, a portion of my my veterinary courses. So that was that was pretty great from a financial aspect. So no bachelor's degree. No bachelor's degree. Um, yep. Then yes. you got your DVM at Florida. Got my DVM at Florida, and then I did an internship. I wanted to do zoo medicine. I was really interested in exotic and zoo medicine. I still am. And then came back to the University of Florida for a specialty internship in surgery. And then stayed on for the residency in surgery and then stayed on for a faculty in surgery. Where was your internship? My internship was in Tucson, Arizona at a place called Valley Animal Hospital and the Reed Park Zoo. And it was awesome. I loved it out there. Okay, so something that you guys should pick up on, your internships and residencies don't necessarily have to be at colleges of veterinary medicine. They can be at hospitals. Dr. Cam, same question, please. I uh, grew up in Louisville, Kentucky, and decided to do my undergrad in Boston, Massachusetts. And then at what university? At Boston University, go Terriers. <laughs> and after that, I decided to immediately go to Auburn University because they also take in-state 
students from the state of Kentucky. Um, so I was an in, considered an in-state student at that school. For your DVM? For my DVM, yep. Got and in on the first try? Got in on the first try. Ooh, heavy hitters. Uh, yep. Uh, <laughs> and so um, after that, I also decided to do a small animal rotating internship at a private practice. Um, Where was that? And that was at two different hospitals just outside of Chicago, Illinois, at VCA Berwyn and VCA Aurora Hospitals. Um, both private practices, both very, very high caseload. Um, and at the time, I thought I wanted to specialize, but wasn't exactly sure in what field I wanted to specialize, but I knew I wanted to increase uh, the my confidence level of, in veterinary medicine and be able to get a lot more comfortable seeing a large amount of cases in a short period of time. And then after that, I was still unsure about what specialty I wanted to do, so I moved out to Denver, Colorado to follow a beautiful woman who I still happen to be with. Oh, that's and so nice. Also I, that. Also, she happens to be a vet as well, um, and did two years of general practice and worked at emer- as an emergency doctor as well before realizing my second love, which is veterinary cardiology. Love. I often hear from veterinarians, they thought they were <laughs> going to do one thing, and then they ended up doing something else. So when you guys were before your DVM, what kind of veterinarian did you think you were going to be? That's a great question, Alex. And uh, initially, growing up in Louisville, Kentucky, I was enthralled with the horse racing industry in my local area. So I was very convinced that I wanted to be a racetrack veterinarian. And for all you prospective DVM students out there, If you believe that you really are interested in something, I recommend immersing yourself in that culture to figure out all the ins and outs and truly determine if you love it. Because if you love something, then you can do it every single day of your life uh, without any regrets whatsoever. I wanted to make sure after figuring out that I didn't want to be a racetrack veterinarian that I really wanted to be a veterinarian in general. So I tried to immerse myself in as many different fields of veterinary medicine as possible. So one thing that I did was I worked as a radiology technician in a specialty practice in uh, the New England area. And then I also worked in the medical center at the New England Aquarium as well, uh, which was my first experience with aquatic uh, animals. And in addition, after that, I started to get into the pet nutrition industry. Bro, how old are you? Yeah, there's so many things going on. These students are going to be exhausted. How have you done all of these things? Each summer, in between undergraduate, um, you uh, spend each summer should be devoted towards something veterinary medicine related. The more diverse your opportunities are and ways that you can fill up your resume, the better that it's going to look in a admissions committee. I really wanted, thought I wanted to do like your classic practice owner, um, you know, really develop relationships with your clients that are lifelong and, you know, you know each other by first name and you know about each other's families type of thing. And um, really just kind of have that sort of relationship with my clients. And um, I did some very similar things, just trying to get as much exposure to the field as possible. But did you do as much? I sure did not, uh, nor did I do it as diverse. I mean, he said he did some aquatic stuff, which I don't know if that's like strictly seahorses, like equine aquatic or what. It is. But a lot of aquatic. shoeing. A lot yeah, of horse shoeing. Horse, seahorse shoeing, yeah. I mean, the dads carry all the babies. They must need some burl Oh, horseshoe shoes. crabs. Horseshoe crabs. There Slap them on there. Exactly. And I'll say, having been kind of, I've really been almost every job that there is at a vet hospital, I think really actually helped prepare me to, uh, to be a veterinarian and to be 
um, a good practice owner if that was what I decided to do. I mean, I, I was a kennel technician, a cleaning, and then an actual technician, some radiology technician. I did some of the management work up front, you know, with uh, with clients and, and office managing. And I actually think um, those things are actually really help, really help as well. Uh, so I remember being completely overwhelmed when I first got into vet school, just learning about the vastness of what our career was from I mean, there are veterinarians that are literally their main job is fighting bio bioterrorism, you know, trying to prevent animal and livestock diseases from coming into the country. There's veterinarians who specialize in similar things as us, but, you know, there's cardiology, surgery. Um, my wife specializes in oncology, so she does strictly animal cancer. Um, there's dermatology. There's integrative medicine where you kind of bring in a lot of the medicines from uh, Eastern and traditional medicine, such as um, acupuncture and herbology. Uh, there's radiologists, uh, emergency and critical care. There's there's really everything. There's nutritionists out there, a very hot field currently. There are cardiologists. There are internal medicine specialists. There there's are... people in industry, so they kind of represent drug companies or they represent um, different medications, the research, and also kind of helping to get the word out that, that new treatments are available. As you all know, you'll be coming to, hopefully, the University of Florida College of Veterinary Medicine for your four-year DVM degree. But what happens after that? We've kind of touched on internships and residencies and that pathway, but what does the end look like? What do you have to do to finally become a specialist? Sure. When you finish vet school, you are licensed to go out and do all of the things that specialists do, essentially. But um, you don't have as, as the same depth of training as a specialist. So you technically can do work on any animal and do um, any sort of procedures or, or anything that you, that you know how to do with them. But if you have a special interest, then the first thing you do after is a rotating internship. And the word rotating just means that you rotate through several different specialties. And what this does is it kind of gives you a, a much broader look at veterinary medicine and what it, what it means to be a veterinarian in um, these different fields. For students that don't want to do rotating internships, there are opportunities that can be similar to fulfilling the requirement of a rotating internship by doing at least four years of general practice, either that's large or small animal practice. Now walk us through the residency years and then what you have to do at the end. Yeah, so obviously this highly varies depending on the residency that you would like to do or are interested in. That requires at least a three-year commitment and you usually take a general qualifier exam. And then in your third year, you take a more s specific specialty board. So people that are oncology residents only take a test that pertains to oncology and vice versa towards every other of the specialties that are. Let's just break down the specialties that are with us today. So if you guys could describe your specialty in a few sentences and the type of personality that might lend itself to that specialty. Again, I'm a veterinary cardiologist. The majority of veterinary cardiologists are intelligent. They're inquisitive. They appreciate physiology. This sounds like every veterinarian, though, Dr. Cam. They what? like to get off at 2 p.m. Oh. Is there a nice work-life balance for veterinary cardiologists? Absolutely. So I would consider veterinary cardiology more of a niche. I would consider it, one, a branch of internal medicine, and two, the population of veterinary cardiologists is not as numerous as, say, internists or surgeons or critical care specialists in veterinary world. Can you give me an example of a healthy heart sound? And an example of a heart murmur. Dr. Alex, can you describe surgery in a few sentences? What is the service like and how did you know that was for you? And the kind of personality that suits surgeons. Sure. Um, surgery is super hands-on. So um, I've always kind of been a tinkerer. And I love working with my hands. I mean, that's kind of a cliche thing for surgeons to say, but it's true. I've always liked working with my hands. 
Um, I've always liked any kind of art project where you're kind of building and sculpting. Um, I like taking things apart and fixing things. Um, and that's essentially what you're doing with an animal. And what I really like about it is it's the kind of, it's the kind of specialty where you develop um, a basic skill set and then maybe you develop a more advanced skill set and you just apply it to different problems. So as a soft tissue surgeon, when you open up an animal, what kind of surgery excites you where you're like, oh, it's going to be a good day to save lives today? Ooh, I really like actually cardiothoracic surgery. So sometimes I actually work with Dr. Rubin when he's unable to correct anything with his minimally invasive approaches. And um, then I get to do heart surgery, which is a lot of fun. Um, Alex actually came in to one of our heart surgeries and got to touch a beating heart, which she yeah, probably... Yeah, it was wild. Yeah, I mean, it's it's amazing. It's amazing to do surgery on a, on a beating heart. It's got a lot of challenges because you can't say... Like hold still, hold still for a minute. You know you're working on a moving target. It's uh, very precise and there's a very low margin of error, so it, it definitely gets the surgical juices flowing. So when you're preparing to apply to veterinary school and just in life in general, we want everyone to be well aware of mental health issues and how you care for yourself and what you do to relieve stress because vet school, professional school in general, is going to be stressful. So can you both touch on your experience with mental health and wellness in the field personally, what students should be thinking about, what you hope for you know, future students as they do come in through the clinic? I think it starts now. It starts now where you are as a pre-vet student. Uh, managing your stress and making it a priority to make sure that you're happy with what you're doing and that you're giving yourself time to have hobbies and, um, you know, take care of the other aspects of your life, like in your family and your friends. Well, what does your work-life balance look like? I think for me, something that's important with my work-life balance is maintaining a healthy diet and exercise schedule. And I've found the best thing that's conducive with my schedule is before I go to work every morning, I try to wake up a couple minutes extra and either try to find time for a workout, whether that's a run or go to the gym or maybe even a quick yoga session as well. Um, I actually meditate. I've recently gotten into meditating, which I thought was kind of quackery before when I was an undergrad and stuff. And I <laughs> wish that I would have gotten into it sooner because um, typically what, what I feel like I'm up against is my mind's going in a thousand different directions. And even if it's just for 15 minutes, being able to kind of quiet down the thousands of voices that are in my head at a time, reminding me that I have to do this and that, um, and just kind of being present in the moment, um, has dramatically improved my quality of life. What have we not talked about that you would like to share with the audience about your particular specialty, veterinary school in general, and general advice? I love being a vet. Um, I really love what I do. Um, and, and it's a lot of work, but like kind of Cam touched on again, uh, it's fun and it's what I like to do. So it doesn't really feel like work a lot of the time. Some of it surely is, but it doesn't. Oh, I think one of the coolest things about our profession is even if you're in a specific area or field, such as veterinary cardiology, I s am still surprised on a daily basis on the avenues that this profession takes me. Just so happens that over the past year, I am, I guess, now an expert in the study of ultrasounding the hearts of Galapagos tortoises and other giant tortoises. Get out across of here. Across the entire country and have received multiple questions and, and insights from zoos such as the Pittsburgh Zoo and the San Diego Zoo. Is it a really slow beat? I'm assuming it's slow. Very, very slow. Their metabolism is, is much slower than a human's. Neat. Indeed. I want to thank Dr. Rubin and Dr. Fox Alvarez for being with us today. Listeners at home, start thinking about what your plans are post-DVM and just know that it can change at any time because this field is full of twists, turns, and golden opportunities. I'm Alex Avellino, your pre-vet advisor, and we'll see you next time. Welcome to the Pre-Vet Podcast. 
I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Welcome back to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, your Pre-Vet Advisor. Today, my guest is Bryce Talsma, one of our second year students. Bryce, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I am great. Thanks for coming. I know you're at the end of your second year. Yeah, the end is in sight. So close. She's heading into clinics pretty soon, but she wanted to come and wish everybody a happy Earth Day. Yes. Happy Earth Day, everyone. Because we today's topic is about sustainability how veterinary medicine relates to sustainability and Bryce's experience with it. So before we even get into that, Bryce, go ahead and tell us your background. Where did you go to undergrad? Where are you from, et cetera? Yeah, so I am an out-of-state student. I am from a small town in West Michigan. Um, And so I went to a small college right along Lake Michigan called Hope College. Um, It's about 3,500 students. And yeah, made the decision to move down here to UF. Coming from a small college, Bryce, how did you, because I know in in a large college or university, you might have, people might think you have more opportunities. Tell me why going to a small college worked for you. What did you like about it? Yeah, I really wrestled with that. Um, I was dead set on going to Michigan State, and when I toured, I was like, I'm going to get drowned in all these students, and not every school has a great pre-vet advisor like you, Alex. Thank you. And so when I toured Hope College, um, I met with the pre-vet advisor one-on-one, and he talked about the personal relationship that he has with the students and how he had a 97% success rate of getting students into vet school. And I was like, you know what? If you can get me into vet school, I'm sold. So when y'all are thinking, if you're in high school and you're thinking about a college and you want to go to vet school someday, you might want to look for someone who can be a mentor to you. Maybe going to a large university isn't what's best for your personality. And going to a small college, you really can get more one-on-one time and mentorship. So Bryce, tell me why we're here. Well, we're here to talk about sustainability. Um, So sustainability started for me when I was in undergrad, actually. Um, I really wanted to study abroad, and so I started looking at different programs, large universities, thinking that would be the best, and then started thinking about more why did I want to go to a large university, or what was I looking for in a study abroad program, and when it came down to it, I loved my small college experience And I wanted that experience abroad, too. I wanted to form close connections with people. I wanted to be invested in the community. And so I found this small um, program called Creation Care Study Program uh, based in Kaikoura, New Zealand. Kaikoura has a population of 3,000. Oh, Um, like the size of your college. Yeah, yeah, less smaller than my college. And so the whole focus of this program was sustainability and what does environmental stewardship look like, which I knew absolutely nothing about going into that program. Can you define sustainability for us? Yeah, so sustainability has a lot of different aspects to it, but it's how are we utilizing resources or how are we doing things in a way that allows us to do it for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. So something that is sustainable. So when you guys are thinking about when you're making choices based on what you eat, what you wear, what you buy, will you be able to do that and will the population be able to do that for years and years and years to come? So you went on this trip to New Zealand. What was the setup like? What what was the experience? It was crazy. I there was culture shock for sure. So uh, we lived. We had, there was fourteen students in my program and about six staff members. We had about twenty of us in this building that used to be a convent. Um, so was it beautiful? It was, oh, it was gorgeous. Absolutely beautiful. Um, we had this massive backyard with gardens and we had chickens and. It was all these beautiful oak trees. Um, we had a, we shared a bedroom with one or two other people, and we ate all of our meals together. Um, we were together all the time. You and this small group of people were taught to be sustainable? Were you taught skills? Um, so we go into the convent, and they say, okay, we don't have heat. Um, but then they said, like, we don't have computers. We don't have TVs. Your cell phones aren't working because you're in another country. So you're going to learn just by being here what it's like to live an intentional lifestyle because the people around you is what you have to entertain yourself. Uh, We also had a library, so I read a lot of books that semester. (laughs) Um, But then we also took classes. Um, So I took classes on sustainable community development, environmental literature, marine ecology, terrestrial ecosystems. And so we were also taught what it looks like to be sustainable by people um, from all over the world who came to teach these classes. And then we are also living a sustainable lifestyle. 
so it was something you were interested in, sustainability. You already had this interest in it, but you knew you wanted to go to vet school. Did this program have anything that said, this is a pre-vet program? Why, why choose this and have vet school as an end goal? Absolutely not. There was no, you're going to get all these experiences with animals. There was none of that. But I took my time in undergrad to say, what is going to make me stand out as an applicant? Because everyone's going to have over a thousand hours of veterinary experience. So what's going to make me unique? And what can I say to whatever school I apply to? This is why you should take me. And this is what I'm going to contribute to the field of veterinary medicine. And what I think is really important, and I tell my students a lot, they say, will this look good to vet school? And I always tell them, do what you can live with and what you won't regret. And if you are going to regret not studying abroad or you're going to regret not taking a job working at Disney World that has nothing to do with animals but you've always wanted to do it, you should still do that thing because it might actually end up helping you get into vet school, number one. But number two, you don't want to get to vet school and have regrets. And Bryce chose this program, not knowing what it would do for her. And then tell me what happened in your interview for vet school. I don't think we talked about my animal experience at all in my interview, except for some of the research I did in New Zealand. But I mean, UF was so fascinated by the fact that I chose a sustainability program and they just wanted to talk about my experience abroad and what I did and how I connected with the community members and a little bit about the research I was involved with. Um, but mostly just what I took away from that experience and how it's going to impact my life going forward. There, Yeah, there's so many things I could point out about why this is important. So Bryce said how she had to make connections with the small community she was living in. They didn't have cell phones. They didn't have computers. There was a lot of one-on-one -on -one time and relationships that she built with those people. That's what veterinarians need to do with their clients. And I can teach you how to lead a horse out of a barn, but it's really hard to teach you how to make eye contact with someone and make a connection with them and have that conversation. And that, to me, sounds like something that they were really interested in. Yeah, it was, I mean, the connections that you made with people. I spent four months with these people that I didn't know a single person going into this program, and they're some of my best friends. We talk all the time. I've gone out to Iowa to go to weddings for them. I've visited them in New Zealand um, because some of us moved back there after. And oh. it's just, you, you just form such an intimate connection with people when you have to sit down and you're not distracted by a cell phone or saying, oh, I'm busy doing this or I'm busy doing this. We had this intentional time together and we had chores together and we had small group time together and we gardened together. And you just, you just form a really unique connection that I think is a lot harder to find today. On paper, this program might have looked like a great opportunity, obviously, to go to New Zealand, which is amazing, um, learn about sustainability, but not a specific pre-vet angle or a hook. And then Bryce got to come back and really make it work for her. Well, you know, we already said happy Earth Day to everybody, but now I want Bryce to kind of go over for you guys some sustainable habits that you can incorporate into your life, how she's doing it. Maybe some will work for you, maybe some won't. So Bryce, let's hear in general things people can do, things that have worked for you, things you want to try. Talk to us about what's our sustainability strategy. Yeah. So I think the biggest mistake that I made coming home was trying to do too much. I was living in a place where we were able to get all of our food local. We had most of it from the garden. We had chickens for all of our eggs and to give all of our food scraps to. We composted, we recycled everything. And that's unfortunately just not realistic for a lot of us living in the US, especially college students who can't afford a lot of those luxuries. And so when I came home, I dealt with a lot of guilt of, I can't do all of this stuff. I feel like I'm doing nothing, but something is so much better than nothing. And so take those small steps and think about what is realistic for you. It might not be realistic for you to say, I'm only going to buy organic food that comes from, you know, local community. And that's totally fine. I don't personally, I'm not able to do that. I still get my groceries from Publix and get what I can, but find those small things. So I try and make improvements as the year goes on and like add things as I see fit and what I think is sustainable. Um, so to start, I was like, you know what? I don't need plastic bags at the grocery store. I'll bring my reusable bags. You know, what? if you forget your reusable bags one day, I still do it all the time. I say, hey, can I just have a paper bag this time? And then I use the paper bag for something else. Or Something you told me in the car that I didn't realize about Publix 
we don't have to put our vegetables and fruit in the little plastic bags they give no, you. No, I never do. I mean, especially for those of us who wash our produce, which hopefully you do when you get home. <laughs> um, see, I just put it in my cart. Or if I remember, I do have little reusable produce bags. And so I'll bring those and put my produce in that. Yeah. But it's, it, yeah, there's a lot of things that just like aren't necessary. Um, and just small changes you can make. I don't ask for a straw um, when I'm at a restaurant. Mm-hmm. And so I've managed to cut that out. And it's taken three and a half years, but now I'm to a point where I said, you know what, I really want to support uh, the meat industry locally, and I just, I can't afford that right now, and so I'm just not going to eat meat for the time being. It's not that I'm anti-meat, it's just I'm trying to be more, support local, and I just can't right now. Yeah, and so Bryce, mark me if I'm wrong, but the whole, the meat thing is, so is it because so many Americans, we eat so much meat that eventually we're going to run out of the meat or we're going to be growing it or raising it the wrong way? What is that piece? I think it's more the land consumption that the meat industry uses. And we as Americans do eat a lot of meat. Um, And so a lot of people might say like, oh, you're just one person, like you're really not doing that much. But if you think about it, let's say, you know, the average American eats a couple hundred pounds of meat a year. I'm taking a couple hundred pounds of meat away. That's a cow. And, I mean, you start to inspire people around you. So my family doesn't eat meat when I go home. They do. On oh, their that's so life. nice. But you start to impact the people around you. And yeah. they start to alter your choices or start to consider things um, just based on the influence that you have on them. And so just those little seeds. I mean, now my parents don't use plastic bags. They always did before. Yeah. And that's one more person that I've touched. And now they're going to tell people, oh, we don't use plastic bags. And that's one more person. And it starts to spread. And that's how you impact change. The more you listen and learn, the more you guys are going to be able to make those uh, healthy and helpful changes. And I think it's really important that you guys hear when Bryce said that she came back and knew she couldn't do everything. That's the same thing that's going to happen in your pre-vet journey. You're going to hear about a lot of students who have done a lot of things And you might think, I have to make all of these changes now. It's probably not realistic to do that. So if you can just make little changes every semester. So maybe semester one, start your research. Semester two, you're going to continue your research and you're going to add on an internship if you can. Semester three, maybe you can get an executive board position. Don't try to do them all now. Do them slowly so it's more sustainable. Before you get involved in veterinary medicine students, one topic you should be aware of and familiar with is the concept of One Health. And One Health is human medicine, veterinary medicine, and the environment slash agriculture field working together to keep our planet running, essentially, because human med and vet med work together with research and uh, public health, keeping our population healthy from zoonotic diseases, The agriculture piece comes in because the animals that we take care of live in the environment. They also eat the environment, um, you know, specifically cows, horses, grazers, animals like that. Um, But everything works together. So when we're talking about sustainability, that's exactly what we're talking about is the One Health Initiative. So Bryce, can you kind of talk about how veterinarians play a role when they're thinking about sustainability and One Health? Yeah, so I'll give you like another example um, that I heard while I was studying abroad and thought it it started to really impact me. So if we have, let's talk about um, animals in the forest. If we start cutting down that forest, we're displacing those animals and all of a sudden they're moving into communities where people are because our population is also growing and expanding into these areas and they're carrying diseases with them and spreading it to the human population. And we've seen that with a lot of diseases, um, new diseases showing up. And so it's really important that we think about what, how our decisions on the environment are going to impact the animals and how in turn will impact us. Just being aware of the choices we make and how that's impacting our career in veterinary medicine, but also our lives and everyone else's lives. For you future veterinarians, you need to start thinking about how can your professional role as a vet impact our culture and our climate? What can you do to educate your clients, the population, um, and yourself about the role animals, humans, and the environment plays and works together. For the second year students, before they go into the clinical rotations, we encourage them to come up with a mantra, which is a saying that will encourage them 
when the going gets tough, when they're tired and hungry and things aren't working the way they want to, and they maybe are forgetting why they chose the profession. So every student's encouraged to make this statement or phrase. And Bryce, what is yours? So my mantra actually comes from my study abroad program. Um, we sat down as a group the first day and we said, okay, what is our goal and like what is going to be our theme this semester? So we chose the Lorax uh, by Dr. Seuss. And there's this really awesome quote in there um, that has kind of just become my mantra for life and for vet school. But the quote is, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing's going to get better. It's not. And I think that's something really great for your um, walk through sustainability, but also vet school. If you want to implement change anywhere in life, it's got to start with you, and it's got to start with you caring enough to make some changes to start impacting the lives of others and having them make that change as well. Your homework is to come up with one thing you can start doing to become a little bit more sustainable. So I'm going to give an example and Bryce will give one that you can do differently. I think mine is going to be start not using straws at restaurants. And also, let me just point out, guys, if you're like, oh, it's kind of gross to put my mouth on the glass, if that's why you're doing it those germs are already in there, so you're sucking them up with the straw anyway. So that's an option. Or get a reusable straw and bring it with you. They're so easy to find and so cheap. And there's little, like, pocket ones that collapse down for you, so you can just carry it on your car keychain and bring it to restaurants with you. That is true. I know some people need to use a straw, and if you need to, get the reusable one. Perfect. Bryce, what is your encouragement for sustainability today? So I think a great one is limit your showers. Cut down, Set a timer and just say, you know what? I'm My showers have always been 15 minutes. Now I'm going to cut my showers down to 10 minutes. You're going to save money. You're going to save water, and you're doing a great thing. Well, I want to thank Bryce for being here today, taking time out of her crazy schedule. Thank you so much. We want to say once again, happy Earth Day, everybody. Happy Earth Day. All right, so go ahead, go out and be sustainable, everybody. I'm Alex Avellino, and we'll talk to you guys soon. Welcome to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Welcome back to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, your Pre-Veterinary Advisor at the University of Florida College of Veterinary Medicine. Today we have a really interactive and fun episode. I'm with Arizona Spencer, one of our new class of 2023 members. Arizona, how are you doing? I am fantastic. How are you? I am so good. I'm so happy to have you because we are going to actually go through your application. The reason we're doing this is I feel like students sometimes think about the application a little bit too abstractly, so we want to make it very concrete. So Arizona has her iPad. It's going to show her application from her perspective, and I have my iPad, and it's going to go over what the admissions committee actually sees. So Arizona, before we even get started with the application, I know students are probably super excited to hear what you did. Um, but I want to remind everybody that this is Arizona's story. Her story is going to be specific to her, and she's been gracious enough to come and share that story with us. But we are not saying that what Arizona did is what you guys need to do. This is just to get you more familiar with the application. So first, Arizona, can you go ahead and tell us a little bit about your background, your experience, your education? Sure. So I went to UF for undergrad. I did animal science, kind of the usual, quote unquote usual, uh, pre-vet track. Um, I did a lot of work throughout undergrad. Um, I worked almost all four years. Uh, in the last two years, I worked heavily in the small animal hospital. I did a lot of volunteer work. So when you said that you worked in the hospital, you mean the UF Small Animal Hospital? Yes. Um, now, you're a cardio tech. Did you work anywhere else or was it mostly in cardio? It was mostly at cardio in f at first. And um, I think about maybe like six or eight months into that job, I got a second job. Uh, it was with research. Good. Perfect. Yeah. And, um, you know, students, some things to think about here. So Arizona had, you know, great experience going on. She got her research in. she definitely had hands on veterinary experience. And she did mention that her GPA and GRE scores were not, you know, the highest that uh, of the range. 
Now, as most of you know, we don't require the GRE anymore, which is great. So don't worry about that. But your GPA, while important, is not everything. So let's go through all of the extras. The first thing we want to go over, you know, Arizona, it opened up last May. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the date that you turned your application in? So I turned it in the day it was due. Ha! Really? <laughs> yes. Um, and yeah. that's a good point because everybody's oh, always God. asking me, oh. should I turn it in early? Does it make yes. a difference? I know quite a few students who actually turned it in last minute and they're here and that's fine. So there's no rush for your own sanity. You know, you might want to turn it in a little bit earlier. I know I would be turning it in probably two weeks in advance. However you want to do it, it's fine. So Arizona got her application in. The first thing our office does is we look at the students who have the GPAs that we want to see that year. Now, we don't have a specific range. We don't have a minimum number. What we do is we say this year we can review this many students. So the year that Arizona applied, which was this year, we had 1,242 applicants, and we reviewed over 750 of them. So she was in a pool of 750. Then that's based on GPAs. So you can imagine that was a wide range. She got, gets processed by three people. And those three reviewers look at the entire application. So the first thing I think that we should talk about, Arizona, is your experiences. So there are six sections, animal experience, employment, extracurricular, research, veterinary, and volunteer. So I can see that Arizona had animal experiences. She had paid employment. She had a lot of extracurricular activities. She has her research that we talked about. She has veterinary experience and she has volunteer experience. So she had all six sections. Now, folks at home, that does not mean you need to have all six. However, it does help you stand out, look well-rounded, and it will give her more things to talk about in an interview. So Arizona, of these experiences that you have in front of you, can you tell me you know, briefly which ones helped prepare you for vet school, and maybe some that students aren't specifically thinking about, maybe not necessarily just veterinary experiences. Let's see. So cardio definitely uh, really, really prepared me for what I assume vet school will be like in the whole veterinary field as well. Uh, I got to work close with the vet students. We get them every two weeks, and uh, that way I was able to really be able to ask them questions, and any concerns I had, they kind of told me and they prepared me. Um, and kind of got me, gave me an idea as far as what I would be expecting and kind of where to go. You know, something I want to bring up, I'm looking on your experiences, underemployment. You were a Statue of Liberty sign yes. waiver. <laughs> okay, folks. So, you know, I've had Arizona as a pre-vet student for a while, so this doesn't surprise me. But um, for those of you who drive down the street and you see those, those folks wearing a Statue of Liberty costume or even... Any Domino's, Pizza Hut, everyone's got someone who waves the sign outside of their establishment. You were one of those people. Yes, I was. My first job. Talk me <laughs> through why that was a good experience for vet school. I feel that it really helps because you you take every opportunity that you can mm -hmm. and you learn from it. Yes. Um, that obviously is not a glorif, like a really exciting job I mean it, it is exciting but like you know it's obviously not in vet med it's obviously you know it's Florida it's hot you're yeah. gonna be sweaty um but you do learn to really appreciate the opportunities that you are given um <laughs> <laughs> even if it is dancing in the blazing hot sun or in the rain or anything like that yeah I'm not telling you guys to go out and get that job per se but <laughs> no, it does stand but, out hey, yeah so we talked about the research and the vet experience. You have a lot of extracurricular activities. You were a TA. You did Operation Catnip. Another interesting experience I'm seeing on here is your volunteer experience with the Alachua County Crisis Center. Talk me through why you chose that experience and what you learned from that. I have always been interested in mental health. I wanted to learn and be able to communicate with all kinds of people and be able to learn those skills um, early on. Yeah, working at a crisis center can relate to a lot of parts of the field because it can relate to students in the veterinary class. Mm -hmm. It can relate to veterinarians who are already in the profession who are going through ups and downs. And then it also helps with your clients because you're going to see clients who are coming in who are not on their best day if they're bringing their animal in. And so working with humans in general helps with those skills. But specifically for what Arizona did working with the crisis center, she really got exposed to that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so hopefully this sparked your interest in other areas besides just veterinary experience, potentially other employment opportunities and volunteer opportunities. And don't forget about that research. 
Okay, Arizona, let's go to the essays portion of our application. So we're not going to break down the essays explicitly, but we want to know what your thought process was when you were writing them. So you all will be required to write three essays for VEMCAS, and these could change every year, but the current essays that Arizona had to write um, were about the career choices in veterinary medicine, in what ways do veterinarians contribute to society, and she needed to consider the breadth of the profession and talk about how what uh, attributes veterinarians need. So specifically with the VEMCAS essays, can you tell me how you approached them? I believe in the pre-vet club, we had kind of a snippet as far as like, these are what the prompts are gonna be or what they're gonna be like. And um, so when the time got closer and when I think the application actually opened, um, I created a Google Doc um, because I would open up the Google Doc and I would kind of just like put points down that would come to me throughout the day okay. or whatever. Um, and then really when the time came, I would sit down and just like just go for it and kind of string those points together. Okay. So what I like about this is it's almost kind of like an essay journaling. Yes. That when you had ideas, you would go to your doc, you'd write it down. Okay. And then when it came time to write the essay, I have to imagine it was easier to write because you had those points. More or less, yeah. <laughs> Good. Okay. Yeah. So those are the VEMCAS essays. We have specific essays as well. So UF this year required five essays. The purpose of five essays was to go for our holistic application process. We want to get to know each student as much as possible. This year, the essays were on academic performance, experiences that prepared you to enter veterinary school. Students had to choose two or three words that described them and one that didn't from a bank of words. So that's all about self-awareness. Students had to pick th one of three topics to define a strategy um, about a current veterinary issue. So for example, trap neuter return programs or horse soaring or small animal shelter euthanasia. A student would have to choose one and come up with a plan and strategy to make it work in a community. And finally, the last question was about diversity. Um, and we have a whole podcast on diversity with Dr. Jones. So we're, we won't delve into that one right now, but I encourage everyone to go to episode two of the pre-vet pause cast and listen to how you can approach the diversity question. Here are some tips for the essays that I think everyone needs to know. If you are going to write something in an essay, it needs to be reflective somewhere in the experiences section. So if you were to write, I want to be an aquatic animal veterinarian someday, and I see no aquatic animal experience in your experiences section, and I see no aquatic animal coursework, that's not going to make sense. Mm -hmm. So make sure your essays make sense for your story and who you are. Do not feel like you cannot repeat what was in the experience section. So I know one of our students in the class of 2022 played tuba in the marching band. So that is in his experience section, but he also wrote about it in an essay and that is okay. In fact, it is good mm -hmm. because you are then able to elaborate on those experiences. Right. So don't feel like you're double dipping from sections. I feel like I wrote, like I, I kind of repeated myself, but then I was able to elaborate on them a little bit more. So I'm just gonna pull up one of Arizona's essays. No one is gonna copy these essays. This is just to give an example of some good writing and getting to know Arizona. So regarding her academic performance, she says, quickly finding a job after moving to attend UF was a necessity since first generation freshman students usually have little to no family financial contribution. What a great opening sentence, because immediately I know Arizona is a first generation college student and that she was looking for a job immediately and that she had to struggle through you know, financial difficulties. Mm -hmm. Being a first generation student means that she is the first person in her family to go to college. I also like from her essay about choose two words that sound like you and one that doesn't. Just listen to the sentence. During my two minutes of CPR, I verbally instructed the assembly of our cardiac defibrillator while emergency started placing an IV catheter. Although Lavender did not survive her arrest, my efficiency and composure facilitated optimal treatments and guidance. My ability to facilitate is not limited to emergency situations as it is a daily demonstration with students. I uplift students while personalizing teaching methods to compensate for weaknesses in every two week block. So I'm really getting to know who Arizona is. She used a specific example about a dog named Lavender yes. and she's showing me how she reacts under pressure, but that she's also translating it to human interaction. As many times as you, as you guys can relate human and animal interaction, the better. Letters of recommendation. <laughs> I immediately thought of you know, doing my employers, um, someone from cardio, and my manager from my other job, and an academic advisor. Um, I couldn't bet choose between two doctors in cardio. I felt one I helped you know with lab research, and then the other one kind of saw me on a clinical basis. 
Um, so I decided to go with both, and I just kind of asked the one, like, hey, even though you've seen me on clinics, like, please, can you focus a little bit more on the lab aspect that I've helped you in? So what I like that Arizona did was she thought about who was going to write her letters, who knows her the best, and she asked specifically what she would like one of the letter writers to focus on. Mm -hmm. Arizona ended up with four letters. Like she said, she had two veterinarians, one to focus on vet med, one to focus on research. You had an employer and an academic yes. reference. Now I'm going to talk about the piece that Arizona might not know as much about. So the scoring part. What happens is she turned in her application. Uh, we reviewed it because she was one of the top, you know, 750 students. It went to three people. Those three people score her um, on a point scale. This can change every year. But in general, veterinary students in general are being evaluated on, you know, can they handle the academic coursework? So we can see that through your transcripts. We can see that through her essay on her assessment of her academic performance. We are assessing you on pre-veterinary and life experiences, specifically on resiliency. We're looking for self-awareness, and we are seeing that in her essay about you know two words that describe her and one word that doesn't. So can you evaluate yourself on your strengths and weaknesses? We are also looking for her social awareness. That is specific to veterinary medicine. So that is on the horse soaring, trap neuter release, and um, small animal shelter euthanasia essay that we brought up. So when you guys approach an essay, especially on an issue that has two sides, make sure you address both and then make sure you address why you favor one side over the other. And finally, they are going to assess you on your understanding of diversity, um, which again, you guys are going to listen to episode two of our podcast to understand that. And they evaluated her on her letters of recommendation. After they do all of this, then they decide, should this student be admitted? And they are going to say, yes, invite for an interview, um, invite a space available, and finally, do not invite. And they tend to give comments. So this year, Arizona, you know, got three, please invite for an interview. So after the three admissions committee members review her packet, then she's given a total number of points. Then we calculate the amount of points everybody has and we can only interview the top 315-ish students. And that's the hardest conversation I have with students is when I have an amazing student who I know is gonna be a great veterinarian, but it just wasn't the right year for them because maybe the applicant pool was too competitive or maybe there were their application could have been a little bit more refined or they could have gone over their essays one more time. So she had enough points to get to an interview and then she had a great interview and that got her enough points to get into the class of 2023. Yay. Um, so that's a basic overview of the application process. And remember, it's not just about the numbers. Arizona's GPA is not a 4.0. Far from it. Far <laughs> from it. And we're not going to tell you what it is because it's not, it doesn't matter what it is. What matters is the year that she applied and the experiences that she's had and how she has expressed those experiences on paper and in person in the interview was perfect for this year and got her a seat in the class of 2023. She is an extremely hard worker. I am not surprised that she got in, but even if she hadn't gotten in this year, that would not have devalued any of her experiences. We just would have tried again. Mm -hmm. And for so many students, it wasn't the year for them. And I hope that this podcast helps you think a little bit more about things you can add to your application. But just to remember, it depends on the year. And it depends on how you express yourself. And for this year, it was Arizona's year. And what advice do you have for students who are getting ready to apply? Breathe. <laughs> Breathe. It can get very overwhelming very quickly. Um, time manage but most importantly, breathe. It's going to be okay. Just take a couple bites at a time. Don't overwhelm yourself. It will be fine. Well, I want to thank Arizona for being here today and taking time out of her cardio schedule to be here and for her advice and willingness to go through the entire application. We look forward to the applicants for the class of 2024. If you have any questions at all about your application, you can always contact our office. I'm Alex Avellino, and we'll talk to you soon. Welcome to the Pre-Vet Pausecast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Okay, 
Hey, welcome back to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I am your host, Alex Avellino, the Pre-Vet Advisor for the University of Florida College of Veterinary Medicine. Today, our guest is Dr. Crawford. She is one of our clinical professors at the UFCVM, and she is a shelter medicine veterinarian as well as the director of Maddie's Shelter Medicine Program. Dr. Crawford, well, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Can you go ahead and tell us what your background is like? How did you become a veterinarian? What were your educational experiences? I went to undergraduate school at North Carolina State University where I majored in animal science. Uh, I was in the pre-veterinary curriculum, but I decided um, to go into um, research. So uh, instead of applying to veterinary school at the time, I had taken a few courses as a a junior and senior in undergraduate school Mm -hmm. that really uh, piqued my interest in examining complex problems Mm -hmm. and trying to find solutions. I completed a Master of Science uh, degree graduate school at NC State. Uh From there, I applied uh, for PhD programs, and I was accepted by the College of Medicine at the University of Florida, and it was focused on infectious diseases Mm -hmm. and immunology in people. As I was finishing this program in the College of Medicine, I started thinking more about how I could apply this training and education to animal Mm -hmm. uh, diseases. And so I applied to veterinary school. Fortunately, I was accepted, Mm -hmm. so I went straight from uh, the PhD to veterinary school. Okay. So you had an interesting journey, got your bachelor's, went into research, did the master's, did the PhD, and then finally going to vet school at the University of Florida. That is correct. Wow. When you went to vet school, were you planning on focusing on shelter medicine or were you thinking research? What was your original plan? I was thinking that when I finished uh, veterinary school and learning all about animal, the animal physiology, the diseases of animals, um, use of vaccines to prevent diseases, that I would go back into research, Mm -hmm. uh, but applying it to veterinary problems, okay. not human medical problems. Sure. So after graduation, I went into practice in Tallahassee, Florida. Okay. And I stayed in a veterinary practice setting, private practitioner uh, for dogs and cats for uh, 12 years. Mm-hmm. At that point, I had a rekindling of uh, a desire to come back and do research to help animals and to teach veterinary students. Yes. And so I was fortunate to um, secure a faculty position at the University of Florida's College of Veterinary Medicine at that time. What this illustrates is that there's not one pathway only to becoming a veterinarian. So we've come to the, you've gotten your faculty position at UF. Talk to me about what is shelter medicine? Okay. Well, currently there are about four to eight million dogs and cats that enter shelters in this country each year. We need shelter veterinarians who are very knowledgeable and skilled in how to protect animal health while they are in shelters temp- temporarily waiting for a home. Yes. And to rehabilitate and successfully treat those that may have an illness or an injury or a behavior problem uh, where we have anywhere from 50 to 350 dogs and cats every day that that um, need to have their health care um, overseen by a veterinarian. Yeah, it sounds like shelter medicine veterinarians need to not only be proactive, so making sure all of those animals have what they need first, vaccines, um, prop, you know, spay and neuter, but also reactive, so if there's outbreak of illness in the shelter, and then that husbandry piece of taking care of those animals on a day-to-day basis. 
what is what's a common behavioral issue we might see in shelter animals and what are some common diseases what should a student thinking about getting into shelter med expect to see typically in a shelter diseases like canine distemper it's this is a viral infection it can cause high mortality um, and the best way to prevent dogs from getting canine distemper virus infection is through vaccination. Another disease that shelter veterinarians are commonly tasked with diagnosing and treating is canine parvovirus, mm -hmm. which is another viral infection uh, that um, inf uh, infects the gastrointestinal tract and can cause severe vomiting and diarrhea to, and dehydration to the point that 90% of infected dogs will die if not managed uh, correctly. Yeah. Um, we have some feline um, infectious diseases um, that commonly occur in shelters. Most of these are viral respiratory infections. And talk about the behavioral issues we might see from shelter, med shelter animals. Behavior is a very common reason for owners to surrender their dogs yeah, to a shelter. Right. And the most common scenario is that these, this family mm -hmm. acquired uh, this dog as a puppy and um, they did not for various reasons invest in training the puppy or learning how to manage this puppy as it grew up into a very big dog yes. that uh, did not have manners. So what can a veterinarian do for that, that dog? Well, they can identify the root cause of uh, the behavior. So potentially just no training, lack of training. Lack of training. Um, there are uh, uh, certain medications that we can uh, give these dogs to calm them down okay. and make them receptive to training. Now, the veterinarian doesn't provide the training, but shelters have access Wonderful. to um, uh, professional um, trainers. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm glad you said that. I have a lot of students come in and say, I'm really interested in animal behavior. And I think what they're saying is they want to rehab that animal when they are without manners. But we're saying that the shelter veterinarians are not doing the actual behavior training. They're identifying, maybe di uh, providing a, a script for medication, and then they find resources for that animal. So Dr. Crawford came prepared. She did her homework. She's gonna tell you what a shelter med vet does regularly. Yes, I would say the shelter veterinarian uh, experiences a lot of variety every day. Surgery is a big role for the veterinarian um, um, in the shelter. Uh, they are responsible for uh, performing uh, what we call high quality, high volume spay neuter surgery. Yeah. A well-trained shelter veterinarian is extremely proficient and spay new surgery, most of them can do 30 to 40 surgeries a day, wow. which is unheard of in private practice. Yes. And they, uh, they get so proficient in um, the high quality spay neuter techniques that it just takes them minutes to do each animal. Wow. They also have to have proficiency in other surgical procedures, surgical diseases that commonly present in animal shelters. And, and this, these are eye diseases, yeah. um, uh, fractured uh, legs, uh, wound management, many animals, dogs and cats come in with with wounds, um, probably from fighting while they were out in the community. Mm -hmm. One thing that's not thought about, but is a very important role for the shelter veterinarian, is they are the first responders for community emergencies and disasters that impact animals. Okay. Um, it's the shelter veterinarian and, the, and their shelter team that is frequently tasked by community emergency management officials to set up a temporary shelter yes. for animals displaced by emergencies. So if we're in the state of Florida, typically hurricanes. 
hurricanes, yes, wildfires, tornadoes, also some man-made emergencies. Okay. And the most common man-made emergency that shelter veterinarians are tasked with responding to is animal cruelty. Mm. So it's the shelter veterinarian that most often will have to be the one to recognize and respond to abused and neglected animals in the community. Uh, What I find with a lot of students who are interested in shelter medicine, they have a big heart for animals, but they also have a big heart for people as well. Oh, I, I I think the successful veterinarian maybe defining successful as uh, the one that is most satisfied with their career choice mm-hmm. is the one that not only loves animals, yes. but loves people too. Talk about that. And what has to be realized is that half of veterinary medicine is taking care of people too. Absolutely. And so there must be that innate drive to help people who love pets yeah, and work in preserving the human-animal bond. We've talked about how great an opportunity it is to become a shelter medicine veterinarian. Let's talk about how UF can help <laughs> students get there. So talk to me about what Maddie's shelter medicine program is. What is the certificate like? What do students get to do while they're with us getting their DBM degree? Well, there's a there's thousands of animal shelters in this country, and there's a critical shortage nationally uh, for uh, veterinarians trained in the specialized care of shelter animals. So, the mission of our Maddie Shelter Medicine Program at UF is to provide veterinary students with the specialized knowledge and skills to enhance medical and behavioral health of animals while they're in shelters. And in doing so, it increases that shelter's life-saving goal and placement of healthy and happy pets into the community. It also promotes public health. So that's another big aspect of the shelter veterinarian and something that we emphasize in our training uh, in shelter medicine at, at UF. We are the only vet school that offers a professional certificate in shelter medicine. And this certificate program consists of uh, a blend of courses and hands-on training in the shelter environment itself. So Dr. Crawford, there are a couple um, of issues that come up in interview or essay questions for students. Two of them deal specifically, I think, with shelter medicine. One is trap-neuter return programs, and the other is small animal shelter euthanasia. Can you talk about how students should approach those questions? What should they understand about those issues? Yes, and if I could add a little historical perspective to shelter pet euthanasia. Yes. In In the 1970s, we had about 23 million dogs and cats entering animal shelters every year. Much more than the The 48 48 million million today. And most of those animals never left the shelter. Okay. It's a very high euthanasia rates. Um, With the emergence of uh, animal welfare, Okay. And shelter medicine yes. in in the nineties, and then then into uh, the two thousands. On a national level, we're now saving more than eighty percent of the dogs and cats entering shelters. Euthanasia is no longer an acceptable tool to manage the population of homeless pets entering shelters. When is or, it acceptable? It's acceptable under the same conditions where it it is used for well cared for loved pets. And that is when the shelter pet has a disease that is not um, no longer treatable or manageable to a level where they're no longer having any suffering or pain. So we're exhausting all options. Yes. 
So our slogan at the UF College of Veterinary Medicine is challenge accepted. And what it sounds to me is that there was a challenge, you know, yes. years ago that we had so many shelter animals coming in and we were euthanizing these animals. But now because of education and research and excited shelter veterinarians, we accepted the challenge and have really reduced the amount of animals that needing to be put down. That is a, there's another alternative that's specific for cats, and that is that what we uh, call now our uh, return to field strategies that's applicable to cats living in a community without direct ownership by a person. Typically, these are called feral cats mm -hmm. or free roaming cats. Um, these cats. Um, typically live in large colonies where instead of euthanizing these cats that otherwise were healthy and thriving in the environment, the approach is now to sterilize them. Okay. So to spay and neuter them, vaccinate them against rabies, the most important infectious disease to vaccinate animals against yeah. because of the public health concern, of course. as well as the common um, cat infectious diseases and return them to the environment where they were thriving. Dr. Crawford, thank you so much for being here today. We've learned a lot more about what shelter medicine is, the unique issues at face shelters, the type of person who maybe would be really excited about becoming a shelter vet. Students, your homework is to look into these issues at face shelters, find out Maybe you have some new, unique insights as to how we can solve them. Look into the Maddie Shelter Medicine Program, which will prepare you to be a practice-ready shelter veterinarian. Thank you so much again for being here, and we will see you guys next time on our Pre-Vet podcast. Thank you, Alex. Welcome to the Pre-Vet podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Welcome back to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, your pre-veterinary advisor at the University of Florida College of Veterinary Medicine. On today's episode, we have Dr. Martha Malicote. She is one of our clinical assistant professors at UF. She is also the Veterinary Practice Management Certificate Director, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. Business management, um, one of the certificates that UF has to offer our students. And before we get into that, Dr. Malicote, thank you for being here. Absolutely. I'm so excited to get to talk to all of your prospective students. Yes, they are excited too. Um, I think that the fact that UF has four certificates is something that's really exciting for students to know about. I think it makes our college a little bit different. I like to explain it like they're getting a minor in a certain area. I think that's a great way to explain it, and I absolutely agree with you that it's a huge strength for our programs because veterinary students can really focus in on an area that is sometimes not available at all of the other veterinary schools, and believe it or not, it's almost no cost. Any costs that are engaged are, are really just about if you have to travel for anything particular for that certificate program. So it's really a bargain, not unlike a minor. So Dr. Malico, before we get into the specifics of the certificate, can you tell the students about your veterinary background? Where did you go to undergrad? Where did you get your DV? How did you know this profession was for you? Absolutely. I guess I have a potentially unique scenario compared to many pre-vet students out there because I had absolutely no intention of going to veterinary school through my entire undergraduate degree. I have undergraduate degrees in economics and business administration. I went to the College of Charleston in South Carolina, which is a fantastic university, has great science programs, of which I used none of. <laughs> and then once I graduated and got out in the workforce, I had always ridden horses. I grew up riding and showing, and I was kind of like, hey, you know, maybe I should have gone a different way. And so um, I went back to school. I took a bunch of different classes at a variety of local universities and ended up getting accepted into the University of Tennessee's veterinary program and um, graduated and went out into practice. And I was the standard issue equine practitioner for several years. I was in ambulatory practice, um, which I think is a great experience for any kind of practitioner. Um, and then subsequent to that, I did a residency in internal medicine, came back to academia, and now I teach at the University of Florida. 
So when so for students who don't know, ambulatory means that you go to houses, correct? Exactly. Most large animal practice functions that way. It's really hard to transport, you know, a whole herd of horses or cattle. And mm-hmm. so for the most part, we will go to a farm. We bring some kind of a vehicle that's equipped with all the supplies we need in order to provide the care. And we show up. And it's an amazingly intimate view into someone's life because mm-hmm. often you're at their home, at their farm, and often at their family business. And so the relationships that I made with owners of those animals was probably more important to me than the veterinary practice that I got to do. And that's one of the things I miss the most about that type of practice is the relationships with my clients that I saw on the regular basis. I saw their kids. I was at their house more or less. And it's a very intimate relationship. How did you know that you would do well with science? Because I know vet med is so heavy science based. Well, I sometimes wonder if I should have paid more attention to that, but um, I, you know, certainly was very math oriented. Um, A lot of business and economics is scientific Mm, in terms of the fact that they make decisions based on data. Um, It's a very data driven area. There's some use of statistics. So there's a lot of crossover. Um, And I think Science training is incredibly important for veterinary students in terms of needing to get the basics so that you understand. Mm -hmm. But equally important for veterinary students are things like communication, Mm -hmm. things like how to be an effective practitioner, be efficient, how to get along with people. Because as it turns out, pets come with owners and that's who's paying the bill. And so all those other skills that I have, I think were, you know, kind of made up the difference. Why is the certificate important to future veterinarians? You know, the things that we spend a lot of time in vet school teaching you guys, and before you get here, quite honestly, have to do with practice, medicine, science. And then we send you out in the world to own your own businesses. And historically, in vet med, we haven't done a very good job of training students to own and run their own practices. And so the, you know, backlash from that has been that there's more and more corporate veterinary practice out there. Practice um, practitioners, veterinarians, don't feel comfortable necessarily taking on that responsibility of practice ownership. But it's so incredibly important for a couple of reasons, both the independence, the opportunity to kind of run your own business, run your own practice and do things the way you want to do them, but also financially. And as much as I think most people get into vet med for reasons other than financial reasons, we do have to pay our bills. And And if you are leaving the the profit that you make in that practice behind for someone else to get, you're missing out. That's an opportunity to pay back student loans faster, to be able to finance other things you want to do with your life. And so the, the practical reality of it is that we need to hang on to that profit that we're bringing into vet practices. For the students who don't want to own their own practice someday, should they count out the certificate, or is it something they should still consider? That's a great question, actually, because while most of my certificate students do want to own a practice, there are a lot of things that we're teaching people that make you a more marketable employee just as much as it makes you a prepared owner of a practice. You have an understanding of the finances behind how the business operates. You have an understanding of how business, uh, pardon me, employment contracts are negotiated, how people are compensated. All those things make you very marketable when you go out into the workforce, you're trying to get a job, and And the practice owners say, oh, wow, you have this extra bit of training that makes you stand out from everyone else. So right now, students, you're trying to think of everything you want to put down in your application to make you attractive to vet school. But you have to keep thinking about those next steps as well while you're in vet school. And that's your clubs and certificates and leadership roles. Let's break down what the certificate actually looks like. What kind of classes do the students need to take? What are the internships or potential externships that they have to do? Um, So basically, you don't have to actively start doing the coursework for the certificate until your third year. And for us, that means, you know, you've probably heard before on the podcast, if you're a regular listener, in third year, students are in the clinic for eight months to start with, and then they go back to class. And it's that point when you're in the clinic, so, you know, you've had some perspective on what things are going to be like, that then you ultimately have to apply for the certificate. So from there, there are two courses in the remaining academics Uh, semesters so that are required and then in addition to that you're required to complete two other clerkships now clerkships are the term we use for clinical training and so those are things like you're in the clinic you're out on the road with an ambulatory practitioner and it's absolutely a learning opportunity but it's an active one and so for this certificate program in addition to the coursework um, which is fantastic and really focused on business basics you know terminology, application to finance, application to management. The certificate opportunities allow you to have a perspective on business management 
to veterinary practice. And so one of the most um, popular parts of the certificate program is a clerkship we do in the summer before fourth year. Students are busy doing externships for all sorts of things, and this is something they fit into that schedule. And we spent two weeks um, visiting veterinary practices as a small group of students, about six, and then myself. And we then at that time analyze a practice a week. It's a very intense experience, but it allows you to learn a tremendous amount about real life practice management. And so each week we basically analyze a practice from top to bottom. We are in the practice, we're observing how things work, and then we analyze financial statements, we compare those to industry benchmarks, and we come up with basically by Friday some feedback for the practice owner about what they're doing well in areas that are opportunities for growth. I think it's awesome that the students have the, first they take the coursework, then they understand what they're going to do, and then they go out and apply it. So I really like that we are doing that hand-in-hand -hand with the students so they feel comfortable. They're not just being thrown into a practice and they don't know what they're doing. I know we have a VBMA club, Veterinary Business Management Club. Mm -hmm. Yes? Veterinary Business Management Association. That's the VBMA. And it's actually a national organization. There's chapters at each vet school. And that club works hand in hand with what I'm doing with the certificate program in that they have outside speakers come in. We have um, professional dinners twice a year. We have a conference once a year. All of that is organized by the club. And you know, completing those club activities is also a requirement of the certificate program. It's an adjunct, but it's really key because it gives you an opportunity to network, to meet people, to broaden your exposure to different concepts outside of what we do in class. I think the networking piece is so important and we try to encourage all of our pre-vet students to start networking, become comfortable with networking. Um, and you know, networking is just talking to others, making those connections so you can find opportunities for yourself in the future. And I try to tell students, you don't always have to look where you think the networking opportunities are. Um, so for example, I tell students, well, why don't you go and volunteer with Habitat for Humanity? You don't know who's working there because potentially a veterinarian is volunteering with you or someone who knows a veterinarian. So while you're making those connections, volunteering to help the community, you're also potentially making future veterinary connections as well. And that's all networking is. Sometimes students are really uncomfortable talking with others. What tips do you have to help students with networking? Networking is something that has a very negative connotation. People think of networking as like you've got your business cards out and you're running through the room trying to make everyone take your business card and talk to you. And that's just really not what it is at all. You know, networking needs to be legitimate. You need to have a, a real reason to talk to someone or it just feels fake and nobody wants to be involved in that. Admittedly, it is a lot easier, I think, for extroverted people to network. It just feels more comfortable. It's a bit harder for introverted people, but that doesn't mean it's impossible. And I think if, if you are someone who's more introverted, you're a little bit more shy, you just need to be prepared for the fact that, hey, networking is going to be a little tough, but then I can refill my tank by spending a little time by myself after this networking opportunity is complete. And so kind of acknowledging that, I think, makes it a little more comfortable for folks to do. The single biggest thing you can do is have a conversation with someone. It's not about here, let me brag to you about here's all the skills I have and here's why I need to know you because you're going to do this for me. It's about, hey, let's have a conversation. And we're both in the veterinary industry. We're both interested in animals. It makes for a very easy bond when you're networking with other veterinarians. And you can find some place of um, similar interests. And having a legitimate conversation will make that a much more powerful long-term effect. My favorite thing that you said was network for a reason. Have a reason to go and speak with someone. And that's so true. I often see students, they come up, they shake hands, and then they think that's it. They, they don't know what to say next. Come up with a purpose. Have a question ready. And if you don't have a question ready, just wait. You don't have to rush that networking opportunity. And yeah, you're right. Networking has a negative connotation. We should start changing it to just... It's just having a conversation. Chat. Yeah, have a conversation. What have we not talked about, Dr. Malico, that you think it's important for students to know about business, um, veterinary business management, what UF has to offer? What do you wish you had known before you had gotten involved in all of this? What do they need to know? Well, the veterinary profession has come a long way since I was a vet student in terms of addressing the fact that we need to train veterinarians to 
to own and run a business. And we need to train them to have some awareness of the business of practice and not just veterinary medicine. And regardless of whether, you know, you think as a pre-vet student, I want to own a practice, getting some training and experience in the non-medicine aspects of veterinary practice is so incredibly important. And whether that be the business certificate or whether that be that you are super into communication and you end up doing some of the elective communication opportunities, there's so many places you can go to get the breadth of training that you really need to be you know, well-trained practitioner. So be proactive, start looking for those opportunities to get communication training, to work with clients, to network like we've been talking about. Um, I, I think it's really important for those students who are shy to do what Dr. Malico says and do what you need to do to network and chit chat, but then take some time for yourself to reset, to feel comfortable, to get grounded, um, and then go back out there and try again until you become more and more comfortable. Well, thank you, Dr. Malico, for being here. We've learned a lot more about another opportunity that UF has to offer us and to prepare our students to go into business, to feel comfortable, to maybe own their own practice someday, but even if you don't want to own your own practice, just to feel more comfortable in the profession you're getting into. Absolutely. Look forward to seeing all of you guys as vet students in the future. I'm Alex Avellino, and we'll talk to you soon. Welcome to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Welcome back to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, and today my guest is Dr. Larkin. She is going to help us understand the Aquatic Animal Health Certificate that we have at UF, which is part of our certificate series. So Dr. Larkin, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy you're here. You are the education coordinator and lecturer for the Aquatic Animal Health Program. You went to graduate school, so can you tell us your educational path and how you got this position that you have today? So my story is a little funny because um, I thought I was going to be an artist. And so I went to the other Florida school, Florida Florida State. State. Seminoles. And they have a really good art program there. Um, But I guess about halfway through, I decided I didn't want to turn something I love into work. Mm. Um, And so I switched majors. um, And I ended up uh, graduating in a major in psychology, Um, more like neuroscience. When I finished, I ended up coming to work at UF with Dr. Roger Reap, who is a comparative neuroanatomist. Uh, and what does a comparative neuroanatomist do? Right. Well, when I first walked into his lab, he had jars of brains of just about every animal you could imagine. Oh, well, so, sure. Um, who doesn't? Yeah. So he had quite a collection. But at the time, uh, I was doing work for him related to understanding uh, neurotransmitters in, in rats. Um, but he had a graduate student who was uh, basically mapping out the manatee brain. Oh, okay. So that's kind of how I got my into the aquatics field. So did you master's PhD? No, I went straight into the PhD. Okay. I read a lot of things about manatees. At the time, there really wasn't much known. Um, and my interests actually turned towards reproduction. Okay, so undergrad at Florida State, PhD at UF? Yes. Okay, in, in, the, in the manatee college. repro. Yes. Okay. Um, And so you did that. And then was there an in-between time before you started working for the College of Vet Med? Um, No, I've been at the Vet Med since I started with Dr. Reed. I think a lot of students hope that when they get involved in aquatics, they get to put their hands on aquatic animals. Can you talk about the likelihood that that happens? I think they really want to know how much can they get involved with their hands. As a graduate student, um, I I did a lot of behavioral observations, so I got to watch them a lot. Um, As a postdoc, I got to do some tagging and tracking. Um, So I did get to do some hands-on stuff. Mm -hmm. In reality, no, you're not putting hands-on on marine mammals. Even if you know, if you go through the um, DVM route, yeah, we're going to talk a lot about it. You're going to get to see a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, But no, you're not going to be putting hands on marine mammals either. It's not until you're an intern or a resident that you're likely to get your hands on a marine mammal. Right. And part of that is just because there are so many permits involved. And um, it's not a trivial matter to interact with marine mammals, whether you're in a managed setting or in the wild. Sure. So, but... But if you're interested in 
sea turtles, there's maybe more likelihood. If you're interested in fish and invertebrates, there's definitely a lot of opportunities to do hands-on. So there's a big range. Um, and we generally encourage our students to be broad in their interests because mm-hmm. there are very few jobs where you're just doing anything with marine mammals. Right. Um, even if you get that dream job at SeaWorld, yeah. uh, you need to handle all the animals. Okay. Okay. So yeah, I think it's really important for us to focus on the realities because I get quite a few students who say, I only want to work with dolphins. And I just feel like that's not very realistic for them. So what we would tell that student is you're going to learn how to treat many animals. You probably won't be getting your hands on that many during the DVM that will come later in your internship and residency, which we've talked about on previous episodes. Um, And then they just need to be realistic that it is a small field. Yes. Let's dive in, dive in, get it guys, aquatics. Let's dive into the actual aquatic animal health certificate that UF offers. What courses do students take to get the certificate? Right, so um, the core courses that are required um, are CVET, uh, which is a very popular course, uh, uh, Diseases of Warm Water Fish, which is an online course that's offered during the summer months. Um, we have uh, Topics in Aquatic Animal Health, which is a face-to-face class. Well, the idea is to teach students how to critically evaluate the reading material and journal articles um, because when working with endangered species, you have to really be able to critically evaluate some of the information that you're reading. Mm. Um, you can't just sort of take things at face value. Okay. And then students can have a choice between uh, doing um, a research project or participating in externships. Most of the students do externships because, Mm -hmm. of course, that's where you get to go out to the different facilities and participate in in casework, and and then you can actually get some hands-on opportunities. What are some of the popular locations for the externships? We have a pretty long list. I mean, obviously, places like SeaWorld or uh, the Living Seas in Disney are are very popular. The Shedd Aquarium, the Florida Aquarium, Georgia Aquarium, the Marine Mammal Center uh, over in California. We have places all over. Okay. Uh, Can you break down what CVET looks like? CVET. So CVET is taught by Dr. Michael Walsh, and it's a two-week course, uh, which is um, face-to-face, so hands-on. Um, it's a mix of lectures, but then also a lot of field trips. And so they'll go to places like Marineland, uh, as well as Clearwater Aquarium, Jacksonville Zoo. And yeah, I got to be a part of CVET last year, and it was really fun going around to the different locations. They get to, they teach you what it looks like to be a veterinarian at SeaWorld or an aquarium. Um, it helps students network a little bit, but also realize, you know, this is a potential future career for them, even though the the field is pretty small for those positions. Dr. Larkin, what would you tell the pre-vet student who's an undergrad? What kind of experience, what kind of opportunities do they need to pursue if they think they want to become involved with aquatic animals? Well, I get that question a lot. The specializing in aquatics, I mean, it's really a wildlife specialty. Um, And so specializing in veterinary medicine is really something you do way down the road. So if you want to take time to volunteer under a veterinarian and they're doing stuff related to aquatics, that all is getting you to the place where you want to be. There are certainly some places where it's easier to work under a veterinarian, Um, anything related to fisheries. There's a lot of opportunities there that are growing. Mm -hmm. So that's in aquatics, that's one of the fields where there are greater and greater opportunities, whereas the number of zoo vet or aquarium vet uh, opportunities, yes, they're there, but that's not necessarily a growing industry. Mm-hmm. For those students that I brought up earlier, the ones who say, I only want to work with dolphins, is potentially a PhD program more suitable for those students? Because you got to focus mostly on manatees. Right. So professional school is very different. It's very prescriptive. So there are fixed courses that you need to take in order to get in. Once you get in, there are fixed core courses that you, you need to take. You have some choices in your electives and tracks that you can take. Um, in a graduate program, it's um, much more unique, and students can pursue interests specific to them. 
assuming that there's a mentor in a lab that is doing something that they find of interest and is able to take them in. So we have uh, students who are working on uh, reproduction manatees. Um, we've had students looking at nutrition in uh, manatees and dolphins. Um, we currently have some students looking at the microbiome of a variety of different marine mammals. We've also been doing health assessments and trying to determine the difference between healthy and unhealthy sea urchins. So everything Lots from, of variety. Yeah, fish and invertebrates, marine mammals, sea turtles, all kinds of variety. Um, Dr. Larkin, can you give us an example of some invertebrates? All right. So uh, corals, um, there's a lot going on with corals now with climate change, with warmer temperatures, mm -hmm. and with ocean acidification. Ocean acidification is going to impact all kinds of shellfish as well. It's going to limit their ability to actually create those shells. Mm -hmm being aware of those kinds of impacts. And, and I think one of the unique benefits of having um, a DVM degree in aquatics is that you get a better sense of how diseases and impacts, health impacts, can transfer from one species to another, mm -hmm. regardless of whether that's corals to fish or fish to people or you know people back to the environment. So that one health aspect um, that comparative medicine, that comparative um, training that you end up having um, is very helpful. Okay, good. So that's definitely something for you in, um, who are interested in getting involved in aquatics that it's beyond, you know, the animal. It's how is it affecting the people and the environment as well. Dr. Larkin, I had a student on the other day who talked about sustainability. What are some things that humans can do to help the aquatic animal health and our future in the ocean and freshwater? What, what are some things that we can do or be aware of? Right. So I just had a guest speaker a little bit ago focus uh, for us on plastics. Mm. And, um, and that's really a very obvious and somewhat uh, easy way once you start thinking about it something that you can personally work on, um, you know, to try to remember those bags when you go to the grocery store, to try to remember your water bottle instead of, you know, grabbing a, you know, a bottled water. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, being more careful about, do you really need to bring those leftovers home in that styrofoam container? Things like that. Right. And they affect the oceans because... Oh, yeah, it all ends up in the ocean. Right. <laughs> Whether it's big or small, um, there's a lot of issues with that because it just doesn't degrade. So picking something that, that can be sustainably used and you know degrade to the point where it's not harmful to the next smallest organism. Good forward thinking for us all to remember that for sure. What have we not talked about that you think is important for students who want to go into aquatics, who want to get their veterinary degree or potentially now a PhD or graduate school some things that you wish you had known or did differently, what do they need to know? It ended up being a huge challenge, right? Because there are so many permits and so many limits on what you can do. There really aren't that many individuals that you can interact with to get a decent sample size. In hindsight, I probably would go back and, you know, probably look at a fish species or, or an invertebrate species because there's so much more that you could do and there's so much more room to learn. Well, I want to thank Dr. Larkin for being here today and giving us a better understanding of not only the UF um, Aquatic Animal Health Certificate, but what students can do to get involved in aquatics and their future career options. I'm Alex Avellino, and we'll talk to you soon. Welcome to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. 
Welcome back to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm your host, Alex Avellino, and today we have Dr. Ray, who is a full professor and service chief for the Food Animal Reproduction Medicine Service. He is going to be finishing out our certificate series to talk to us about the Food Animal Certificate. So Dr. Ray, welcome to the show. Thank you. Glad to be here with you. I'm really excited to hear more about food animal medicine with you today, especially because I think sometimes in this era, a lot of students are interested in small animal and we don't hear as much about food animal. So I'm excited to hear what opportunities our DVM students have. Um, Before we go into it, can you tell us about your educational background? Where did you go to undergrad? What degrees do you have? What, What was your journey like? My journey was from Wyoming. I'm from a small town of about 2,000 people in the southwest of Wyoming. And I grew up in a beef cattle producing and sheep producing area of that state. And I had an interest in in working with animals. And so I did my undergraduate animal science degree at Brigham Young University in Utah. And then from there, I went to Colorado State University and got my doctorate of veterinary medicine. And after I finished up with the DVM at Colorado State, I went back to Wyoming, to my hometown, and went into practice there, and I practiced for four and a half years, and then decided I wanted to focus on working with food animals, with cattle specifically, and so I went to University of California at Davis, and there did a residency for three years and got a master's degree in veterinary preventive medicine. Once I completed there, I planned on going back to Wyoming and practicing, but my advisor was good enough to advise me to check out some of the academic uh, positions that were available. And there was one at the University of Florida and one Dr. Ken Braun, who became my mentor here at the University of Florida, hired me and I have been here since. Before we even get into what the certificate has to offer students, can we do an overview of what food animal medicine is? What is a food animal considered? When we talk about food animals, we're talking about those animals that produce food for human consumption. So that could be a dairy cow that's producing milk, or it could be a beef cow producing beef a sheep producing wool or producing meat, or chickens producing eggs or producing meat. And so any of the animals that might be a source of food for humans would be considered a food animal. And so when we're talking about our food animals, we're generally talking about a group of animals rather than individual animals. So our care generally focuses on helping the whole group or population of animals to be healthy so that they can be productive in producing that food source for us. Okay, so now that we know a little bit more about food animal medicine and herd um, health, um, maybe Dr. Ray, can you speak a little bit about how, we talk about One Health a lot on the show, Mm -hmm. and how um, human health, uh, environmental health, and animal health work together. And I know that for herds, they're often eating the environment. How does One Health play with, with food animal medicine? The One Health would be involved in in the wholesomeness and the uh, safety for consumption of the human so that the whole health and the well-being of the person that is consuming that product uh, is is the important part. So as we work with the populations of animals, we want to make sure that uh, they're growing in a way that they are healthy so that as they provide, whether it's milk or meat, Uh, They're providing a healthy, wholesome product for the consuming public. What are one of the biggest misconceptions when maybe purchasing uh, meat or something that a veterinarian could be able to tell the public that they don't know about? I think the biggest issue for most consumers now is they don't realize there's been so much media discussion about antibiotics and about hormones in feed in, in their food that uh, people think that they, they have to worry about that. But really, the USDA department, uh, as with the food inspection system, there is, with the food that you're buying, you do not have to worry about antibiotics or unnatural hormones being in your food source. The system is there, and, and those are people that are interested in food animals as well and those governmental regulatory positions. 
and they're making sure that the consumer has a safeguard so that they don't have to worry about that. That definitely makes me feel relieved. So students, go ahead and do some research about the food that you're eating, where it comes from, how veterinarians play a role into that so you can feel not only more knowledgeable about what you're buying and what you're doing, but feel more comfortable as well. So now we're going to get into the certificate that the University of Florida offers to our DVM students. So Dr. Ray, can you tell us um, what classes do the students need to take? What, what do they get their hands on? How does a student achieve this certificate? Well, let me just give you some background. The certificate uh, came to be because too many of our students that came to us in the third or fourth year of veterinary school, they'd come out on rotation with us, spend time working with food animals and say, wow, this is really cool, but maybe I'm too late in my career and my education to be able to focus on food animals. And so they'd continue on with dogs and cats, but just say, wow, maybe I missed out on something. So we began offering to first and second year students in veterinary school an opportunity to get hands-on experience working with food animals early on in their career so they could just say, hey, this is something I'd like to do and decide that hey, I'm going to focus my classroom education as well as my hands-on experience so that I could potentially do food animal veterinary medicine. Okay. And so the certificate came to be uh, so an important part of that is that we have wet labs that occur generally after class in the evenings or on weekends. Can you clarify what a wet lab means? A wet lab would be an opportunity for students to actually have, have hands-on experience and exposure to uh, animals. So the students in the first and second year are in the classroom. They don't get a chance to get in contact with animals. And so this gives them a chance in that first and second year to actually be out on a farm, work with animals, and have an opportunity to see what's happening in a food animal practice setting. Is part of the reason for that because a lot of food animals are maybe owned by UF and not necessarily a client-owned animal, and that's why food animals are a great way to get your hands dirty? Well, in, in the case, most of the animals that we do use in the wet labs are university animals, and okay. so they're there, they're available. Uh, they are our clients. We, as uh, the veterinarians for the university, uh, do take care of all of the food animal species mm -hmm. that are on uh, that are owned by the University of Florida. So we have an opportunity to work with them. We can work with uh, those clients to have the animals available for students to come out and have some hands-on exposure. Perfect. So this provides some hands-on experience in those first two years. And the students then can say, yes, I'd like to pursue a certificate in food animal veterinary medicine. And then if they do, then we encourage them to participate in elective uh, coursework that would be in-class uh, discussions about food animal, food animals, uh, about ruminant internal medicine, uh, dairy production practice, beef production practice, advanced bovine reproduction, uh, things like that, that so that they can get some uh, additional instruction that would be elective coursework in food animals. And then along with that, we also encourage them to do an individual investigation, which is a, a small research project. And in doing that, they work with the faculty uh, with a food animal species, and so they get some additional hands-on experience. And then we send them out to do externships away from the university, and they spend at least two weeks on two different occasions in food animal practices or places where they can get food animal experience, uh, someplace in Florida or in, in the United States, wherever they would like to get that experience. And so we help them to get that, s that set up and happen so that they can get that additional exposure as they... Uh, work towards that food animal certificate. Okay, so that's a combination of wet labs, elective courses, um, the externships, the externship. so going off-site, mm -hmm. and then will they also do a farms rotation with us? And then they also do, yeah, and so that would be the other factor is that all, the majority of students get an opportunity to come on the clinical rotation with us. But those that are doing the food animal certificate will usually do a second or a third and occasional. We'll have some that do a fourth or even a fifth 
because they, they like, love it so much. They love it so much. They just keep coming back. And uh, so in as much as they're able to do that, why they'll do an elective rotation with us. And research. And Great a, opportunity and to do project. some research. Uh-huh. Yep. Um, can you, what is one of the really popular externship sites students like to go on? We have a couple here in the state of Florida. Uh, there's one down in South Florida where they have uh, a large beef cattle practice. And the students really love uh, the people they work with there, mm. as well as the large numbers of animals that they get to see. Okay. And it's a different type of setting. We have another one that's up in the Panhandle. Uh, it's a dairy practice, and the students enjoy working with the people there. Mm-hmm. We also have a two or three or four practices here close to Gainesville uh, that students are, you know, that may be tied a little bit more to the location are able to go to and spend time working with them as well. Can you talk about the relationship food animal veterinarians have with people? Because I imagine it would be different than a small animal client interaction. It is very different, yep. So our clients, we have very few clients, but lots of animals that we work with. So the numbers of animals, uh, so we'll frequently be at a farm doing different things with different groups of animals, but we're still working with that same client. Mm -hmm. So it's important that we have a good relationship with the client, that we have regular communication with them, uh, that they feel comfortable with what we're doing, and that we feel some some sense of comfort at going to their farm and, and working freely with the animals that they have there. And so it's always it's always great to have those kind of good relationships with a client that you're working with very regularly. Hopefully you all have heard that as a pattern on this podcast. Client communication, client interaction, building that relationship is so important across all fields of veterinary medicine. And we do have one of our clients that has been a client now for over 30 years since, wow. since the beginning of the College of Veterinary Medicine. And we have, our, we have two veterinarians uh, that go out there uh, each week, and they've been going there every week for 30 years. Every and week. I really, I'm glad that we did this because for some reason I thought if you were a food animal veterinarian, maybe you're going out once a year to go visit those animals. It sounds like it's even more involved. Oh, than it's, it's much more intense than that. So, uh, so depending on the type of practice you've got, uh, I do have some clients that I may see only a couple of times per year, mm-hmm. uh, but others that were much more regular and uh, we would expect to be there every one or two every three weeks. You know, students, don't forget that when you're thinking about um, the type of veterinary medicine you want to get into, you do need to work with veterinarians, and it's a great opportunity to get to know the veterinarian while you're driving around potentially for long distances in the car, so make sure you're building those relationships as well. So, Dr. A, we have a food animal club. We have a food animal club. What Mm -hmm. kinds of opportunities do the students get to have in in the food animal club? The food animal club uh, leadership generally looks for different opportunities. They help us set up the wet labs for the certificate. Mm -hmm. So they'll usually have 15 to 18 of those wet labs, but they also look for interesting people that they can invite to come to the college and talk about food animal practice, either veterinarians that are in private practice or veterinarians that are with a pharmaceutical company Mm. or USDA uh, regulatory veterinarians. They can come and uh, talk about uh, what they do as a veterinarian or talk about uh, interesting topics that they might find of interest. I think the USDA students often think about that and they relate it with food animal health and medicine. What um, Can you speak about the potential career opportunities they could have for the USDA? There are predominantly two. One of them would be with APHIS, the animal uh, health uh, portion of it, where they would be working with new emerging diseases or pathogens that might be uh, entering the United States, uh, keeping animals, uh, working up cases or working with animals that might have uh, specific disease problems that are of a regulatory nature within Florida or the United States. And then the other uh, portion is the FSIS, which is the food inspection system. Mm -hmm. And so those would be the ones that are checking to make sure that uh, the meat or eggs or milk or products that are be, uh, being consumed by us are wholesome and uh, are not uh, carrying pathogens uh, of disease pathogens or have uh, residues of any sort that uh, we wouldn't want to enter the food chain. So those would be your big two areas for USDA. 
It sounds like the first one probably has a lot to do with research. There could be some research. Uh, usually the research is done and then they might be out in the field applying those things. We have the research component part of the certificate. Can you tell me um, an example of an interesting research project someone did this year or has done in the past? We have a student that just finished one up, and occasionally students do well enough on these that they can be published, and I think this is one that could very well be published. But she was looking at uh, sick calves or weak calves in beef cattle herds and was looking specifically at weather components and how that might influence those calves. And so she did a very interesting job of putting together temperature, humidity, wind speed, and a number of other uh, weather-related factors into a single measurement. And she worked with uh, a, a weather man in uh, Tallahassee to help her figure out how to do this. Awesome. And then she got the information for all of the calves that were sick or died. And then uh, she looked at the weather patterns three days before, three days after, to look to see what the influence was and found some some very interesting patterns that related to temperature and the changes in temperature. Wow. And uh, it, it's a nice enough paper that I really think we're going to be able to get it published. What a neat concept. Students, uh, I have often hear them say, I don't want to do research. Research is boring. And I think they think research is just sitting behind a microscope because that's what they see. Mm -hmm. And often it's, it's much more, no, it's so much more than that. Dr. Ray, what have we not talked about? What do you think students need to know? Future veterinarians, food animal, you know, focus. What, what do our students need to hear from you today? I think most of the students have lots of exposure with dogs and cats, whether it's in the house or neighbors or whatever. But uh, very seldom, like I said, most students are not coming from rural backgrounds. They're not coming from food animal backgrounds. And that, that comes because... We only have 2% or less of the population now that's associated with food production. And so most students do not have that uh, background in working with uh, food producing animals. And it would be uh, meaningful for them, I think, if they sought out an opportunity, whether it's working with goats or sheep or cattle, uh, finding a veterinarian that does food animal practice and getting some sense of, of what they do. Uh, if nothing else, it'll give you a new perspective on on what veterinary medicine is all about and what food uh, production is all about. Well, students, you heard it here. Your homework is to seek out a food animal veterinarian and food animal experience to not only round out your veterinary application and experience, but potentially to spark new interest in this field that you are interested in. I'm Alex Avellino, and we'll talk to you soon. Welcome to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Welcome back to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, and with me is Ms. Caitlin Geralds, Assistant Director for Career Services at our college. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Alex. I'm excited to be here. Uh, we're excited to have you. And your position is actually pretty rare among veterinary colleges. Can you talk about that? Yes. Yeah, so I am probably one of seven veterinary colleges that have somebody in my role full time that's dedicated to helping the veterinary students get jobs. And so you were here to help veterinary students after they graduate. Are you also there to help them before they graduate? Of course. So I'm here from the day they start classes until up until a year after they graduate. I know we're going to talk about a lot of things uh, today regarding careers and choosing careers and how to prep for that. When you said you're there from the first day, my question is, why would a freshman even need to think about jobs? What do you do with the freshman students? Yes, yeah, so that's a question I get quite often. Um, so starting from the first day, I'm there for students to figure out time management, budgeting, um, and even figuring out what they're doing for their first summer. So how can they start preparing for the career and the goals that they want in the future from their first day? Okay, so first year is a lot of preparatory planning, thinking. Um, continue with me throughout their journey. What do they do next? 
Yes. Yeah, so first year, we're getting acclimated to vet school, getting the transition down. And then that first year summer at UF, the students have it free. So they can do whatever they would like. And it's helpful to start exploring careers and what options they might want to pursue in the future. After that, in second year, it's pretty rough academically. So we focus on getting ready for clinics and making sure that while we're on clinics, we get some good externships that help us prepare for the future as well. Okay, so when they're picking externships, are you helping them set those up? Are you helping them with their resume? How do you factor into that? So I can factor in in all areas, wherever they need help. Um, It can be anything from getting together a vet's resume instead of a pre-vet resume, or it can be trying to figure out how to best spend their small amount of time and put that into their externships. Or it can be they already know what they want to do and they just want to make sure that they're on the right path. Okay, wonderful. So for pre-vet students, a couple of things to note at this point, you have a more great resources when you get to vet school, folks who are here to help you prepare for that next step. Because yay, you know, you got your first dream getting into vet school, but now we have to make sure that you get that dream job that you want. So Caitlin helps you prepare for everything from, you know, working on your resume to getting those externships that will help you be the most uh, attractive candidate to future employers. So Caitlin, what do third and fourth years look like for vet students when they work with you? So starting in the third years, when we really start solidifying what we're interested in after graduation. Let so, me stop you there, Caitlin. Okay. Do pre-vet students need to know what they want to do with their DVM degree right now? No. Okay. Some fourth-year students don't even know yet. Oh, goodness. Okay, <laughs> so for those of you who are thinking about post-DVM degree, which I know I encourage you to do on this podcast a lot, it's good to hear that you can still discover that in vet school and you can still change your mind after vet school. Yes. So it's, well, you don't need to know exactly what you want to do and you don't have to stick to whatever you think you want to do. It's a good idea to start exploring and starting to make those decisions. So like Alex said, you may not know exactly what you want to do, but we know we like emergency or we know we like large animal or we know we don't want to be in a practice setting for all of our career. So starting to explore that and really test those out in an experiential learning environment, which would be your externships, your clinics, your summer jobs, um, is all helpful for making that decision. Come spring of third year is when we really start looking at and applying to and really considering jobs. And then fourth year is when we start solidifying, interviewing, negotiating contracts, and signing those deals. Okay, so we've talked about what a veterinary student's journey looks like with you. I want to hear about jobs in general. What does the job market look like for veterinarians? Is it Does it look positive? Are there things students need to think about? What does the job market look like? So right now, the job market is pretty wonderful for veterinarians that are graduating, and that can change. So you're in vet school for four years, so the economy can change during those four years that you're in vet school by the time you graduate. One of the wonderful things about being a veterinarian, though, is that usually veterinarians are least or not as heavily impacted by economic downturns and changes. So people are typically going to still get care for their pets. And the view of pets now is so much stronger where people are getting more extensive and more intensive care for their pets. So that's good news. Right now, about 88% of our students in the class of 2018 got their first choice for their job. Wow, 88%. So they knew this is what I want and then they got it. Yes. Why do you think that is? Well, I like to say (laughs) that, that we've been able to help with some of that, but I think it's mostly the economy. So right now, that students that are graduating really have the pick of what jobs that they'd like to get. But also, when you know, when you have a better idea of what job you want, and then you have the tools and resources to make you a good candidate for that type of position, you have a better chance of landing that position. So what are our most popular career options for UF graduating students? So for UF, we have a couple different breakdowns. Um, Usually about... 65 to 70 percent of our graduates end up going into private practice or clinical practice. So that is going to be where you go into work every day and you see 
pets that have owners or pets um, individually. Uh, the other 30% of our students right after graduation tend to go into internships, which I think you've talked about on this podcast yeah. before. As a reminder, an internship is a one-year training to get you either more acclimated in the field or to prepare you to go into a residency program. Yes. And so internships can be either private practice or academic practice. So that's a consideration that we always discuss with students. And then we have less than 5%, maybe a little over 5% that end up doing either armed forces, government, other types of maybe public health roles. That's usually the breakdown. I think it's important, and the reason I think it's so helpful that Caitlin is on here today is there's a lot that goes into choosing a job, preparing for a job, and it helps students to just be realistic about the career and the path that they're choosing. So what I want you to get out of today is just to know that you have a lot of great job options. Uh, you have great resources available to you at certain colleges that you're choosing. And just to keep those things in your mind as you go through the process of um, pre-vet and knowing that these are some things you're going to have to think about in the future. I'm so glad that we have this pre-vet podcast available to students. Um, so those of you who are listening, we might be preaching to the choir, but sometimes Um, especially for students who go to professional school, they have great heads on their shoulders and they are able to navigate paths on their own. And we might not always be reaching out for help when we need it. So Caitlin, can you speak to the student who maybe thinks, um, well, you know, I know that this resource is available, but I might not need to use them. Yes. So I would definitely encourage any student who has a resource like this to utilize it, whether it's you have exactly the idea of what you want to do and you're preparing to do it, just to have somebody to bounce ideas off of, to talk through, you know, who should my letters of recommendation be? How should I organize this? And to get some confirmation that you are moving in the right direction. That can be incredibly helpful, especially when vet school is such a stressful time already. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, to have somebody that knows the field, knows what's expected, and can tell you that and confirm that you're on the right path. Um, for those that are maybe on the edge, kind of deciding between two different things. It's great to talk to your faculty and other mentors in the field, other veterinarians, but sometimes it can be helpful to talk to somebody who has no skin in the game, who hasn't gone through a residency and internship for five years to do the field that you are considering doing to really evaluate from a from a third-party perspective. Yeah, good point. So when you are speaking with your mentors, Um, just keep in mind that they potentially could be biased towards moving you um, towards a path that's similar to theirs. So it's sometimes helpful to talk to somebody who maybe is a more of an advisor role or a resource role. So for me as a pre-vet advisor, um, I I didn't go to veterinary school, so I'm able to help students understand as much of the field as possible. Same thing with Caitlin. Caitlin didn't go to veterinary school either. She really understands the career field. Uh, so she can talk to you about all of your different options. So keep that in mind if you are speaking with somebody and maybe they're pushing you towards a specific field. Potentially it's because that's the field they're most comfortable with and that's what they know the most, which can be very helpful to give you the inside look at that perspective. But just know that there are a lot of other perspectives out there. Yes, and I would even say even if you're considering maybe not following in the footsteps of a mentor, that can be a tricky conversation to have. So even talking with your career person about how to approach that conversation or what your thoughts are regarding that discussion. Yeah, your mentor or parents. I do have a lot of students come in and they tell me that their parents want them to go in this direction and they know that is not the direction for them. And so I am there uh, to help them navigate that conversation and at the end of the day it's important that students do what is best for them and if if you know yourself and you know the right path for you to have that difficult conversation with parents and mentors and then you know you'll be able to sleep at night because you know that you went on the right path for yourself. Caitlin what are some of the biggest faux pas pause like dogs and cats. Uh, What are some of the biggest faux pas that students make when it comes to thinking about careers and what are some solutions to those mistakes? Yes. So some of the biggest things that I see um, are students that have decided really early on a career path and don't question it. Mm. And so 
we'll have students that have always thought they were going to do equine medicine or always thought they were going to do small animal practice. They were going to go back home and work for their uncle's practice. And then something happens or they change and change their minds and they don't want to do that anymore. And they haven't really explored other options. So I'd say that's one of the main things that I see, which isn't isn't a career ending option. It just requires more work in a faster time period. Um, so that's one of the main things I see. One of the other big issues that comes up during vet school is the the time management and trying to do everything. So a lot of our pre-vet students and our vet students are incredibly accomplished. They've done so much with their time and some of them not so much time because they get into vet school very early. Um, that they come to vet school and they want to have that same approach to vet school and experiences involved with vet school. Um, And then now we have to start looking at what is my return on this investment in this activity? So if I choose to do shelter medicine certificate, what kind of return, what kind of experiences, what kind of skills am I getting and how is that going to help me in my goals in the future? Because you start getting all of these opportunities that are competing with each other and it can really wear on your wellness and your well-being, and then we have to make some decisions there. Both of the examples Caitlin brought up made me think of some topics you could talk about in your interview. So when we have an interview, we might ask a student, where do you see yourself in five years? Where do you see yourself in 10 years? What career path do you want in veterinary medicine? It's actually one of the questions you have to answer on the VEMCAS application. Having a student who is open-minded to other options is something we are looking for. It is great to have researched career paths and know what you think you want to do. Um, So it's 100% okay to say that, but we'd love to also hear that you understand that there are other options in the field. So that's something you could use in your interview. Uh, The second thing Caitlin mentioned about return on investments and time management is something that will come up in your interview as well. And that boils down to how do you handle stress? How have you balanced your time? Do you understand you can't do the same things you did in undergrad in vet school? That would be a red flag to the admissions committee to have an undergrad student or a non-traditional student who's applying to vet school um, claim that they plan on doing all of the same activities in the same way that they did in undergrad in, in vet school. It's just not realistic. So having a realistic understanding of not only your career options in vet school, but what vet school is going to look like is very important for pre-vet students to understand. I am office mates with Caitlin. I'm across the hall from her. And I will say that I think every single day I hear an employer call wanting to post a job for our new graduates. So the job outlook and the job market definitely right now looks bright for Gator graduates and veterinarians in general. Um, people do want you and they want you to come work at their practice. So it's a great time to be a veterinarian. Caitlin, Mm -hmm. what is the coolest job you've seen a, uh, new DVM get? Wow. There are so many cool jobs. And I think what's most exciting about my role is that I can get excited for each student that gets their dream job. Mm -hmm. Caitlin, what resources do you have for our students? So for pre-veterinary students, there are some great websites that are helpful to start exploring careers. The AVMA, the American Veterinary Medical Association, has some great career exploration resources in their career center on their website. There is also the Bureau of Labor Statistics with the government. Oh, yeah, I like that website. That one's good. Yeah, they have some great information on the job outlook for veterinarians and different types of things that veterinarians do. The AVMA also has some great webinars on different career paths in veterinary medicine, so you can listen to those. The other more interesting thing that I always send pre-vet students to is look at some job descriptions for veterinarians that you want to do. So what is your dream job? And then see what kind of requirements that has. So how many years of experience? How many years of training? Do you need an internship or a residency? Um, Can you do it right out of vet school? And if you look at even Indeed.com or the AVMA has a job board, you can see what those requirements are so you can start preparing yourself and have a good idea of where you want to go. So just like getting into vet schools have different prereqs and requirements, the same thing will happen when it comes to your career. So if you're looking at multiple vet schools and you know you need to take cell bio and microbio and anatomy and physiology, 
when you want your career, you might have needed to do an internship and a residency and, you know, pass your board exams. So there's a lot of things to think about. Um, please don't feel overwhelmed. You have plenty of time to look into it. But those resources that Caitlin gave you can definitely help start to help funnel um, your career options and what you want to do in the future. Well, Caitlin, thank you so much for being here today. I'm sure that um, we need to get you back to the office to answer those calls about <laughs> veterinary offices wanting to hire our graduates. Students, your homework is to look into your career options post DVM. Um, what does the job market look like for the job you're interested in? And can you incorporate your passion into a realistic uh, part of your profession? I'm Alex Avellino, and we'll talk to you soon. Welcome to the Pre-Vet Pausecast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Welcome back to the Pre-Vet Pausecast. I'm Alex Avellino, and today our guest is Dr. Graham. He is the Dermatology Service Chief and Clinical Associate Professor of Dermatology at UF. Dr. Graham, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. We would love to hear about dermatology. And, and for those of you who don't know, dermatology deals with the skin. Does it deal with anything else? It deals mostly with skin and allergies. So yes. sometimes we see them with respiratory problems associated with it, occasionally GI problems as well. Okay. Oh, yeah. So like maybe, for example, for humans, would it be um, uh, like lactose intolerance for humans? Yes. And what's really cool about use of the word intolerance, it's not an allergy, but it's still an intolerance. Right. And that just implies that mechanism is different. So the treatment is different. Okay, perfect. I'm so excited to talk about it. I, <laughs> I completely skipped going into Dr. Graham path. So before we get into what dermatology is and how you and what you do, you know, on a daily basis, can you tell us how you became a DVM? What did your path look like? So my path is uh, perhaps unusual or, or, or not. Uh, we lived in the country in Alabama and I was doing reasonably well in school and took uh, our pets to the vet once a year. And uh, the vet was uh, just a super vet, interactive, nice, helpful, compassionate. I'm like, hmm, that sounds like, you know, that'd be a fun thing to be when I, when I grow up. Yeah. Uh, and at that time, the big push was for people with good grades was to be an engineer. Mm. And I thought, well, engineer's fun, but I like also being with people more and I like animals a lot. And I think it's a misnomer sometimes uh, or misspeak when people say, uh, I don't like people, I want to be a veterinarian. I'm, it is totally about the people Yay. and their relationship with their, with their pets. I actually ended up attending four different undergraduate oh, universities to get my, okay. all my pre-vet stuff out, out, yeah. out of the way. And my plan um, was really to become a mixed animal practitioner in the country somewhere because mm -hmm. I liked being outside and, and all of that. And, and somewhere along the line, you know, I was fortunate to, to get into veterinary school and I decided I wanted to do um, small animal. And I, even my last year of vet school, I wasn't totally sure what I wanted to do. And, and it just finally clicked that dermatology was what I wanted. Okay. So then did you do a one-year internship and a three-year residency program? I, I did do, do the typical one-year internship. And at the time, dermatology residencies were only uh, two years. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, both of my mentors left within four months of me starting oh, my residency, shoot. so I, it, it was extended to three years okay. uh, so that I could meet my credentials and, and all of that. Okay, perfect. Um, so, you know, Dr. Graham is the service chief and also a professor, which means he teaches some courses. Um, so what courses do you teach? So we have, uh, at, at the University of Florida, we have an amazing dermatology program. We teach an introduction to dermatology, and then now that we have additional faculty members, we have an elective course in dermatology, and we have a clinical skills part uh, of dermatology, like looking at ears and, and things like that, looking under the microscope. And then we have the clinical rotation in dermatology that has some lectures associated with that, Wow, too. Awesome. So uh, multifaceted interaction with professors and clinicians for the dermatology specialty. Um, you mentioned that you sold your practices mm -hmm. to come over here. So again, students, 
not everybody's path is going to look the same. You might not start working at a veterinary school as a uh, specialist right away. You might take time to work in a practice, own your own practice, and then do more. So there's always a lot that you can do in veterinary medicine. Let's talk about, I mean, I really want to get into kind of like the specifics about Florida specifically. Okay. So what kinds of things would pet owners see for dermatology issues in Florida. Okay. What's special for our state? <laughs> All right. So I, I like to tell this this story. You know, when if you're driving from up north and stop at the Welcome Center in Florida yeah. and you pull over to walk your dog, there's a sign usually that said, beware of poisonous snakes and gators and stuff. Okay. Like yes. Well, from a dermatology perspective, I think it should say, Beware of Florida fleas. Okay, yeah. <laughs> fleas would be are huge for animals in general, yes. but it's is it bad in Florida? Well, we have the ideal environment for fleas to complete their oh, life cycle. Oh, joy. Good. And, and literally, you walk your dog where everybody else walks their dog, and the next thing you know, you can have 100 fleas on your dog, and yeah. they, they start itching. Let's talk about allergies. Okay. So I've come through the clinic before, and I've seen that when they have the skin test. Can you talk about a skin test and what sure. that looks like? So a skin test, and, and sometimes people will go through a similar test. There's uh, two main types of allergy tests. One, you can do via blood testing. And when we do an interdermal skin testing, you typically shave a, a area of the body, and then you inject potential things that cause allergies. Mm-hmm. And if they're allergic, it looks like somebody who's allergic to mosquito bites. You get a big old high yeah. uh, with that. And we test for, I think, 64 different things when we do our injections. Wow. So I encourage everyone to go ahead and Google, you know, um, animal or veterinary uh, dermatology skin test. So you can see what it looks like. You can see the patch of skin that's been shaved. Um, and then you can see all the different marks that the animals would have on their skin. What else do you think that our students need to know about dermatology? What will they learn in school? What are some things that they need to think about? I think uh, perhaps the most important thing for somebody who's interested in small animal veterinary medicine would be that maybe around 30% or more of the patients you see in a day are going to have a dermatologic or ear problem. Mm. So it's an exceptionally important uh, topic to understand and also understand your limitations or your interests. Uh, let, let's say you're a surgeon and you only want to do surgery. Great. As I say, be the best you can be, mm-hmm. uh, but also then know when to let the client seek out it's somebody who really loves picking scabs yes. or finding mites and yeah. things like that. What I like about Dr. Graham is he's a really colorful guy. He often has a fun bow tie on. Right now he's wearing a fun gator kind of plaid shirt and some kind of, what are those socks? Are those dogs? Those are Labrador Retriever dogs. Labrador Retriever socks. So he he um, always is walking through the hospital with a smile on his face, and he has unique experiences in veterinary medicine. Go ahead and talk to us about some of those unique experiences you've had. Well, one of the best things about leaving the practices uh, that, I, that I owned and, and managed was just the new experience of teaching students. But the cool thing that I wasn't expecting, and this is why it's always awesome to be up for a new experience, is the diversity of species that we see here in Florida because exotics are, are so common. Yes. So I have allergy tested literally everything from bats to giraffes. I've, oh, neat. I've cleaned out the ears of everything from guinea pigs to elephants. So the diversity of what yes. you get to do, I guess it, it. I started off, I wanted to be a mixed animal practitioner in the Southeast. and. I, you are. I guess I am. <laughs> I never thought about it that way. Yeah, Thank you, Alex. Of course. <laughs> I, you, so many students want to do exotics and Zoom Ed, and maybe they we, we want to start thinking about potentially going into a specialty and addressing those animals through the specialty. Right, right. And it's funny, just as you, you mentioned that to me, uh, uh, you know, delayed gratification of goals. Yeah. For those who've not met me, I'm, I'm 58 years old, and, and I've been at this job for six years. So it took me, you know... 20 some years to get to my original goal and I had a great journey along the way. Yes. And enjoyed every minute of it and took something out of it and it, it really did make me I think the the veterinary dermatologist veterinarian slash educator mm-hmm. that I am today. Yeah, there's no rush. And Dr. Graham's a great example of that, that even if it takes, you know, a couple decades to get what you think you originally wanted, it was worth it. Totally. What are bats allergic to? The same thing that cats and dogs and people are. Oh, funny. They, they are allergic to mosquitoes and molds and grasses and weeds um, and some of the other biting bugs. Uh, we, we mentioned intolerance, so sometimes animals can have food allergies? Yes. 
What are some common food allergies they might have? So typical intolerance is going to be to the protein in the food, not the grain in the mm. food. In fact, you know, hot topic. I was going to say, <laughs> go ahead, tell us about that. One of the things I say, when, you know, when somebody is on a grain-free diet or a super diet, I ask my students, I said, what does that mean to you? And, and what we've recently learned is that some grain-free diets predispose animals to heart disease. But what it means to me when somebody is on a grain-free diet or some fancy or some raw diet, it means that the clients care about their pet. Okay, yes. And think diet's important. Right. So those are both win-wins. And yes. then my job as a veterinarian is to educate them on both their short-term needs mm -hmm. and their long-term needs. Mm -hmm. So from a selfish dermatology allergy point of view, I'm most interested in what they might be allergic to, beef, chicken, corn, typically a protein yeah. source or, or, or dairy products. Uh, but long-term, they may have some other goal they want with the diet. And then that's where I have to pass the baton, if you will, and say, let me have you get in touch with the nutritionist mm -hmm. who can work with your pet's needs and what you view you want for your pet. Yeah, well, great, really great point. So um, for those of you who haven't really been, you know, keeping up with nutrition or things on the news, um, grain-free and raw diets are super popular right now with a lot of folks who own pets. Um, but I know that in the veterinary community, we have another opinion that potentially that's not what's best for the animal. But Dr. Graham's point that if you have a client who is going that extra mile and going to look into dietary needs for their animal in general, that is exciting because they do care. So that's a great perspective to take instead of maybe coming off as cynical or, oh, they don't know what's best for their pet. It's they really care about their pet and let me help educate them on why that might not be what's best. Dr. Graham also serves on our admissions committee. Um, so you will review package, you'll also interview students. What are some things that you're looking for in a potential DVM candidate? Well, obviously you need uh, decent grades, mm -hmm. but I'm one of the people who doesn't believe decent grades means a 4.0. Yes. Especially if that 4.0 comes at the expense of being well-rounded. Mm -hmm. uh, and everybody has their own assessment of things, uh, but I'm, I'm looking for somebody who's been on a journey uh, to become a veterinarian, extra bonuses if you have good grades, perhaps even more bonuses if you've worked for a veterinarian consistently or on and off for four or five years. However, not everybody has the opportunity to work for a veterinarian, depending on where you live, what your transportation yes. op options are. And, and when I was an undergraduate, um, the state of Connecticut made it very hard for uh, people who were less than 18 to, to, to work. Uh, at, a, at a veterinarian's office. Um, so I worked in a research lab, literally just scraping shavings and mouse poop out of, yeah. out of cages. But I, I, now that I'm on admissions, I, I recognize that that gave me experience to other animals yeah. and research and graduate students. And I worked there for three years in undergrad. So it, it shows commitment to the, to, the, to the field or a topic in your field. It does, and especially if a student can articulate that in an essay. So if I have a student who says, I know it's very important to get clinical veterinary experience, however, I wasn't able to for these reasons, whether you either don't have a car, like Dr. Graham said, or you don't have access to a veterinarian, if you write that down and you say, I was still dedicated because I did research or I worked in customer service, right. admissions committee members love to see that. I, yeah, I joke when I... Uh, owned my practices, my favorite employee was one who'd been a waitress or waiter yes. for a number of years because you have people skills, yep. you, you can juggle multiple things at different times, you Definitely. can prioritize, mm -hmm. and you don't mind getting a bit messy or dirty at times. Yeah. <laughs> it's just part of, the, part of the job. And you can deal with stress because people are probably the most angry when they're hungry. So right. if you have someone who's worked in food service, it's helpful. Um, sometimes students have to have a higher paying job to put themselves right. through school. I totally understand that when I look at an admissions package and go, and you just write that in your essay. Mm -hmm. You know, I was in a situation where I needed to earn money, also recognizing I needed animal experience. So I volunteered right. at these different times. Exactly. So that what Dr. Graham said just now is basically kind of summing up a holistic look at an application where somebody takes a look and they can understand where that person is coming from, um, they're not just looking at one thing like veterinary experience. They're looking at the whole package and why your hours look the way they do. 
So Dr. Graham, I think you have some good news for some of our pre-vet students who might be afraid of some of the grades that they've gotten in the past. Can you speak to that? <laughs> it, it is it is funny to, to think of that. Uh, uh, I guess I, I'm i not proud, but also I, I'm proud to say coming from my, my background, um, my freshman year of undergraduate, I, I was the, the proud owner of two of the lowest grades in two of my classes. Oh, no. Uh, and granted, I came from a, a diverse background and was able to bounce back from that, learn new study skills and, and all of that. Uh, uh, it was a steep learning curve yeah. uh, for me. I was taking that calculus course that I'd never heard what calculus was. Mm -hmm. um, and now that I'm on admissions, I see that we really put a lot of emphasis in the last 45 yes. hours. So. I think all our admissions people are interested in the journey that got there, and we'd like to see a recent track record of success that, that shows you're mature and you can do this. Your past history, I, I actually, if you have a bump in the road, I'm, I go, that's great. That means you're resilient yep. because life is going to throw you curveballs. Veterinary medicine is going to throw you curveballs. So let's let's tell me about it and how you picked up for it. It's a good learning experience. Yes, I 100% agree. I like when some students have had a little bit of a checkered past, whether it's on their transcript or if they've had some even mental health and wellness issues or family issues. You know, those things happen to all of us. And if you are able to move forward, like Dr. Graham said, it, it can be a steep learning curve and it can be a little bit tricky, but if you can overcome that, that's exactly what we do want to see. So please don't be afraid if you have had some grades, especially in your freshman year of college, as long as you can move forward in those last 45 credit hours, you know, that can actually benefit you um, when you chat with an admissions committee member. So Dr. Graham, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you. I've loved learning a little bit more about dermatology, but more importantly, I, I've appreciated your perspective about um, you know, approaching clients, ap approaching a path to vet med, and students not only is your homework to go ahead and Google skin tests, um, but just keep in mind that you will have plenty of time to decide what you want to do and how you want to do it as long as you are being the best you. I'm Alex Avellino, and we'll talk to you soon. Welcome to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Welcome back to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, and today we have two clinical assistant professors of clinical pathology, Dr. Mary Lessinger and Dr. Sarah Beatty. Welcome, ladies. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much, Alex. Well, I'm so glad you're here because we've had quite a few veterinarians um, come to the show, and they've talked about, you know, hands-on, working with animals and all that, but I believe pathology is a little bit different. Is that right? Correct. Good. So um, before we get into what pathology is, I know that there's a lot of different kinds and things you can do, but why don't we hear about your path to where we are today? So when I started my path into veterinary medicine, I thought that I was going to be a general practitioner, um, both small and large animal medicine, because that was the environment that I was exposed to. Coming to veterinary school, I really still enjoyed all species. And as veterinary medicine progresses, um, people are becoming more specialized and the true mixed animal practitioner is becoming less uh, common. So in order to kind of maintain my species diversity and exposure to all animals, I found the field of pathology actually my final year of veterinary school. So it wasn't till very late that I decided that I wanted to be a pathologist. And after being exposed to pathology, I decided at that point to pursue a residency in clinical pathology and then eventually become a clinical pathologist. Perfect. Yeah, my path was a, a little bit different. You know, Sarah had um, a lot of interest in small animal, large animal, and one thing she didn't touch on was zoo and exotic. I mean, she really likes it all. She's had birds growing up and everything. And before I came to vet school, most of my experience was in wildlife, zoo settings, things like that. And so I really thought that I was going to be more on maybe the conservation front or zoo, exotic, wildlife medicine. And I didn't even honestly know my profession existed until my second year of vet school. Mm -hmm. So it's not something that I think is really out there a lot in terms of uh, marketing and the specialties in veterinary medicine have just grown in leaps and bounds probably within the last 20 years or so. So it wasn't even something that was on my radar. 
And after second year, getting exposed to thinking about why disease happens and diagnosing for me was the most fun part of the puzzle. And so that was the part that I wanted to focus on for the rest of my career and realized that while I liked everything, that was the part that probably on a day-to-day basis was going to make me happiest pursuing. I think it's um, great that we have veterinarians come on and almost every single person has said, this is where I thought I was going to end up and this is where I actually am. And it's great for students to hear that, number one, you don't have to be stressed about what am I going to do because you're going to be exposed to so much in vet school, but that it's okay to change your mind. So I'm so glad to hear that both of you kind of did that. Okay, so let's get a basic definition of what is pathology. So pathology is the study of disease, right? So physiology is the way our bodies work in health, and pathology is the disease processes that animals may succumb to, understanding those better. So understanding the the markers of disease, what disease looks like, and getting to that diagnosis. So then other doctors who work more on a treatment spectrum can go from there. Okay, this is what we're dealing with. Now how are we going to treat, manage, or move on from knowing the diagnosis? Okay, so the study of disease. Now are you, when do you see the disease? Is it, are you seeing that animal in front of you or are you seeing slides? What are you seeing? So oftentimes the primary care veterinarian is doing the physical exam and then at that point they decide that they might need some more testing. And so the testing part is usually, the diagnostic testing is usually where the pathologist will come in. And so there's two different types of pathology. Um, There's clinical pathology, which oftentimes deals with blood, tissues, urine, um, a lot of the live animal components. It's oftentimes things like your complete blood count, your serum biochemistry, your urinalysis endocrinology, and then cytology are what is involved with clinical pathology. Anatomic pathology deals with typically more just slides, and it can be both live animal and animals after they've passed away. So they can take uh, tissue samples, what are, which are called biopsies, put those onto a glass slide, make the diagnosis of you know something infectious or cancer. And then the same thing with after the animal passes away, they can perform something called a necropsy, which is the analog of an autopsy, where they look at the entire body for signs of disease, and then from there they will put those tissues onto a glass slide to help kind of determine what happened with the animal. I think sometimes students might think pathologist sounds like their typical thought of a scientist, maybe like behind a microscope or in our lab, and they might think, oh, I love to do that because I don't really want to work with people. So can you speak to that aspect? Yeah, so um, we still have clients and still work with people on a daily basis. Our client population is just a little bit different. Our client population is actually the veterinarians. Those are the people that oh, we serve. Oh, interesting, yeah. So even though we're not working with the owners and the patients, the veterinarians are the population that we're going to be interacting with. So oftentimes when we're reviewing our pathology samples, we are writing reports about the things that we're seeing. And so you should have really excellent both written and mm. verbal communication skills to make sure that what you're seeing as a pathologist is accurately communicated to your client who is the veterinarian. Right, yeah. I can imagine as a veterinarian I'd be super frustrated if someone couldn't articulate to me what is going on with my patient. So a pathologist needs to be able to explain in probably different ways um, what's going on so the veterinarian can understand and then treat the patient and then explain that to the owner. Does this mean that you guys, that pathologists are not working with animals on a daily basis? So in our particular role, it depends on where you're working. If you're in one of the laboratories where you may be receiving samples, perhaps from the national or international community, it may be less likely that you're going to be seeing animals on a daily basis. In our role, it would be easy for us also not to see animals on a daily basis. However, because the hospital is connected to our laboratory and we think that there is a lot of utility in our resident training and in our knowledge and in communication and talking to the clinicians and and potentially seeing the patients depending on what they're describing to us as the disease process, we may walk down to oncology or walk down to zoo medicine or to one of the other specialties, talk about the case face-to-face. And I think you get a better idea of what maybe your client needs are and where there may be gaps in communication or maybe able to offer some additional information when you have those connections. So that's one of the perks, I think, that we both find for working in the university setting. Wonderful. So you still do have an opportunity to see the animals. Yes. So, both of you are professors. 
which means that you are teaching students. Talk about the academia side of the veterinary field. So students are exposed to pathology all years of the veterinary curriculum. And so first year is oftentimes focused towards the physiology and understanding the basics. So one of the things that we teach the students about first year is hematology and bone marrow. So the bone marrow is where all of the blood cells are produced, and then they go into the bloodstream. And so then we talk about the blood cells once they enter the bloodstream, just kind of their normal functions. Second year, we move to the large clinical pathology course, which will still continue to cover all of the blood cells, but then we also talk about the blood chemistries. And so blood chemistries are where we look at various organ systems um, for markers of disease and evidence of dysfunction. And then third and fourth year, oftentimes we'll get into the more specialty courses. Um, so things like cytology, where we put a few cells onto a glass slide and look to see what kind of disease process is happening. So there is a lot of pathology that is kind of interwoven throughout the entire veterinary curriculum, both within the pathology courses and then outside of the pathology courses. I'm hearing more and more DVM students get excited about pathology. More of them want to become pathologists. Um, the pathology club seems to be very popular, and I want to know why do we think they love it so much? I think it's a lot of fun, <laughs> obviously, or I wouldn't have chosen to do it every day for the rest of my life because you really shouldn't choose something that you don't think is fun yeah. uh, and interesting and is going to keep you growing. I think we have a lot of, you know, Dr. Beatty's an amazing teacher. We have members of our anatomic pathology team that are amazing teachers. And I think that if people communicate their passion, that interests other yes. people as well. Yes. And it's it's something about putting the puzzle together, looking through the microscope, taking, I always like the idea that as the world becomes more and more technologically advanced and we have artificial intelligence hitting the scene and we have uh, more fancy laboratory tests, I'm using a piece of equipment from say the 1700s yeah. or so, the microscope, and I have a few cells and I can look at something that really is looks like an impressionistic painting mm -hmm. under the microscope. And then I can use the algorithms I've learned and what I know of disease and the patterns I was taught during residency to say, I really think this patient has X, Y, Z. And we don't have to wait. We can do that the same day. So there are owners there that are really concerned. Does my pet have cancer? Does my pet have kidney failure? Does my pet have this? And there's a doctor that's waiting to treat. And with clinical pathology, we're often giving an answer same day. Yes. And I think that's really exciting for students to harness how to use the, the tools and the database that they learn in clinical pathology to build confidence as a doctor and know where to go next. Mm -hmm. So I think they like that process. I think what would excite me the most if I was a vet student, I'm, I tend to be a little impatient. So the fact that I would be able to look under the microscope, know, take what I've learned and apply it immediately to be able to say, this is what's going on would be great for my kind of personality because the idea of like a long term, what's happening, having to really dig deep while exciting for some folks is not necessarily my favorite thing. So I think that's awesome that, you know, you can come up with that, that reason that same day. So that's great. What kinds of diseases do we typically see as pathologists? And what diseases really excite us when we're like, oh, I haven't seen this in a while? So um, being in the Southeast, we really have kind of the full gamut of diseases. Mm -hmm. So we see a lot of infectious diseases that are quite atypical maybe for the rest of the country. We also see a lot of cancer. We yeah. also see a lot of normal tissue. So we really do see kind of the range of things and, you know, when I'm looking at samples and I see inflammation, oftentimes that will key me to look for infectious agents. And so when you finally find that infectious agent that you've been looking for yes. for a really long time, it can be really exciting because you can then help that patient and say, this is what I think this is, and then they can start treatment. Mm -hmm. The same thing with when I'm making cancer diagnoses. Oftentimes those cells exhibit lots of atypical features. They're not normal. They're mm -hmm. cancer. They're mm -hmm. neoplastic cells. And so a lot of those neoplastic cells can be really beautiful under the microscope, which is unfortunate for our patients. But oftentimes when I'm in the pathology readout room and I'm you know, getting really excited about something, oftentimes it's not the best thing for our right. patient because under the microscope I'm seeing something that's probably not good. When you say beautiful, can you describe what, what does it look like? <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, so let's just take an example of like lymphoma. So lymphoma is a uh, cancer of the lymphocytes in the body. And the cells, when you look at them under the microscope, are round um, like little balls and they have a nucleus inside the cell. Sometimes with lymphoma, they can have little uh, fine dots inside of them or granules that are pink. Mm. Um, sometimes they will have really dark blue cytoplasm, which is the part of the cell around the nucleus. So it's it's kind of really pretty. And one of, one of my favorite cells actually is the horse eosinophil. And so when I'm looking at horse blood, the eosinophils are one of the white blood cells that have very large red granules. And they you basically can see them from space. They're absolutely beautiful, beautiful cells. So really, really big red granules in the cells. And it might sound different for us to hear that these cancerous cells or these cells that can be infectious and you know, are so beautiful, but also it's beautiful because if you identify them, it's like, oh good, now we can know how to treat it. Yeah, we're, I always tell our residents that we're very lucky to, I always say that we have some of the best clients uh, because our clients are other veterinarians. And so we have a luxury, honestly, of the fact that if I talk to an oncologist, they're very happy to get a cancer diagnosis because that means they can treat that patient and at least they can give that owner an endpoint of, we know what we're dealing with and here's where we go from here. Sure. Whereas our colleagues on the front lines in clinical medicine, there can be a lot of compassion and emotion fatigue that goes along with that. So mm -hmm. we're very cognizant of the pressures that our colleagues are under and we we want to provide them, you know, the best information. So we're, we're lucky in that respect that oncologists and, and other specialists understand when we have something that's a, a weighty diagnosis, um, they can at least share in the satisfaction of getting a diagnosis, Sure, yes. regardless of what that may be. Having an answer, even if it's a bad answer, is better than no answer at all, I would think, a lot of times. It's, it definitely can be. Good. Um, Dr. Lessinger, do you want to tell us what your favorite kind of cells are to see under a microscope? My favorite cell is a cell called the Mott cell. And so it's, and Dr. Beatty shaking her head to say, <laughs> yes, this is a, this is also a beautiful cell. So she agrees that second to the horse eosinophil, I think. And probably for a very similar reason, they're striking in terms of their color palette. So we have our lymphocytes that some of those, as we know, will go on in the B cell lineage to produce antibodies for us, right? Mm -hmm. That are going to fight off viral infection or whatever else we have going on. And you can actually see those antibodies within the cell. They crystallize and they form different shapes. Sometimes it's linear, sometimes it's large globules within the cell that are a pale a pale blue color mm. and then the nucleus is a very dark blue and sometimes we see flaming plasma cells where there's a pink fringe along the edge of the cell so if you like purple blue and pink uh, it's a, if you're into that color palette it's a very <laughs> good career choice for you <laughs> Yeah. So we see some really, really gorgeous stuff. You could take snapshots and send it to people. I know artists and sometimes I'll send them some pictures and they find it inspiring, yeah. you know, to see the way biology and art can intersect. Can you spell the horse cell and the mott cell just so folks at home can Google it at some point? Absolutely. Uh, eosinophil is E-O-S-I-N-O. P-H-I-L. I'm glad I didn't try that one. And the, is I'm guessing two T's on the MOT. Yeah, and the MOT cell is a capital M-O-T-T -T, and then just cell, a MOT cell. Okay, so that's our homework today, listeners, to go and Google both of those types of cells so you can see how gorgeous they are. And if you're inspired, maybe it's time to start thinking about clinical pathology. What have we not talked about that you think it's important for our listeners to hear about your journey, veterinary medicine, pathology? What do they need to know to take away today? I think I just have maybe a general soapbox comment, which is I love that you're doing these podcasts. Uh, thank you for doing that. I think it's really important for people who have an interest in the field to maybe realize all the areas and nooks and crannies of veterinary medicine and what their life could be. And as a caveat to that, to also maybe leave some spaciousness in their lives. I often meet students that maybe they're my advisees in the first or second year of curriculum. They already tell me, and I know Sarah's nodding her head, I want to be an ophthalmologist. I want to be a surgeon. I want to be this. I want to be that. And it's great to have an idea of maybe going into one of those fields. But I think what makes you a great veterinarian of any kind, whether that's a specialist or a general practitioner, is being interested in everything and trying different things. Mm -hmm. And like you said, being willing to change your mind about something. You know, maybe you'll go into this field, but even if you spend X number of hours 
investing in pathology and it doesn't end up being what you want to do, that's still going to be applicable to being a surgeon, to being a general practitioner, whatever else you want to do. So just for anyone thinking about the field, just get interested and get involved and let your passions kind of take you where they, they will. Sometimes I feel like a mom telling my pre-vet students, you know, be open, be open. And it's always good to hear veterinarians actually come in and say, no, you do need to be open. So I'm always glad to hear that. I think that's one of the beautiful things about veterinary medicine is that you really can do anything that you want. So you can go through school and really decide, you know, I think I'm going to start out as a small animal general practitioner. And then one day you decide, you know what, I want to be a specialist and go to a residency program and be a specialist. Or, you know, if you're large animal and then you switch to small animal and vice versa, the paths are really endless as far as veterinary medicine goes. And it's a wonderful degree because of the flexibility that it offers. Yes. You know, Once you get those letters, DVM, you have so many opportunities and opportunities are always wonderful to have. Well, I want to thank, um, you know, both of our guests today for being here and telling us about the beautiful and dynamic field of clinical pathology. Remember, your homework is to Google both of those types of cells, favorite, and maybe find one that you are interested that we haven't mentioned today. I'm Alex Avellino, and we'll talk to you soon. Welcome to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Welcome back to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, and today we have Dr. Lindsay Hockman, who is a clinical lecturer of integrative medicine at the UF Small Animal Hospital. Hello, Dr. Hockman. Hi, Alex. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. So today we're going to talk about integrative medicine. We're going to talk about what that even means for some folks at home who maybe have never heard about it. Um, But before we go into that, can you tell us about your path to vet med? What was college like? What was your major Where did you do your internship and residency, all of that? Yeah, so I actually have been in Gainesville, Florida for, I think, 12 years now, which is insane. Go Gators! Yeah, so Gator all the way. I went to undergrad UF. Um, I majored in animal sciences and got a minor in business administration. Um, Following that, I got into UF vet school. Um, So I did that for four years, actually concurrently with a master's in public health with the College of Public Health and Health Professions. Okay. So that was kind of a cool situation where I was able to do my DVM and my MPH degree in those four years. Um, And then after that, I got accepted for the integrative medicine specialty internship at UF. Uh, Following that one-year internship, they actually accepted me as a faculty member concurrently with a non-traditional canine sports medicine and rehabilitation residency, for which I actually just finished those requirements and will sit for boards coming up here in February 2020. Okay, so let's backtrack a little bit because you, I think, are on a different track than a lot of folks. Yeah, it was kind of a unique one. Yes. So potentially this, is this something that students should seek this exact path or just know that there are a lot of little different ways that they can do their education differently? Yeah. I mean, I think it just really highlights there's a lot of means to a similar end. So when I was in undergrad, I wasn't actually even sure pretty much till my last year of undergrad that vet school was going to be my track. So as a lot of pre-vet students are probably familiar with, the prerequisites to get into vet school or medical school are actually quite similar. Mm -hmm. So if you're just interested in medicine in general and aren't sure if you're more on an animal versus human track, I mean, undergrad's going to look very similar. And it really doesn't even matter that much what you major in as long as you get those prerequisites together. Right. So, I mean, sometimes even admissions committees really like that you have some diversity to your undergraduate degree because it just means that you're more flexible when you get into vet school and have a more broader knowledge base. So it really doesn't matter what you major in. I did end up majoring in animal sciences because that was more interesting to me, but I actually applied to med school 
school and vet school at the same time. Oh, really? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm sure pre-vet students know it's kind of a huge pain in the butt to get into vet school because there aren't a ton of them yes. versus medical school. It's very difficult to get in, but there are so many more medical schools. So mm -hmm. when you have all the same prerequisites, um, minus, I guess you have to take the MCAT too in order to apply to medical right. school. Uh, it looks super similar. Um, so if I didn't get into veterinary school, I was preserving myself the option if I was still interested in medicine and maybe didn't want to take a gap year, which might not work for everyone, mm -hmm. I could potentially pursue going to medical school. But I got into veterinary school and that was my preference. So yes. I ended up going that way. Yes. Um, so that was smart of Dr. Hockman to keep her options open because she did understand how competitive vet school is. Um, so that's great. And she's right. A lot of the prereqs are very similar. Um, if you do decide to apply to vet school and med school and you have an interview for vet school or med school, potentially you might not let yeah. them know that you're no, applying to both. It wasn't broadly yeah. uh, discussed. You wouldn't share that, but it's still smart to keep your options open. Yeah. I mean, I knew medicine was going to be my future mm -hmm. in some capacity. Um, and I was just trying to brainstorm what I might do if I wanted to get into vet school and understandably didn't get in on yes. the first try, as is not uncommon, uh, what I yeah. might do. So whether that would be get a job at uh, a private practice in vet med with a general practitioner and get more experience mm -hmm. or potentially jump into a different but similar allied specialty. So I was just kind of keeping those options open. But yeah, you're totally right. <laughs> Probably don't go into your vet school interview and be like, it's cool if I don't get right. in because I've got these backups. Yeah. Yes, they, they probably wouldn't love that. No. Okay, so now you have not sat for boards yet. Correct. But so when that's you... the other kind of weird part about my path. Um, so my boards exam, so the path within veterinary medicine can be pretty different depending on what your end goal is. So I concurrently got my master's in public health with my DVM degree because I was more interested in epidemiology, research, and conservation medicine. That isn't exactly where I ended up in terms of specialty now. It's obviously all of these degrees end up being applicable in the allied health professions field. So I'm just using it a little differently than I initially planned. Um, but a lot of my experience actually leading into vet school was in a zoo. So I was mm. more interested in kind of herd health and that sort of thing. So that was kind of the impetus to getting the MPH degree at okay. the time. Um, but it br gave me a really broad statistical background that's really helped me in a lot of my research endeavors now. So um, in vet school, I kind of developed a further interest in integrative medicine. And we'll talk more about like what that actually yeah. is. Um, and ended up honing my focus there. Um, but following my veterinary school years, that's when I did the internship. So if you do want to specialize in something in vet med, it is very common that you'll have to do these additional years after your four years of veterinary school. So that's where it more mimics like a medical school mm -hmm. curriculum in the sense that you'll do your four kind of didactic years with a teaching hospital year within that. But then following that, that's where you go into the match, match into an internship, and then potentially a residency residency after. And the goal of these internships and residencies after veterinary school is largely to end up in a specialization like cardiology, or in this case, uh, canine sports med and rehab. <laughs> Very specific. But so your internship was not a rotating small animal internship. Correct. So that's usually what people will do after your four years of vet school is they'll say, okay, I'm either interested in potentially large animal or small animal. Mm -hmm. And if you're interested in small animal and are seeking a residency in a small animal specialty, usually you'll do a rotating small animal internship, which is basically as a doctor at this point doing a very similar thing that you did during your clinical year in vet school, uh, but obviously with a lot more primary case responsibility, um, but still having a lot of mentorship ideally at a lot of these academic or private institutions. So you'd rotate through like internal medicine, general surgery, those sorts of things. My specialty internship, I was very lucky to get kind of directly out of vet school, mostly because I kind of had uh, a relationship with the service already. I did a lot of research with them mm -hmm. while I was still a vet student, so they felt comfortable kind of taking me without doing the rotating internship, okay. which is kind of the more traditional path. 
Um, so jumping straight into the specialty internship, the majority of my time was focused on this specialty of integrative medicine, but I did have the opportunity to fortunately rotate through uh, neurology, radiology, orthopedic surgery, a lot of the things that are really helpful out rotations to kind of help support that service too. So let's dive into what integrative medicine is. What is a simple definition of integrative medicine? Yeah, it's a really good question. Uh, So integrative medicine, at least at our UF Small Animal Hospital, it's comprised of a lot of different kind of facets of medicine that maybe don't fit amazingly in other services. So ours is comprised of nutrition, which two of the faculty members on our service are board certified in animal nutrition as well. I am not. Um, They also do, um, we do canine sports med and rehab. So we see either working dogs, agility dogs, as well as companion animals that might be getting older and having mobility issues and doing rehabilitation therapy for those guys. Okay. Uh, And you will be boarded in that. Correct. Okay. Uh, We also do hyperbaric medicine or hyperbaric oxygen therapy, um, acupuncture, and then some traditional Chinese medicine, too, as kind of a complementary approach to a lot of our animals that need continued care, whether it be palliative care because they might have cancer or some other terminal condition, or kind of in addition to their mobility management as well. Okay. So to me, what it sounds like is integrative medicine uses multiple techniques to you know, help these animals either have longer life, have a better life, yeah. uh, maybe rehab if they've had an injury. Um, so with those techniques, I mean, what do you like, what do you think about it? Do you think that, do you have a favorite one? Do you have one that you're like, I have seen this one work so many times. I'm so yeah. glad I get to learn about this. You know, what kind of students, sh- what should they be thinking about when they think about integrated medicine and these techniques? So I guess the best way of describing it is we're using complementary and alternative strategies in addition to conventional medicine to maximize these animals' quality of life. Mm -hmm. So this is actually a common thing that's up and coming on the human medicine side as well. There is an integrative medicine department at Shands here at UF Mm -hmm. too. Um, So I can't say I necessarily have a favorite kind of aspect of integrative medicine. Probably the thing I like the most about it is it affords me a lot of flexibility with all of these different kind of subspecializations almost to look at the animal as a whole Mm -hmm. and really make sure I'm not missing anything that maybe traditional Chinese medicine couldn't totally address alone or conventional medicine couldn't totally address alone. So I have the ability to be flexible and use a lot of different perspectives to treat the entirety of that patient. Okay, so um, now, Dr. Hockman, you guys have a pool yeah, in the integrative medicine That's everyone's room. favorite. Yes. Um, so I always tell, we take tours around the hospital, yeah. and I tell students, you know, make sure you take a peek in this room because you're going to see this pool, and potentially you'll see an animal in it. Mm-hmm. Um, so you guys have a lot of neat toys, I would say, in there. Yeah. Um, what are the pros of having a pool in your Room. In our treatment yeah. space, besides it just being fun for yeah. tourists to see. Yeah. And um, so we're we're really lucky to have a lot of different modalities that we can treat a lot of these patients with from a rehabilitation perspective. And hydrotherapy is one of the really big ones. So we have the pool as well as a couple of underwater treadmills. Um, and it's probably not too dissimilar from what you might think on the human medicine side, where obviously it's a lot easier for people to exercise in a pool when they have some sort of a mobility deficit. So so it works really well for animals from that perspective, too. And especially if you have an animal that likes swimming, yes. we can kind of combine the fun with the exercise. Yeah. How do cats do in the pool? Um, I can't say. I, well, maybe I've had one cat in the pool as long as I've been there. And um, it takes a special type of feline yes. to enjoy hydrotherapy, but it's not totally impossible. I mean, we do have a cat actually coming regularly now for underwater treadmill therapy, okay. actually for weight loss because she's quite overweight. Oops. So that's a kind of nice way to have a low impact exercise on the joints of your patient mm-hmm. while kind of maximizing range, range of motion of all of these joints and facilitating weight loss. So, um, I mean, as long as you take everything slow, maybe sure. have some good bribery in the form of tuna fish or something like that uh we try and take into account like behaviorally how 
able are we to kind of facilitate these exercises, mm -hmm. but cats are totally not exempt by any means from integrative medicine or rehab. Just yeah. sometimes the water might not be their favorite. favorite. So in the case of this cat or in any animal that is maybe using the underwater treadmill, potentially, yeah. are they also, because the cat's overweight, are we looking at the nutrition for that cat and using the treadmill? And could we potentially be doing acupuncture for the cat's joints? Could we be doing all of that with one patient? Yeah. So I think you kind of just like hit the nail on the head. That's really a lot of what our treatment plans look like in integrative medicine, because we're kind of combining a lot of conventional and complementary approaches to achieve this common client and veterinary goal for mm -hmm. this cat so it's we want the cat to be more comfortable walking it probably has some degree of arthritis because it's been walking on these joints for a while with additional weight and we know that the fat actually can promote arthritis as well mm. um, so really we'd be thinking about the underwater treadmill like we said for the joint range of motion mm -hmm. uh, the exercise the muscle building as well as the cardiovascular training and weight loss uh, the acupuncture potentially from the perspective of alleviating some of this joint pain and then of course this has to be combined with some sort of a nutritional strategy sure. for weight loss yes because i will say it is my favorite room to walk by like i said you do see the pool but you can also walk by anytime and see um, cones with PVC pipe attached to them and see animals <laughs> jumping over like a tiny agility course or you can see like a pug with um, goggles on because they're yeah. getting what's going on with the goggles what the is that goggles it's actually really cute they're called doggles. doggles I guess you can't call them that if it's on a cat but Coggles. Um, that's the, not the same no it's no. not as cute mm -mm. <laughs> so we put these goggles on the dogs as well as the people have protective eyewear if we're doing laser therapy so okay. laser therapy can be used for a variety of conditions but very very commonly you'll see us using it on arthritic joints to kind of reduce pain and inflammation locally within these joints. So it kind of ends up being an adjunctive treatment strategy in addition to maybe other things that we're doing to help promote healing or reduce pain. So the laser light is actually dangerous. The scatter of the electromagnetic radiation can damage their retina. So mm. we try and make sure we're protecting the animal's eyes as well as the treatment practitioner's eyes as well. Okay, so and for, it looks cute. It looks so cute. Right. Everybody right now you know if you're listening just quickly google doggles so you can see what this looks like it is truly a joy to walk by and see these animals wearing those dr hockman i think we could talk about integrated medicine all day because yeah, there's probably. so much about it it's, it is so interesting um but if you could sum up for students listening at home what kind of student do you think would really benefit from exploring integrative medicine who who is that personality who would love this that's a really good question i think I'm going to use myself as an example here because, like I said, I mean, I came into veterinary school probably most interested in conservation medicine, herd health, uh, maybe even working at a zoo or focusing on wildlife one day. And it really wasn't until I got into my clinical year of veterinary school had the ability to take the integrative medicine rotation as an elective, mm -hmm. which I was kind of just randomly paired with. It wasn't something oh. I sought out. And in those two weeks, I saw so many things that were really inspiring that I think it just completely rerouted what I was imagining my career to look like. Yeah. Um, so really what I'd encourage any student, whether they're pre-veterinary or in their veterinary curriculum, yes. is really just making sure as you move through these years, especially your clinical years, keep an open mind with every rotation you go on because you might find something that you actually didn't even know existed. And we're probably moving in the veterinary curriculum here soon throughout all the vet schools to make integrative medicine and actually a mandatory requirement mm -hmm. for a lot of students because even if it's something you're not interested in practicing yourself for the rest of your life, far and away, a lot of our client base is increasingly interested in right. this. So it's really something we want to make sure all of the veterinary students have some exposure to and be able to answer some of these client questions from kind of an evidence-based perspective. Mm -hmm. So I think almost anyone can really benefit from taking the rotation, even if it's not something you want to do for the rest of your life. It's really just something to have a good knowledge base on. Absolutely. Being able to meet the needs of your future clients, whether or not you practice that particular specialty or know about that innovative research, um, being able to provide them with some info and forward them to the folks who do is going to be so important. 
Dr. Hockman, thank you so much for being here today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I've loved hearing more about integrative medicine, one of my favorite services in the hospital. Um, and for you students at home, your homework was to Google Doggles. De and definitely Google Doggles. Google Doggles and uh, continue to keep an open mind with your education in veterinary medicine and beyond. I'm Alex Avellino, and we'll talk to you soon. Welcome to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Welcome back to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, and today our guest is Dr. Fox Alvarez, one of our veterinary medical oncology residents. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Today we're going to be talking about oncology, and before we even get into that, um, I want to mention that you might recognize the name Dr. Fox Alvarez, and that's because in our episode about surgery and cardiology, your husband was on our show. Yeah, he was. He was, and he was a wonderful guest, and um, I'm sure you're going to be just as wonderful. Speaking of wonderful, can you tell us about your wonderful path to veterinary medicine? Where did you go to undergrad? Where did you get your DVM? What did it look like for you? So I went to undergrad at the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa, Roll Tide. And um, <laughs> I was I started actually shadowing when I was an undergrad at a veterinarian's office. We had a preceptorship for people that wanted to do veterinary school. I think I was one of maybe eight people mm -hmm. <laughs> that was signed up. And I really enjoyed working with the clinicians. I just was at a general practitioner's office. Um, but most of that, my time in undergrad was spent in a research laboratory, actually. I worked in a lab that uses uh, nematodes as model organisms for Parkinson's disease and other movement disorders. I decided that I wanted to go to veterinary school, and I applied to three places because I knew I wanted to stay in the southeast. I'm, I'm from Tampa, even though I went to school in Alabama. So I got into Florida. I came here. I was very familiar with research and laboratory bench top things, and I was really interested in public health. So I actually did the concurrent DVM MPH program through the University of Florida. And I thankfully, very much thankfully, had the foresight to do a rotating internship after I graduated. Um, I thought that I wanted to go into a less clinical side of veterinary medicine. But I also really didn't want to forget everything that I just shoved in my head. And so I, I, I'm a, more of a, like a learner while doing things person. I will say that um, a lot of times on the show we have clinicians come on who chose their internship to get to the residency. But I've heard of a lot of other veterinarians want to do an internship because they're not quite ready to make a decision about what they want to do after. And so that's also an option. You know, students, if you're getting ready to graduate from vet school and you're uh, unsure about what the next step is, an internship might be a great opportunity to get some more mentorship, to remember everything you just shoved in your head over those four years. So when I did my rotating internship, I, from that, honestly, just learned, I like this and I don't want to give it up. Perfect. I am not ready to not see patients. I am not ready to not talk to clients. And I, I actually want to practice medicine kind of to fill a gap in my decision making I worked emergency medicine for a year um, and I really liked that uh, and so then I still wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do so I decided to do an emergency internship here at the vet school and then also to be back in the hospital to be around different services and decide where I felt like I would fit Okay. So, so far we have undergrad, DVM, small animal rotating, a year of emergency, and now a year emergency internship. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so that is a different path. And, and what I'm hearing, and I hope everyone hears this, is that it's okay to not know where you want to go. Sometimes you will feel lost, um, but you just keep going and you keep trying new things to figure out where you fit. probably three or so months in, maybe two, it might have been three weeks actually, <laughs> into my emergency and critical care internship that I really felt probably the most at home in oncology. Um, and 
So oncology, for everybody that isn't uh, very familiar with it, is the study of cancer medicine. Um, and the way that we approach it in veterinary medicine is through like multiple different angles. Same thing with human medicine. So there's uh, medical oncology, which deals with treatment of cancer with medical means like chemotherapy. It's also kind of grown to engulf the uh, cancer vaccines and cancer immunotherapy that's growing in both veterinary medicine and in human medicine. There's surgical oncology, which approaches cancer from a surgical perspective, trying to go in and get disease out of the body. Um, and then there's actually radiation oncology as well, which uses radiation and several different delivery mechanisms to try to treat cancer, either without surgery, if surgery isn't a good option for a patient or after surgery has been done, but when we know that we've got a high likelihood of some microscopic cancer cells being left behind. So oncology in veterinary medicine encompasses all of those things and works from different angles to treat a patient entirely, not just one aspect of their disease, to try to result in the best outcome. Is there a specific one of those branches of oncology that you focus on? I'm, I'm, so I'm a medical oncology resident, which focuses kind of on uh, chemotherapy mm -hmm. as treatment for cancer. Uh, in the, the vet hospital here, we do, so medical oncology service has the most appointments. Okay. So we see the most cases, and I, I just get an appointment that has a patient with cancer. You know, I don't know a whole lot sometimes about why they're coming in. Sometimes I don't even know what cancer they're coming in for. Um, and sometimes they've already been treated and evaluated somewhere else and they're coming for a second opinion or because they've moved or because we honestly offer a lot of things that are not offered outside of places like this where we might have advanced options for treatment. So it sounds like there's a lot of aspects that you're thinking about. And I always ask veterinarians, what type of personality or what types of strengths does a student need who would make a great oncologist? That's a really good question. I think that probably the most important thing is just being really open with communication to clients because I'm recommending things that cost sometimes a, a whole lot of money. I want people to know why I'm recommending these things. I just, I don't wanna say, hey, this is what we need to do. I wanna say, these are all the things that I'm considering right now. This is where this could be going. This is what may happen to your pet over the long term. What types of cancers do you mostly see? And are there any particular breeds of dogs that are predisposed to cancer? There are several repeat offenders, I would say. So there are so there's a lot of cancers that general practitioners deal with that a, lo a lot of them I don't ever see because they're reasonable. There's a lot of benign skin tumors and things that general practitioners remove that are probably pretty common. Um, but I do see a lot of probably mast cell tumors. We have clinical trials right now happening for osteosarcoma, which is a bone tumor in typically larger breed dogs, and then melanoma, which is an aggressive, uh, typically oral cavity disease in dogs. So we have clinical trials for both of those. So I think that we see a fair number of those because people are really interested in pursuing vaccine therapy, which we offer here for those diseases. But those are probably the biggest three. Oh, and lymphoma. Yep, so lymphoma is one that we typically just treat with chemotherapy, although there are some exceptions depending on where and who and all of that stuff. But um, those are, I would say, the ones that I see more than others. Okay, so you mentioned large breed, large breed dogs. Mm -hmm. uh, any other kind of just specific breeds where it's like we see a lot of I feel like is is golden retrievers. Oh yeah. I feel like I see a lot of them when I walk by. I there's a goldens, goldens get a lot of cancer. I think that the statistic is that like fifty percent of them will get cancer over their lifetime. We get a lot of boxers. Um, okay. Yeah, boxers. Boxers get a few different types of cancers. Um, they get mast cell tumors, which are the, the most common, potentially malignant skin tumor in dogs. Mm -hmm. um, pugs also get mast cell tumors. I feel like pugs have just a lot of issues in general. Yeah, they do, but they're awesome. They're too. so cute. Okay. And, and what about cats? You mentioned that you do see cats. Mm -hmm, yeah. I think that I would say probably, I have, I don't know what the actual numbers are, but probably 75% of our patients are dogs and then about 25% are cats. And cats tend to do 
a few types of tumors more commonly than others. Um, so lymphoma, cats get a lot of lymphoma and there's a few different flavors of lymphoma that cats get. And how would a client find out that their pet has cancer? I, you know, their pet is not saying, you know, things hurt, things are wrong. What are some signs? signs. Um, so I would say that it, it ranges from the, a dog goes in for a regular annual exam and on physical exam, the veterinarian finds a lump or a bump on the, on the skin or finds big lymph nodes does a, an oral exam, looks in the mouth, and sees something, feels something on abdominal palpation or rectal palpation. So a good physical exam is really important. Um, I've also seen a fair number of dogs come in that were groomed, and the groomer actually finds stuff wow. on the toes or in the anal sacs or in the ear, you know, just actually when they're getting up close and personal and bathing them, they find things. And so we, we have been sent a lot of patients that had stuff find, found at the groomer. Thank you, groomers. I know. I love it. It makes me so happy when that happens. I'm like, way to go. Yeah. Um, we also will see some patients that are sick. Mm. So either it's like a kind of a chronic illness where they're just progressively getting a little bit worse over a few months, or it's something that's really sudden where, you know, on Friday the dog was completely and totally normal, and by Tuesday they're having difficulty breathing mm. or they're – just really not wanting to eat or vomiting or just really lethargic. So it can be a very sudden change. I have to imagine that with so much cancer in human medicine, that clients bringing in their pets who now have this diagnosis that they have cancer potentially could trigger things in clients as well if they've had family members who have experienced cancer. Do you ever experience that those moments with clients where it hits extra hard for them because they've experienced it in their own family. Yes, totally. Um, I think it's sort of hard to avoid. I it's I think that of, of the, the most important thing about this job is actually taking care of yourself. Yes, talk about that. Okay, all right, I'll do it. <laughs> so um, it's really easy when you graduate from vet school um, I, I think that vet school prepares you in the sense that you learn the things that you have to, to know, although you do forget a lot of them, it, like immediately after you take a test. <laughs> it's really disturbing, but it, it cannot really prepare you for what it's like to be out on your own and to be in all these situations that have been talked about by yourself and to go through them. It's just, it's, it's different. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the stress that I experienced was because, A, I didn't feel like I was smart enough or that I knew enough to be a good veterinarian. But B is that it's emotionally challenging sometimes to see sick patients and have to deal with these clients that are in, you know, various moods, some of them angry, some of them sad, some of them just want to talk to you for two hours and yes. you're like, I have to keep moving, lady. <laughs> right. So like that's real and the stress is real. And then there's also like the stress of going into any workplace where you have problems with your boss mm -hmm. or problems with your colleagues or, you know, everything is not perfect. So I, um, I actually, after I uh, finished my emergency internship, I felt really drained emotionally and I was having a hard time coping with a lot of things that felt, didn't feel m more difficult than normal. It was just, I was in a weird place. And so I actually, I got help. I went to see a therapist and she really helped me to learn coping mechanisms and say, this feeling you have right now, hey, this is burnout. This is what it is. Let's give a name to it. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about ways to recognize it. Yes. Oh, it's 2 p.m. and you're in a bad new mood. Why? Because you didn't eat today. Yeah. So it's like uh, it's actually learning yourself. Like that's that's all this whole process is about growing up. It's just learning who you are and what messages you're receiving constantly from your body and your brain that you just ignore and like shove in your pocket because right. you have to go into the next room. Mm -hmm. So it's identifying when you don't feel good. Why? What is that? What are you trying to tell yourself? Dr. Fox Alvarez, what have we not talked about that students need to hear from you, whether it's about oncology, veterinary school, life? What, what do we want to tell these pre-vet students? I think, you know, honestly, if there was one thing that would have made my life easier going into vet school, it's actually that you are your best teacher. 
So both, I really do mean that in terms of like, only you can know yourself. And so knowing yourself and learning about yourself and what works for you in terms of what makes you feel good and what helps you relieve stress and and all of those things is really important. There um, recently, so when I, I guess when I was in undergrad and then even in vet school, you know, the internet was just a little bit younger than it is right now. Um, And a lot of resources have become available since that time that maybe they were there actually before and I just wasn't really aware of them. But for me, I'm a very, um, like I'm a hands-on learner, I'm a doer, and I'm a visual person and visuals really help me in things. But they've come out with so many cool ways now to visualize learning things. Yeah. So there's things like the Khan Academy on YouTube. There's things like Osmosis Medicine on YouTube, and they have their own site that you can pay for if you feel like you need it. But stuff like that has really helped me. So if I'm reading about something and I get to a term or a word where I'm like, either I've read this six times before and I still don't remember it, or I'm having a really hard time just grasping a concept, I go to another completely different media and say, how can I look at pictures or look at a video that will explain this? And getting it sometimes from a different angle is so helpful. Mm -hmm. So if you are reading and you are listening to this in between studying for an exam and you get to this one topic that's just driving you crazy because you can't ever remember it, just look up some other way to learn it. And I hope that it helps you. Yeah, be flexible with your learning and what works for one class or one subject is not going to work necessarily for another one. And that's the same thing. Use as many resources as you can. It's almost a diversity of learning at that point. Mm -hmm. If you're able to uh, look up material in different ways, get into a study group, have someone else explain it to you, feel comfortable going to your teacher's office hours, all of those ways will make you better and then help you explain it to your future classmates, students, clients, um, in as many ways as possible. I want to thank Dr. Fox Alvarez for being on the podcast today. I hope you start looking inward to find out what kind of learner you are, what kind of veterinarian you hope to be someday, and you start feeling more comfortable and more grounded with who you are, because at the end of the day, that is definitely what's most important. I'm Alex Avellino, and we'll talk to you soon. Welcome to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Welcome back to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, and today we have Dr. Plummer, who is an associate professor of comparative ophthalmology. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Alex. It's great to be here. I'm really excited for us to get into the eyes and talk about what comparative ophthalmology is. Um, But first, I thought it would be great, as always, to have you talk about your pathway to veterinary medicine. How did you get here? Where did you go to undergrad? What was your major? And any kind of tips and tricks you'd like our students to know that helped you along the way? Sure, sure. Well, I was... uh... A geeky 4-H kid when I, when I was in school. So I had a horse, I had dogs and cats, and um, always had a love for, of animals. So I, I had that from the get-go. Mm-hmm. And then I went to college and thought, well, maybe I should go to medical school. Um, thought about that, did the pre-med coursework at my uh, undergrad university, which was Yale. Ooh, Yale. Yeah, That's I went cool. to Yale. I'm a Yaley. And uh, interestingly, the my classmates were – kind of high strung, all of the pre-med folks that I was around. And I wasn't really comfortable with them. I realized after coming back from my freshman year summer there that I really was more comfortable working with people that love animals. Mm -hmm. So I decided I would go to veterinary school. Wonderful. And where did you go to veterinary school? I went to the University of Florida. Go Gators. Go Gators. Okay. So UF for your DVM, and then did you do an internship and a residency? What did after the DVM look like? I did. After I finished my vet school, University of Florida, I did a rotating internship in surgery and medicine at Michigan State University. In surgery and medicine. Mm -hmm. Okay. And why that internship? Um, Well, I went there because of a matching program. When you finish veterinary school, most of the time you will go into a matching program that will 
send you someplace where it's a good fit. Yes. Um, and that was one of the programs I ranked highly because of my mentors at U- University of Florida thought highly of the people that worked there. Wonderful. Okay. And then where was your residency? I came back to Gainesville. Woohoo! Go Gators. Go Gators. Yeah. Okay. So we you know, started and finished with the Gators and now you're obviously, you know, still, still with the college. Um, now, do you teach courses as well? I do. Um, we're actually pretty lucky in ophthalmology. We have coursework in all four years. Okay. So I teach the freshman introduction to ophthalmology, mm-hmm. and that is a short course where we go into anatomy and physiology of the eye and do some early c- clinical correlates. Okay. What is a cataract? What does that mean for that animal, for its vision, for sure. its comfort, that yes. sort of thing? And then in the second year, we do a pathology course. So we talk, instead of about the normal Mm -hmm. stuff, we talk about all the diseases that can happen. Cool. Okay. And then third and fourth years, we have electives. I teach in the third year an equine elective, so exclusively about horse eyes. Okay. And then in the senior year, we have an elective that talks about small animals, dogs, and cats. And what you're talking about now kind of sounds like earlier in the show, um, before we started the show, I asked what comparative ophthalmology means, and you said that it was all the species. All the species. Because every species has eyes. Every, most. Oh, what animals don't have eyes? Well, there are a few, <laughs> there are a few animals that have kind of rudimentary eyes. Can we have an example? Um, moles. They oh, have Just yes. kind of little nubbins there. Okay. And uh, animals that actually don't live in light situations, so like cave-dwelling animals sure. or deep-sea animals. Uh, now, so for cave-dwelling animals, deep-sea animals, they'd have no use for an ophthalmologist, correct? Correct. How about the moles? Um, well, if, they, if their eyes were causing them pain, if they had a source of, of pain, sure. then sure, then I would, I would be the mole doctor. <laughs> Can we just for a brief moment talk about how hard it is to spell ophthalmology? What are your thoughts on that? Oh, that's a great question. It is one of almost every ophthalmologist I have ever had any experience with, veterinary or human, major pet peeve. Hate it. Hate it. For look, Can you go ahead and just spell it for our listeners? O-P-H-T-H-A-L-M-O-L-O-G-Y. Even when you spell it, I'm like, it doesn't sound right. It's wrong. I just hate that first H. It's wrong. <laughs> Dr. Plummer, talk to us about why ophthalmology? What called you to that specialty? Well, when I started vet school, I thought I wanted to go into surgery. That was that was my thing. I wanted to fix things. And then freshman year, I took the intro to ophthalmology course that I now teach. Oh, that's so nice. Yeah, it's the full circle yeah. thing. Yeah. And oh, full circle, like an eye. Like an eye, <laughs> yes. Um, and I fell in love with it. So uh, at that point, the attraction is that you get to work with more than one species. Right. Okay. So most practitioners, they work with large animals or small animals. Some people do mixed. Some people do exotic. But there are very few people that get to do all of them. Mm-hmm. So multi-species. Right. That's a huge draw. The other huge draw for me was that I get to do medicine and I get to do surgery. So it's sure. not specifically one or the other. Right. So lots of opportunities. That's wonderful. So what kind of personality do you think lends itself to ophthalmology? What kind of student makes a great ophthalmologist? Well, ophthalmologists are very detail-oriented people. So we do exams of the eye and look at all the little pieces, parts, and make detailed notes about what we see and what's changed compared to the last exam. So you need to be really observant. You need to be very detail-oriented. Okay. That's probably the most important thing. Yeah. And it, it is cool that, um, you know, like we've said, you get to work with multiple animals, but you do get to do surgery and medicine. So let's break down those two topics. So what kind of medicine, what are we seeing often in eyes that would get treated with medicine? Uh, every, almost every disease that you can get in human ophthalmology, okay. you can see in a veterinary species. So dogs, we see dry eye. All the time. Oh, do we do eye do we do eye drops for that? We then? do eye drops. Okay, we do some we use some of the same drugs. And actually, it's interesting. Um, veterinary medicine is most of the time when drugs come out for a certain use. Yes, it goes to the human market, and then vets use it later. Cool. For dry eye, we use cyclosporin, which is an immunomodulator drug, and it has tear stimulatory properties. Okay, so it causes you to produce more tears and better tears. Yes. That started uh, being used in the veterinary space. First. First. Cool. Yes. So it's one of those interesting situations where we did it first, and then the human physicians kind of 
followed along. So folks at home who have dry eye, you're welcome from the veterinary community. Indeed. Okay, so dry eyes, what else? Gla- um, what are does glaucoma and cataracts issues? Exactly. Glaucoma and cataracts are a big deal, okay. um, particularly in dogs. Okay. So lots of particularly purebred dogs. Okay. Now, are, is any of that getting solved with surgery? Yes. So cataracts, if they're teeny tiny, we generally don't remove them. Okay. But if they're large enough and they're vision threatening, then we'll do surgery to remove cataracts. Okay. But any cataract is also, it causes a little bit of inflammation inside the eye. So we treat that medically even if the candidate, the patient isn't a candidate for cataract surgery. Sure. And glaucoma, we treat generally multimodal therapy. So they get some medications, and then if those aren't effective, then we look at surgical options. Okay, so it sounds like you might have a full treatment plan for one or both of these eyes and these animals. Right, and they are specifically tailored to that particular individual and, and often that particular eye. Sure, okay, wow. So that, like you said, very detail-oriented. With animals, Dr. Plummer, we haven't really spoken about this on our podcast, and I I think um, our intern Michael mentioned it in the car. How do we know if animals are having vision issues because they can't tell us, and they also can't tell us, yes, you know, that surgery worked, I can see better. What? How do we know? What do we do? Yeah, that's an excellent question. It's it's quite difficult, actually, um, for a couple of reasons. We can't sit them in front of the instrumentation at the optometrist and say, is this lens a little better than that lens? Or is this lens a little worse? They aren't going to be able to respond to us in that same way. But we can use more indirect methods. Mm -hmm. So during our exam, if we are concerned that there is a vision deficit, then we'll often set up obstacle courses. We'll do little mazes to put them through. So we put the owner on the opposite side of the room, set up little traffic cones and things, turn the lights on, turn the lights off. Oh. Ask, ask the dog, usually, to maneuver through the course that we've yeah. set up. And we can time them. We can see how long it takes, if they bump into things, those sorts of things. Oh, that seems so fun. Yeah. Cats are not quite as amenable to that. That doesn't shock me. Yeah, yeah. So cats, sometimes it's a matter of are they missing jumps? Are they mm, not okay. interacting with their environment? But to tell you the truth, it's actually can be very difficult, especially if a vision problem was kind of gradually uh, coming about to determine if some animals are blind because they are amazing at mapping their environment and Mm -hmm. using other physical clues. So does it often become they the animals are coming to see you because it's gotten quite bad? It's gotten quite bad or it's acute in onset or um, Really, the main reason that people come to see an ophthalmologist is because an eye is a source of pain. It looks funny. It's red. It's got discharge. They're squinting, Mm -hmm. those sorts of things. What are some of the strangest things you've seen in your career when it comes to the eyes? Oh, wow. Um, I've seen some strange things. (laughs) Okay, so I had a dog a couple years ago that um, was historically enucleated. So enucleation means the eye is removed. Okay. So the eyelids were sutured shut. All right. And But the problem was that the orbit, the bony space that holds the eye, mm-hmm. uh, would fill with air periodically. Okay. okay. So it looked like a little balloon on the face. Oh. It was very were strange. This, was it not sealed all the way and air was getting in? Well, air was coming in through the nasal lacrimal duct. Oh, geez. Oh, boy. Oh, I wouldn't. How did you fix it? Well, uh, we went back in to explore. The the enucleation had been been done years before and uh, found a little eyeball in there. It had not actually been removed. It was small. And uh, so we we see some interesting things. What a surprise to think the eyeball wasn't there and then surprise, there it is. Wow. it was. Oh, my goodness. What are some of the cool techniques, research that's coming up with um, ophthalmology? What are some of the things that we're excited about? Oh, there's so much we're excited about. Um, there's so much work that needs to be done. So if you out there, if you are interested in ophthalmology, we need people that are willing to generate some science and generate some new knowledge. Um, but in our practice at the University of Florida, one of the things that we see a lot of are horses that have corneal disease. Okay. So horses will get infections on the surface of their eye. The cornea is essentially the windshield. Um, that are very similar to what people get. So we get, we see a lot of fungal infections. We see a lot of nasty bacterial infections that can actually make a really deep wound in the windshield. 
and that can compromise the integrity of the globe. So we actually do a fair number of corneal transplants okay. at the University of Florida. So we use donor cornea and, and replace the diseased part. Um, what are your favorite eyes to work on? What species? Oh, favorite eyes. I don't know. That's a hard question because they're all different. What are some of the ones that students might think, oh, we wouldn't have worked on those kinds of eyes? What are some of the unique animals? Well, um, I'm lucky because I work on anything that has eyeballs. Um, the exotic animals are really, they're, they're usually a treat because they're quite different. And there's so much variation in their eyes. Mm -hmm. in the, uh, not necessarily the anatomy, but kind of the appearance of them. They yeah. could have very different colored irises. They could have different pupil shapes, the size of the eyes, the um, external outer protective covering could be a different shape. Sometimes they have different um, tissues that give them their rigidity. So like birds have bone in their eyes. Oh. Hmm. Um, and reptiles have cartilage. So oh. their globes are a little bit more rigid mm -hmm. than a mammal's. Yeah. Um, all of the reptile species and amphibians, they have, you know, very interesting adaptations uh, for camouflage. Uh-huh. So yes. uh, if you look at, especially frogs, um, oftentimes you'll see pigment going through their iris that kind of blends in with a pigment stripe on their skin. Cool. Same with turtles and, and some other lizards and crocodilians. That is cool. So what do students need to do, do you think, to prepare an undergrad to get not only get into vet school, but eventually become an ophthalmologist. Other than being detail oriented, what are some things that you would do, you know, to recommend to them? Oh, that's that's a good question. Things to do before you get to vet school: just be a good student, get good grades, pay attention to your study habits. That's probably the best thing that you can do. Of course, grades are important; they get you where you need to go. But before veterinary school, if you can get um, practiced and really good at um, processing information and remembering information, that will serve you well once you get to veterinary school. Good advice for any profession students, yes. Um, make sure, especially for, we've mentioned this before about study habits, and they are going to change from undergrad to vet school, but getting a nice foundation down for what works for you and being flexible with that will definitely be helpful. Dr. Plummer, what have we not talked about that you think is important for pre-vet students to know, um, something about to get them ready to go to vet school, something about ophthalmology? What do they need to know from you? Once you get into vet school or accepted to vet school, I think it's really important to kind of kind of reevaluate why you're there. So your goal at that point should not be to become an ophthalmologist or to become a surgeon. Your goal at that point should be to learn how to process information, how to remember information, how to translate that into a clinical decision-making application. And your goal should be to become the best doctor you can be. It's not to get the A, although that's great. Makes your life easier for sure. But your goal should be to take that information in and be able to apply it so that you can provide the best quality medicine surgery for your patient and your client. Absolutely. And I know that if a student were to say something along those lines in an interview about why they want to become a veterinarian, that would blow the admissions committee away because there's no shortage of students who come in and say, I know I want to work with aquatics or I know I want to be a cardiologist, but for a student to come in and say, I'm here to learn and to apply my knowledge for the future, and I want to just continue to grow in this profession, that would be exactly what they want to hear. Well, I want to thank Dr. Plummer for being here today. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. Uh, we're much more excited about eyes and what the eyes can do and how we can help our furry friends at home um, have better eyesight. I think your homework for this episode should be to Google different types of eyes in animals, specifically maybe some reptiles and see some of the different um, eye shapes and qualities that Dr. Plummer brought up and figure out which eye is going to be your favorite when you eventually get to your ophthalmology rotation in vet school. I'm Alex Avellino and we'll talk to you soon.
Welcome to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Welcome back to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, and today our guest is Dr. Alexander, who is a clinical assistant professor of zoological medicine at the University of Florida. Dr. Alexander, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, Alex. I think we have a lot of students who are really excited about this episode. Um, they're excited about ZooMed and, and all kinds of the fun, exotic animals. But before we get into that, can you tell us where did you go to undergrad? Where, how did you get to veterinary school? Yeah, happy to. I um, All gators, actually. Yay! <laughs> go gators! So I went to undergrad at Florida. Okay. And my very first day of undergrad, I walked over to the vet school and asked, do you take volunteers in the hospital? And what'd they say? At the time, they didn't actually have a volunteer program. Okay. There was one department, only one, oh, that wow. took volunteers. Wow. And which department was that? Zoo medicine. Oh, so <laughs> did you get to volunteer with them? So I was like, oh, how convenient for me. Yes. That's exactly where I want to go. Wonderful. So I started volunteering in there. And on my first day, they had an injured bald eagle. So oh, they take wildlife that's there. That's a good day to start. Yeah. And they asked me to help them hold it. Mm. And I knew right yeah. then and there. Like, I loved all parts of veterinary medicine, but I was like, this is what I want. Yeah. So I volunteered all through through there, all throughout undergrad. Mm -hmm. And then I was lucky enough to get into vet school here as well. Wonderful. And then what did your internship and residency look like? Yeah. So mine was a pretty traditional route, mm -hmm. as we say, for zoo medicine. So after vet school, I did a small animal medicine surgery rotating internship in okay. Tampa at Blue Pearl. Uh-huh. And then I did a exotics and zoo medicine internship at Colorado State University at their vet school. Mm -hmm. And from there, I did a residency at the St. Louis Zoo, which is um, in, it works also with University of Missouri. So, and then that was, so five years of training after vet school. Okay, now tell me, why did the first internship have to be small animal if you wanted to do zoo med? So it doesn't have to be small animal. Uh -huh. um, really, the goal of that first year is learning and reinforcing medicine in general. Because mm -hmm. zoo animals, you don't get quite the same depth always. We don't know the ins and outs nearly as well as we know the domestic species, dog, cat, horse, cow. Mm -hmm. So if you can learn good medicine mm -hmm. and have a solid ground in medicine and surgery and all of those things on those animals, then you can extrapolate it to zoo animals. So I went small animal, just that was more my interest um, and background experience. But you can absolutely do a large animal internship or a large animal background as well. A lot of zoo vets have gone that route. Wonderful. So it sounds like you do have options for your extra training after your DVM. Do students ever graduate with their DVM and go immediately into working with zoo med? It is very, very rare. Okay. Um, I wouldn't say immediately. So probably the closest is you may find a, a practice, either a large animal or small animal, that may help a small local zoo. Mm -hmm. Or some people privately own these animals. So you could be a, a farm animal vet, an equine vet, where you may get called out to help with a zebra or camel. But those are really dangerous animals. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have that training, it can be really difficult. Okay. And so what about small animal domestic exotics? Because I know when I walk by Zoo Med, sometimes we see rabbits and flying squirrels mm -hmm. and all those little pocket pets. How does one get the training for those animals? Could a DVM right out the gate do that? Or is it better to have the Zoo Med training? That's actually a really excellent question. Thanks for bringing that up. And that um, those are becoming more and more common. Mm -hmm pets that are brought into veterinary clinics. It used to be, you know, 20 years ago, yes, people had them, their children had them as pets, but they didn't bring them to the veterinary clinic as often. Mm -hmm. And now they're beloved parts of the family. So even in the general practice, small animal setting, you are going to see those animals. And so we are really trying at UF to increase the exposure to those species. Mm -hmm. So you do get it on clinics in our Zoom Ed rotation, but we're actually trying to incorporate it more into some of the general classes as well because rabbits, guinea pigs, cockatiels, bearded right. dragons, yeah. all of those things are going to come in the door. And we really want students to have 
at least a general understanding how to triage it, so how to take care of it in the short term. But a lot of general practitioners are their full-time vets. It's great. Speaking of courses that our students will take about ZooMed, can you tell us what courses do you teach and what kind of courses do we offer that deal with zoo medicine? Because I know a lot of students want to come to UF for our program. So what kinds of training do our students get in those four years? Yeah, so a lot of our classes specifically for zoo and exotics come after the clinical rotations. It's more once students have identified the route they want to go in and are in more of the specialized courses. So there's an avian medicine course, reptile medicine, there's a pocket pets like ferrets, rabbits, rodents, there's marine mammal medicine class. Um, so those are the main ones, but we're, we do lecture in some of the, like the other nutrition classes, mm-hmm. pharmacology, clinical pathology. We're actually working on starting a new clinical skills lab. So we're going to join up with the second year course awesome. and do a handling and diagnostic procedures of pocket pets. So we're going to do a rabbit lab, a reptile, and um, and birds. Oh, that is so fun. I think the students will love that. You know, um, for you listeners at home, we have two years of clinical skills, and that's where you're learning everything you need to know to go into the hospital and feel ready and prepared. Uh, And we do quite a bit with dogs and cats and horses, but that is so cool that the students will have opportunities to work with um, some more exotic animals. So that's wonderful. So let's talk about some fun stuff. What are some fun animals that you see typically in the clinic? And then what are some that come in and it's like, oh my goodness, I can't believe we're seeing this today? Oh, it could be anything. And everyone likes to ask us that question, like what's our favorite animal? What's the coolest thing you've ever seen? And it's all different and it all depends on your mood. And we all have different preferences. And I think we're zoo vets because we get excited by everything. Yeah. We see hummingbirds. Oh, that may really? Be, yep. They might have just flown into a window and be low on blood sugar, so we can give them some sugar and set them free. that's awesome. So we can treat, you know, five gram animals, which is really cool. Right. Um, But it can be all the way up to elephants. Yeah. Um, We don't usually bring elephants to the vet school, but it has been done. So you guys will typically travel to go see those animals? Yes. Now, I know the schedule in ZooMed, I think on Wednesdays we do certain things. What does the actual weekly schedule look like? Yeah, so... Our schedule is set up is a two-week rotation. So the students are with us for two weeks, and the first week is just with it in the hospital, and it's appointment-based mostly. It can, we also see our own emergencies. So client-owned could be anywhere from cockatiels all the way up to we also see appointments from other zoos. Mm. Um, they could send us anything. Um, they can send us primates. They could send us carnivores. We are actually one of the very few vet schools in the country that can safely house a large carnivore. And give us an example of what a large carnivore is. We have had lions, tigers, and bears. Oh, my. (laughs) I will say that that is an exciting day. I tell students on tours that sometimes walking through the hospital, you can hear a buzz, and you maybe hear someone say, like, there's a tiger or there's a lion. And that is an exciting day in the hospital for sure. It is. And we're we're very, very lucky in that we're extremely well-equipped to provide the absolute like best care in medicine mm-hmm. for these big animals. And the zoos know that. And they can they will actually some even though they have may have their own veterinarians, they can refer stuff to us and we work with them quite a bit. So the second week is a little different and that UF is actually where we are the primary veterinarians for a few zoos in northern Florida. Cool. So we are very lucky to work with these great facilities. So it's St. Augustine Alligator Farm, mm-hmm. which doesn't just have alligators. They have all sorts of amazing creatures. Um, and then Luby Bat Foundation. So they have a large population of flying foxes. And then Santa Fe Teaching Zoo, which is our community college that has a program that actually trains zookeepers. Mm-hmm. So it's really fun to have our veterinary students work with their zookeeper students. Yeah. Um, it's a perfect compliment. Yeah, and I'm sure our vet students can learn a lot about husbandry and different um, emotional characteristics of the animals. So if you're interested in husbandry and, you know, taking care of the animals, maybe rehabbing animals, zookeeper might be a great path. Absolutely. So I know sometimes students uh, are deciding between becoming a vet tech, a certified vet tech, or becoming a veterinarian, and those paths are different. And one doesn't necessarily lead to the other. So just make sure you're researching differences between 
veterinary technician and zookeeper and DVM. You want to know、uh, the different educational routes, the cost of the education, the salary that you'll make after you get those degrees, and then what you can actually do with those degrees. So make sure you're looking at all of your options. That's an excellent point. Like when you're when I've been in zoos, it's very common to meet these you know extremely experienced keepers who I look to for all of the natural history, the husbandry, that animal's behavior. And many of them will say, you know, I wanted to be a vet、mm-hmm. when I was in high school. I was going to be a veterinarian, and then I spent a summer as a zookeeper. Yeah, and realized I wanted to be that person. That、yeah. that was where my passion actually was. So it's something that if you can get. Exposure to it, I definitely recommend it because there's a lot of crossover. And you were a volunteer keeper in、mm-hmm. high school, correct? Yeah, yeah. And so、um, now, when Dr. Alexander did that, she didn't get to work with vets in that in that scenario, but she did get to handle those animals and get to see what the field looks like a little bit. And then she also volunteered with vets and、um, other other practices. So just make sure that you're getting a wide range of experiences in high school and college. So now that we're we're ch- kind of chatting about zoos and veterinarians, let's talk about job opportunities for students who, you know, become a, a resident and a, a diplomat for Zoo Med. How many opportunities are there? What do those opportunities look like?、Um, what's the outlook for students who decide that they want to go and do an internship and a residency? Are th- are there a lot of opportunities available? What does it look like? Yeah, it's. I wish I could say I could say that it's. Pretty straightforward route.、Um, there is the traditional way, which is what I was very fortunate enough to do. But it's a very competitive field.、Mm-hmm. A lot of people are interested in it for different reasons. I mean, the nice thing about it is there are so many different aspects to zoological medicine.、Mm-hmm. There's working. You know, traditionally people think of working in a zoo or aquarium. Yeah. There's working with wildlife, which we also do wildlife at UF.、Um, there's working in public health sector. You can work for the CDC. You can do One Health and work with one of the medical schools. There's just lab animal medicine. There's so many different aspects that. That makes it appeal to I think so many people, not just the traditional I want to work in a zoo,、mm-hmm. but there just aren't that many positions. Not all zoos have a full-time veterinarian. Some of the ones that people think of have multiple, but a lot just have one or two. And because of that, there aren't many training programs for it. We don't want to have all of these residency programs and training programs to have these people have with these skills and then not be able to get a job、right. that fits. So it is competitive, just based on a lot of people want to do it, and there's just not a big market for it. Yeah, yeah. So students, I always like to tell、um, my pre-vet students who come in, just because a number is small. Or the chances are slim doesn't mean you shouldn't go for it, but just know what the actual market looks like. You know what Dr. Alexander is talking about. If there's only、um, a small number of training programs, that should be an indicator that there are not as many jobs available as, let's say, small animal or equine medicine.、Um, that doesn't mean don't go for it, but just so you know, and especially when you go into an interview, you know if somebody is pushing you. To talk about your future career, and you say, "I want to do zoo med," and they say, "Well, you know that that's very competitive. You want to know what that means and be able to back it up with some facts and statistics, and then you know still go for it if that is your passion." So I know that a lot of students maybe get interested in any career because they've been exposed to it either in person or on television. And I do have some students who come in to my office and they want to be like Steve Irwin, and you know something to point out is Steve Irwin was not even a veterinarian. Right. He was a curator at a zoo, and you know he has done. He contributed so much to this planet and conservation because, as you said, look at how many people he taught to care about these animals.、Mm-hmm. So I have the absolute utmost respect for him, and I think these shows are wonderful. It's just like going to a zoo or an aquarium where you are teaching the public. So much of the job of a zoo veterinarian、mm-hmm. and keeper and curator or researcher, anyone who works at that facility. Is teaching the public,、mm. teaching them about these animals, why we care about these animals, and trying to place that little nugget in some child's head that they want to go save these animals. Right. That's a big part. So, you know, people say, "I want to be a vet because I don't want to work with people. I only want to work with animals." Right. 
even in zoos, your number one client are the people, mm -hmm. whether they are your keepers and curators, they are your clients. Mm -hmm. And then the public, you have to be able to communicate with them. A lot of zoos have communication courses. You need to get the story across about how important it is to help these animals in the wild. Yeah, right. So I love when veterinarians tell students that it's about the people, but zoo kind of, zoo med has a different side of it with that client um, and public education piece. Yes. Because then you have someone coming into the clinic with their dog, you're educating one person. Mm -hmm. But in a zoo or an aquarium, you are educating thousands of people on yeah. a daily basis. So that's a really unique side. And having a veterinarian who can communicate those things is wonderful. If you decide that you, you know, want to educate the public and handle those animals, potentially you can do curation, you can mm -hmm. be an educator, researcher, lots of opportunities there. Tell us about the show you mentioned. That's a great show. So there's a show on Animal Planet called The Zoo. Mm -hmm. And they also just started one called The Aquarium. And they follow around the staffs at uh, WCS, also known as Bronx Zoo, and their other little zoos in New York City, as well as the Georgia Aquarium. And they really do an excellent job of showing the real story, the behind the scenes. The curators, the keepers all talk about how the hand animal is doing and responding, and they interview the veterinarians, and they follow them around showing this interaction of providing care to these animals. Yeah, It's very honest. It's... Uh, I have so much respect for them, what they're doing, everything they're teaching, and um, I think it's a really nice insight. Now, these are larger facilities, so these are zoos that have multiple veterinarians, so it's not the most common. A lot of zoos may have just a couple vets, but these are really the best of the best showing what we are able to do, and it's wonderful um, insight into the field. Like my own parents sometimes always wonder what it is that I do and I can actually put the show on for them and say yeah. this is what I do cool. this is my job good like, oh that is so cool <laughs> <laughs> so something to aspire to for sure students so go ahead and check that show out so uh, Dr. Alexander what kind of personality does a student need to be a great zoo vet adaptability Okay. You, you never know what you're going to see that day. So you could be in the middle of one procedure and then all of a sudden a completely different species is ne now needs your help. So you have to completely regroup. You could be going from something the size of the palm of your hand to something that's 2,000 pounds. Could eat your hand. And, and back. Yeah. Exactly. So I think just be able to jump all over the place. It's very similar, I think, to emergency medicine. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to shift gears in a moment's notice. Right. What do we need to hear from you for our pre-vet listeners at home? What do they, what advice do you have for them? What would you want them to know about the profession, about your journey, about ZooMed? What do they need to hear? Um, I think I love what I do and I am very grateful that I made it where I have and that I'm able to be in this wonderful field. And what I always tell students that are asking me when they're applying for vet school, because, yes, it's extremely competitive. It's a long haul. It's um, There's not a large salary when you're done. You spend five years at minimum in specialty training making an intern salary to make less than a general practitioner as a boarded veterinarian often. So you're in it because you love it. But what I always say is if this is what you absolutely, absolutely want to do, you'll find your way. It's okay. It doesn't have to be the traditional route of internships to residency. You can go out and be in general practice and then start working with these places, and eventually you'll find your niche. You can, there's, so, there's endless options to get there if that's what you truly want. There are as many options as there are exotic species. Okay, students, your homework is not only to check out different opportunities to get involved with these animals that you're so passionate about, whether it is getting the DVM or becoming a zookeeper or a curator or an educator or getting your PhD in an area that's interesting to you, but go ahead and look at the realities of the profession um, by either researching or watching um, the, the shows that Dr. Alexander mentioned, the zoo and the aquarium, to see opportunities that you have and just keep in mind those goals that you have for the future. Well, I want to thank Dr. Alexander for being on the show today. 
It's always exciting to hear about ZooMed and just the exciting opportunities about veterinary medicine in general. I'm Alex Avellino, and we'll talk to you soon. Welcome to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Welcome back to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, and today we have Dr. Gatson, who is a clinical assistant professor in anesthesia and pain management. Welcome, Dr. Gatson. Hi, thanks for having me today. Dr. Gatson, can you tell us how you became a veterinarian? Where did you go to undergrad? What were your experiences like? Did you do an internship and a residency? What was your path? I got into undergrad at the University of Florida. Go Gators. Go Gators, yeah. And so... Uh, I wanted to study or I wanted to pick a major that would help me really um, kind of get the undergraduate requirements that I needed in order to go to veterinary school because I knew right off the bat when I went to, to college that I wanted to be a veterinarian. So that was like my ultimate goal. So um, I actually, this is going to be kind of a funny thing about my personality. Originally, I picked animal sciences to be my undergraduate major uh, because it was the most common major that I could find of people who were getting accepted into veteran school, so I picked that. However, I realized really quickly that as part of the major, you had to take a public speaking course, and I, I was terrified of public speaking when I was in high school. So uh, hilarious enough, that's like what I do now. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, wait a second. So now did you change majors because I did. of that? I did. I completely changed majors because oh of that. Oh my, okay. That is ironic because now yeah. look at what you're doing. Okay. I know. It's really funny. Okay. So what did you switch to? So I switched to zoology actually. Okay. And uh, I'm actually even uh, in hindsight, I'm really glad that I picked that major. It allowed me to take some classes that I probably wouldn't have picked originally and even though they're not necessarily applicable to what I'm doing now, uh, I think it really helped me to become a more um, well-rounded scientist. Okay. So students, if you're wondering, you know, oh, I should do animal science or biology because that's what most students get in with, not the case. Zoology is a great option. Get you exposed to a little bit different side of the animal sciences because it's still an animal science, but it's going to be different. So that's wonderful for, th- for them to hear. Okay. So after the bachelor's degree, what happens next? So after the bachelor's degree, um, and I guess I could also talk a little bit about, you know, some of my extracurricular things. Yeah, what did you do in college to prepare for vet school? Yeah, so I got a job as a technician at a veterinary hospital to gain some skills as far as general clinical skills that are really important as a veterinarian. Um, And also it does make your, I mean, if you have some kind of clinical experience, not only will it help you tremendously in veterinary school, but it also will help your application in general. Yeah, you kind of need it, especially to get that letter of recommendation from a vet too. Yeah, exactly. So I did that. I also worked, um, I tried to get as much broad experience as possible. So I worked in the laboratory for a little while. I had like lots of little odd jobs. Uh, I also worked at a cattle ranch for a little while. Oh, that sounds fun. Yeah, it was really fun. Uh, It was really fascinating. I I actually think that, you know, that was not something that was part of my background. My background was always small animal. And so um, I wanted to get a little bit of a large animal experience. And it was it was extremely helpful, actually. Um, going outside of my comfort zone, trying something different and getting a different uh, feel for something entirely different different that was unfamiliar to me, uh, really going outside my comfort zone. So that I think that also was also just a good life experience mm-hmm. as well. I still reflect back on that time sometimes. Oh, good. Even when I'm talking to students. Now, when you applied and you got in, did you automatically know anesthesia was for you? When did that hit us, that this is what we wanted to be? That's a good question. So anesthesia, I had taken anesthesia as a clinical rotation um, earlier in my uh, in my training, in my, I think in my junior year, because in, at the University of Florida, your clinical year is split between your junior and your senior year. It's not the case in a lot of other schools, but it is at Florida. So I had taken anesthesia as a clinical rotation in my junior year, and I actually really liked it. Um, I just enjoy the rotation in general. I had a really good teacher. Um, and the other thing that I found with anesthesia is that it really clicked with me 
I understood the concepts really like you know I would be the person who was always raising my hand and answering the questions on the rotation not the case in other rotations mm-hmm. but that was like the one that uh, everything made sense to me and so and I just enjoy the rotation in general it's also a very hands-on rotation so you were the person to do the anesthesia you were intubating dogs and putting in catheters and on a lot of the other rotations you're just kind of like doing paperwork right um, and doing a lot of like mental activities but not physical activities um, so I, it was a nice break as well to just be able to like, you know, you use your brain, but also, you know, your hands and you, you institute a lot of skills. So then I wound up taking it again as an elective. So it was my second to last rotation in veterinary school. And it was kind of the same thing all over again, right? Like I just felt like I was nailing kind of the concepts, um, understood everything really easily. It was always the person rounds to raise my hand. Everything was like, it just came so naturally to me. And uh, the it was actually a teacher. It was a veterinary technician. We were doing a case together, and she just looked at me, and she said, like, do you know that you can specialize in anesthesia? And I was like, um, you know, I, I like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know why I didn't know that. I mean, obviously, there were anesthesiologists right. working there. But for some reason, it was like somebody just saying that to me really just – it completely blew my mind. And it was just like everything clicked. I was like, oh, my gosh, this is like I get anesthesia. I get some of the things I like from critical care. Uh, I get some of the mental cerebral activities that I like from medicine. It was like all the things that I kind of liked about different specialties kind of came together with anesthesia. And just somebody saying that to me, like, you can specialize in this. And knowing that I already kind of had an avenue, like I already had an internship program. So um, at that point, I was like, yes, this is what I'm going to do. Okay, so now, so let's talk about it. What is anesthesia? What is pain management? What do students need to know? Uh, I mean, go ahead. What is it? <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's like a huge, like, it's what huge. is anesthesia? Yeah. Okay, so anesthesia is uh, the use of different medications that we can give to animals that we can titrate in order for an animal to not feel pain and to be unconscious and to allow appropriate muscle relaxation so that uh, they can have different diagnostic and surgical procedures done on these cre- on these animals um, without feeling pain. I always feel like a lot of math must be involved. There is a lot of math. Talk about why there's a lot of math involved. There's a lot of math because uh, kind of the two big arms of anesthesia in order to do it well is you have to be very... Uh, familiar with both pharmacology and you have to be very familiar with physiology and so a lot of pharmacology is not only understanding how the drugs work their mechanism of action uh, you also have to like dose them appropriately Mm -hmm. because in some of these drugs if you don't dose them appropriately you can cause significant harm to an animal and so one of the skills that our students when they're on a rotation have to practice a lot is calculating drug dosages Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of that. Right. So if you're listening and you love math and you love science and physiology and, you know, I don't want to say you love drugs, but if you're just interested (laughs) in calculations, this might be the perfect avenue for you. Yeah. So Dr. Gatson, when I think anesthesia, I think about Grey's Anatomy and ER and those medical shows. And I'm always picturing patients like waking up under anesthesia, you know, because something goes wrong. Um, Are there any, of course, we're not going to talk about specific moments, but talk to me about how you would handle how anesthesiologists handle pressure like that when they're realizing that they may be need to make some changes? Yeah, that's a good question. I think one aspect of being a good anesthesiologist is that you have to be able to handle extremely stressful situations and think with a clear head. Mm-hmm. Um, the way I describe anesthesia to a lot of people is that there's a lot of like boring nothingness happening for a long time. So if you did a good job, you know, deciding what drugs you needed to give this animal uh, and everything's going smoothly, you're handling everything great. um, I mean, you basically just have to sit back and watch your work happen, right? Like the animal's doing its own thing. It's going great. 
So it's a lot of just sitting back and relaxing interspersed with like moments of pure adrenaline and like excitement. Yeah, I think I would like that. That sounds yeah. great to be able to go, go, go and then have a break. Yeah, yeah. Although it's, it sucks when there's many exciting moments. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like that part. Um, but, you know, you have to be able to handle acutely stressful situations because in anesthesia, these animals are already kind of pushed to the brink of – um, I call it just they're just close to death, but not quite there. Like we're hand, we're kind of keeping them in a state of unconsciousness. That's, yeah, but we can easily push them over the edge. Uh, and of course, animals that are very sick, they're so much easier to push over the edge. Mm. And so not only that, the drugs we're using, the equipment we're using, there's so many opportunities for mistakes to happen. Mm-hmm. And so we're always kind of just, um, sitting right there on the edge with that patient. And so when something goes wrong, it's usually going wrong very quickly. Yeah, it sounds like potentially the anesthesiologist might be the most powerful person in that room because you're yes. controlling whether or not that patient, like you said, like is going over the edge or is just right on the yep. brink. Yep, yep. That's how I feel anyway. <laughs> that's intense. That's that's cool. So what animals do we not like working with with anesthesia? So I think this is personal to every anesthesiologist. Okay. Um, for example, one of my residents hates anesthetizing goats. And that's actually one of my favorite animals to anesthetize. Why do they hate it? Why is it one of your favorites? So, <laughs> like, again, I think it's very personal. First of all, I absolutely love goats. Okay. <laughs> I just think they're great little animals. And... Um, I find their anesthesia to be both challenging but also very rewarding a lot of time. And I think also for goats anyway, when we're anesthetizing them or putting them under general anesthesia, they're usually pretty sick or they have some kind of emergent procedure that yeah, we're doing. Yeah, so we're not and just I think doing I kind it. of yeah. yeah. I think I alluded to this earlier in that um, I just like really dig anesthesia for emergency things. Mm-hmm. And so uh, – and they, and they have some very interesting challenges that I kind of enjoy – one of the challenges of anesthetizing goats is actually capturing an airway. Um, they're very hard to intubate. And I actually, I mean, I really like dealing with those types of emergencies. Um, so I, I actually really enjoy anesthetizing them. And uh, the, the animal I hate anesthetizing, um, honestly, is I don't like doing, like, llamas. Okay. I don't like working on llamas. Why? Uh, so again, I said it's very personal. Um, I have one of my one of our anesthesia technicians like loves llamas. I generally don't love llamas. I mean, they're fine, I guess. <laughs> but I, uh, so first of all, um, they're flighty, so they have some of the same um, things that that make working with horses very challenging. Um, and also they're very, they're, they're large, they're larger animals and they spit. Yeah. Right. (laughs) And it's like without warning, they just spit on you and it's the nastiest spit possible. It's like mucusy. Okay. So it's not just necessarily anesthetizing (laughs) llamas. It's just like llamas in general. We're just not into them. I'm not into them. I mean, I, I mean like, again, I love animals. They're fine. They, they, they're, they're fine. But like, I just, they're not my favorite. Yes. And then anesthetizing them is is uh, is challenging in general. Okay. Um, they have kind of the parts of, of anesthetizing goats that are very challenging, and then also the parts of horses that are challenging. They just have like all the parts that are challenging about anesthetizing other animals, just like together in one animal. Oh, uh, that seems like a mess. And then yeah, and then the other thing is we call them obligate nasal breathers, which means that they can't really breathe out of their mouth very well. Mm. It's just they're very awkward animals to yeah. anesthetize. And then they have that big, long neck, <laughs> which makes it really hard to put uh, – to get venous access. They're really hard to get venous access in. And also, uh, because they have that big, long neck, it creates some challenges also with um, ventilating them appropriately, providing appropriate oxygenation. Um, we struggle with that as well because we don't have a tube that's, like, long enough for them. What has been the most unique or fun anesthesia experience that you've had? I have to think about that for a second because I have so many. Um, I think any time I get the opportunity to work on some kind of an exotic animal that's really exciting. I remember now it's kind of – I've done so many now that it's second nature. But I remember the first time I, I got to anesthetize a tiger was really special to mm-hmm. me. Um, and intubating the tiger was <laughs> really intimidating. 
um, because, you know, you anesthetize the tiger, we pull it out, and then we have to capture an airway. So you just open up this animal's mouth, and it's terrifying in yes. there. I mean, the, t- the canines are, I mean, ridiculous. <laughs> They're yeah, so large. No mistakes in that moment. Yeah, and then, you know, you basically have to put your hands in the cat's mouth in order to, to intubate them. And you're like, man, I, I really hope that this goes well. <laughs> right. Well, what a cool experience. Yeah, and recovery is also really fascinating as well. Um, I've anesthetized some really interesting birds as well. I find birds to be really challenging. Um, they have a lot of unique physiological uh, adaptations to flight. And that makes them, again, uh, something that we have to consider when we anesthetize them. Probably the most challenging bird I ever anesthetized, something called a cassowary. I don't know if anybody's heard of that. Oh, I've heard of it, but I don't remember what they look like. Oh, they're awful. They look like dinosaurs. (laughs) It's like they look like velociraptors, I imagine. Cool. Without the teeth. Yeah. Um, And also, they're very angry birds. Oh. They're very angry, yeah. Have you ever been, like, snapped at when you're trying to do some anesthesia or any- I hope not <laughs> if okay. I did a bad job at my at my job I probably would get snapped at um be, but uh cassowary was just really interesting um in general it's a very large bird it's like the size of an emu basically oh yeah they're large birds that's intimidating yeah and they have these big humongous claws that can like rip rip your face to shreds how do you even restrain that to make to do we what don't you have to do? Okay. we don't we dart them from a distance oh cool yeah is it a like a gun dart or with your mouth either one will work depending on how close you can get to the animal um we try if we're going to dart animals to use the the blow pipe because um the amount of <clears throat> excuse me the amount of pressure they have to generate is lower than a dart gun, and so it creates less damage to the animal when the when the dart actually enters into the muscle. But uh, the the guns we have to use when we have to be kind of far away from an animal. But we darted it and uh, jumped in and did our procedure. The interesting part was recovering this thing um, because they have very violent recoveries. Uh, so you just you know you have to be there for the animal to make sure that it's safe when it's waking up from anesthesia, but you also like you don't want to get injured. Sure. So it was an interesting experience for sure. Everyone made it out alive, including the cassowary. Wow. Yeah. You, know, you, you think about anesthesia and you think about these animals resting peacefully, but it takes some hard work to get them to that moment. Sure does. So Dr. Gatson, what do our students need to hear from you regarding? Veterinary medicine, anesthesiology, what do you want them to know from your perspective? I think uh, what I always try to tell students, because this is a very personal experience for me from kind of like how I got to where I was, is just always be open-minded all at all times throughout your entire um, anesthesia training. And the other thing I want them to take away from this is that um, always be curious and never stop learning not only about veterinary medicine, but about everything. I think as a veterinarian, uh, even when you finish veterinary school, um, even though I think when you're when I was a student, I thought like, oh, when I'm done with vet school, I'm gonna be like, I'm gonna know everything about veterinary medicine. I'm gonna be like, I'm just gonna they're gonna I'm gonna go into this program and they're gonna teach me everything and I'm gonna come out and be an amazing veterinarian. And you learn very quickly that although I mean you learn a lot in veterinary school, but there's still so much to know when you leave veterinary school. And I think that that students graduating sometimes feel unconfident because of that. Like they're scared. And that's okay. Everybody's experiencing that. But you, if you're just curious and open-minded and always willing to learn, um, you can have an extremely fulfilling career. And an extremely fulfilling life. Yes. For sure. Yeah. Well, I want to thank Dr. Gadsden for being here today and talking to us about some of her unique experiences and adventures with anesthesia. Your homework is to look up a cassowary and how intense they are and find out if maybe that would be your favorite animal to put under anesthesia when you become an anesthesiologist. I'm Alex Avellino, and we'll talk to you soon. Welcome to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. 
Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Welcome back to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, and today we have Dr. Stone, who's a clinical assistant professor in small animal clinical science, as well as the service chief of primary care and dentistry. Dr. Stone, welcome to the show. Thank you, Alex. Before we get started on the details of primary care and dentistry and what you do on a daily basis, can you talk to us about the degrees you hold, where you got them, and the experience that our pre-vet students need to hear about how you got those degrees? Sure. So um, in Gainesville, it's not very popular for me to say, but I I got my bachelor's degree at Florida State University. And so I went there and I got a a bachelor's in biology and a minor in chemistry. And then I came back to go to vet school. And when I got accepted to vet school, I also got accepted to the PhD program at the same time. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was able to do it in six years. And then I got out and did a little bit of a post doc uh, over in the College of Dentistry and then started doing relief work in the area and did relief work for primary care and dentistry, and the rest is history. What was your PhD focus in? Uh, My PhD focus was in immunology, essentially. Okay. And uh, what experiences did you do in high school or undergrad that you think helped accept you into vet school? I did. At the time, it was called AP courses, advanced placement courses. I did a lot of those, and I my favorite ones were the sciences, you know, chemistry, biology. And I did a couple of summer internships that they offered at the university. I also worked at the swine unit. Mm. Um, I decided that I had some experiences working as a vet tech uh, in high school and somewhat through my undergraduate, and I decided I needed some large animal. Yeah. So I decided, why not? Let's go work at the swine unit. So strong grades and a good variety of veterinary experiences. Yep. And mm-hmm. the other thing I did that I think really prepared me for vet school is I waited tables. Talk about why that's a great experience for vet school. Uh, if you can be in the service industry and you can talk to people and you can help people get what they need in a in the moment, then you can certainly do veterinary medicine, at least from that perspective. Yeah, the customer service aspect of working in the food service industry is huge. Students sometimes ask me, should they choose a vet med job or food service or something that deals with people? And I'm like, if you can do both, yes, that would be ideal. Okay, so now let's talk about uh, what, if you could give a simple definition of what primary care is, what would we say? Because we've had cardiologists on and surgeons. Um, What is primary care? Primary care is essentially the way to say that we teach veterinarians how to be general practice veterinarians. We teach veterinarians how to be the doctor in the corner. That's what we do. Because 90% of our graduates are going to go out and do general practice veterinary medicine. We're Mm -hmm. the veterinarian that you see first. Okay. Okay. And then we may refer you to a specialist. We may handle whatever it is, or we may refer you to a specialist. So typical things a primary care doctor in our facilities would see are? Primary care, the most important thing is wellness care. Okay. The most important thing I do all day is keep animals healthy. Mm -hmm. So that includes things like preventing heartworm disease. That includes things like doing senior blood panels, Mm -hmm. uh, making sure that, you know, kidneys are healthy, liver is healthy, all those kind of things, and vaccinations. Okay. Keeping animals protected from infectious diseases. That's probably the most important thing I do. I also see animals for a multitude of other things. We see animals for uh, illnesses. Uh, we see animals for injuries. We see animals for reproductive concerns. We see animals for, uh, you know, all kinds of things, including or their oral health as well. Mm-hmm. Okay. So when the animals come in, how often are you seeing them? Every six months, once a year, if it's for like a wellness type visit? So when they're puppies and kittens, obviously you see them a little bit more. And then once they're adults and young adults, you probably can get away with seeing them about once a year. And in fact, in Florida, you have to see them once a year because the Practice Act by law says, in order for me to prescribe medications for them, I have to see them once a year. Okay. However, if an animal is, say, um, it's an animal that has other health issues or it's an animal that's maybe a Great Dane or something like that where their their lifespan's a little bit shorter, I may want to start seeing them even at a young age every six months. Okay. But most animals, it's going to be after they're about the age of five that I'm going to want to see them a little more frequently than once a year. So at these wellness visits, I have to assume that communication is very important between the veterinarian and the client. And I know that you take an active role in our students' communication training. Can you talk about communication on the veterinary medicine side? Why is communication important 
what what is communication vet med? Sure. Uh, so I have not met a single animal that got themselves to my practice. <laughs> not one. Um, and so everybody comes attached to a human. Mm-hmm. And that human is going to be the way into knowing what's going on with that animal, at least in terms of what do they do all day? You know, who do they interact with? Where do they go? What do they eat? Mm-hmm. All of those things, I have to rely on that human to tell me those things. Sure. And if they leave things out or if they forget things or if I don't present a, an effective um, landing pad for all that information, then I'm not going to know about it yeah. and I'm not going to be able to do my job. So probably the two best things I have at my disposal in terms of diagnostics and and physical exam are my communication skills with that owner mm-hmm. and, and my actual physical exam. Right. So, and what you're talking about with the communication, is that the history that the students and the veterinarians sure. are taking? Um, it's a history taking. It's the knowing what questions to ask. Mm-hmm. It's also the knowing how to talk to a client when their animal's in crisis mm. to be able to figure out how best to help them help their animal. Right, right. So students, like Dr. Stone said, you know, 90% of our DVM students at UF are going to go out and to be general practitioners, essentially. And so the being able to communicate with clients and get that history is important. Let's talk about the physical exam. Yes. Why is a physical exam so important? Physical exam is so important because that's where you gain all of the information about where you want to target your diagnostics. Mm -hmm. Um, If an animal's hurting, where is it hurting? You know, if an animal's not feeling well, is it in their abdomen? Is it in their chest? Can can they breathe? All of those things I'm going to get an idea about from my physical exam. And so to me, that's, that's sort of the most important thing I do all day other than talking with the client. Right. Well, favorite animal to do a physical exam on? Oh. And maybe in particular breed. Because what, let's talk about animals. What animals do you see on a daily basis? On a daily basis, I see dogs and cats. Right, okay. On a daily basis. I occasionally see some other critters, but most of the time I see dogs and cats. Okay. Uh, I think my favorite animal to do a physical exam on is an an, is a, a fit animal. Oh, talk about what fit would mean. I would say an animal that's not obese. Uh-huh. An animal that is a great body condition score, which basically means that I can feel their ribs without pushing mm-hmm. and they have a waist. Okay. Because then I can actually feel some of what's going on in that body. I can actually hear some of what's going on in that chest. Mm-hmm. All right. So folks at home, keep those pets fit so you can get a great physical exam from the veterinarian. That's right. Let's dive into dentistry. Yay, teeth. Yay, teeth. So what, you know, so I, I think for folks who, not our audience because they know exactly what they're doing, but a lot of folks who aren't familiar with vet med would be potentially surprised that we need veterinarian dentists. So talk about the history a little bit. Why do we need it? What are some issues that we see? So again, like every animal comes in with a person, I haven't met a single animal that doesn't have a mouth. (laughs) Right, right. Not one. Yeah. So at least in terms of my patients. So everybody comes in with a mouth. And plus the mouth is sort of like most, at least with dogs and cats, it's like their hands. Mm -hmm. How often does an animal pick up something with their face? Right. Pretty much all the time. Yeah. And so if their mouth is in pain, if their mouth is diseased, Mm -hmm. then that's going to be a problem for them. Mm -hmm. Um, And so historically, we've done a really bad job at educating veterinarians about it. We've sort of said, okay, you person that's a pre-veterinary student, why don't you come on in and clean teeth in my practice? And we've made that sort of our focus is cleaning the teeth. Mm -hmm. Well, that's really not what I do. And that's really not what many veterinarians are now being trained to do. What we're being trained to do is do a really good oral exam and take x-rays. And if we can then tell what's going on with that animal's mouth, is there a tooth abscess? Is there a tooth fracture? Is there, um, you know, terrible periodontal disease? It, what, what's going on in there that may be making this animal either unhealthy due to chronic bacterial infection or painful due yeah. to an inflammatory process or a, a fracture, an injury? So what are some modifications? Because if you keep up with veterinary uh, controversial issues, potentially, you might know about uh, elective procedures. For example, ear cropping, tail docking, declawing of cats. Um, And maybe you've heard about some teeth issues as well. What are some of the controversial teeth issues we might see? So, you know, Animals, and this is what I like to say, animals have the right to a non-painful, so a comfortable and functional mouth. So that they, they have the right to that. They do not have the right to a pretty mouth. Mm-hmm. So we all get braces and things like that, not often because it's that we can't function. It's because we want to look good, right? Mm-hmm. Yes, I which, have braces for sure. <laughs> which is fair. Um, 
But dogs and cats don't actually need the teeth they have. So things like fake teeth Mm -hmm. being put in, things like crowns being put on just to make an animal look tough, Mm -hmm. those are all things that are not really all that necessary. Now, crowns can be necessary, which is essentially putting a covering on a tooth. Could be metal, could be porcelain, could be lots of things, just like in us. Um, But... It, and it might be necessary if you're a canine officer or if you're a search and rescue dog or any of those kind of things. But in general, um, the normal dog does not need the teeth they have. We do not expect them to go out and catch and kill their food. We right. put it in a bowl right. and we put it in front of them. Sure, sure. Now let's talk about what are your favorite dental procedures to do? I kind of like, I mean, I like doing some of the surgical procedures where you take you extract some teeth and things like that. I'm not, I'm not wild about extracting giant teeth. Um, I, I will say that it's, it's a, it's something that takes a lot of arm strength. Okay. Um, I would say that I like doing, um, I like closing up my surgeries because it takes a little bit of, uh, art to sort of close up the surgeries. You've got to make sure that you've, it's not just like a, an incision you make in the skin. It's a, it's something you got to sew around other teeth. You've mm. got to make sure that, you know, the other teeth have a covering of gingiva and all those kinds of things. And so it's a little more of a challenge, and, and I kind of appreciate that. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I think dogs and cats' mouths, a lot of time I'm thinking that they smell. Yes, they what? should not. They should not. So what are your – what? Do you, how do you speak to that piece? So most – about the statistics show about 80% of animals by the age two have periodontal disease. Oh, no. Which is why their mouth smell. Um, you know, that, that – that puppy food smell is fine. Mm-hmm. That's what they eat. Mm-hmm. But that terrible smell of, you know, rotten stuff is not normal. So that would be on the owner's part to just have better toothbrushing habits, to have the right food and treats. What is it? Yes. So it's a lot of things, unfortunately. It's not a one-dimensional thing. So an owner can do the most amazing home care that you can imagine. They can be brushing daily. They can give the right treats that don't break their teeth. They can do all of those things. And still have a dog that has terrible periodontal disease. Mm. It's somewhat genetic. Okay. So, again, you give them the best chance by doing really good home care and by making sure that all the treats that you have can be either dented by your fingernail or bent by your hands, which means they're not going to break that dog's teeth Mm -hmm. or that cat's teeth. Mm -hmm. And then, once you've done all that, then you just have to go with what you're dealt, like everything else. Sure. And you mentioned genetics. Do we have certain breeds of dogs that are just chronically getting this kind of tooth issue or this kind of gum issue and maybe cats as well? Sure. So this is what I tell my students. Big dogs and cats break their teeth and little dogs have periodontal disease. Oh, shoot. Okay. So pretty much that's how that rolls. Okay. Big dogs tend to not have as much periodontal disease because if you think about it, all dogs have 42 teeth. 42 teeth. I didn't even so know that. So you're okay. putting all of those teeth in a very tiny mouth. Yeah. Now figure that out. Right. You know, so bigger dogs have more room for their teeth. Okay. They tend to do a little bit better um, with periodontal disease, but they tend to go chew on things like coconuts and rocks. <laughs> right, and, sure. You know, the things they're not supposed to, yeah. and they break their teeth. Yeah. Cats. Cats have some interesting issues, but... They can have periodontal disease, disease, that's for sure. But a lot of times they're doing things like running like mad things through the house and jumping off of stuff. And not all of them are graceful. No, okay. So they're just going to break a couple teeth at the yeah. time. And in general, if a cat breaks a few teeth, are they fine? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. They're so gonna, they wouldn't have to come They're not going to miss them either. I mean, if they break the tooth, we need to see that and make sure it's not a pulp exposure. Make sure it's not into the nerve and the blood vessel and all that kind of stuff. But if it's not then, yeah, they're going to be fine. If it is, we take the tooth out, and they're still going to be fine. What kind of personality do you think suits a primary care dentistry veterinarian? So I think a a primary care person that does some dentistry, like, so we tend to do a little extra dentistry other than your average veterinarian. But if you wanted to be a veterinarian that does really quality dental care, I think you need to be somebody that likes people. You need to be somebody that likes to um, educate because you're going to have to educate your clients about lots and lots of things. And you want to be somebody that likes a bit of variety because you're going to see lots of different types of things, not just dentistry. You're going to see, you know, animals that are sick from eating, getting in the garbage. You're going to see animals that are unfortunately hit by a car. You're going to see, you know, you're going to see a whole range of things from birth to death, you know, from the time they're tiny babies to the time they're geriatrics. You're going to see the whole gamut. And I like that. Can you tell us what kind of training our DVM students get 
whether it's in clinical rotations or in the classroom when it comes to primary care and dentistry? Sure. So we start in the uh, first year in the clinical skills lab. They end up learning to do an actual oral exam. Um, they end up learning to do a little bit of dental charting, so putting you know that exam on paper as appropriate to um, the profession. And then in the second year, we talk about um, lots more things about vaccinations, vac- vaccination schedules for herds of animals. We talk about some veterinary ethics when it comes to dentistry. We talk about um, some ways to keep animals health, uh, oral health, you know, in check, uh, especially if you're dealing, say, with like a, a cattery or a kennel or a shelter type situation. Mm-hmm. Um, in the third year, we have a, a didactic course, which it offers several different laboratories, um, which involves teaching things like the whole gamut of general practice dentistry, including extractions. Um, students get the chance to do some extractions. And then we have two um, clerkship offerings. So you may get it in your junior year or your senior year of doing um, a, a defined clerkship, a two-week clerkship where you do some extracting on live animals and some extracting on cadavers. Now, if you could give advice, any advice, to our pre-vet students about preparing for veterinary school, thinking about their future career, what would you want them to know? I would say, again, work in the service industry if you at all possibly can, and, and think about how you're talking to people. Focus on what you're, how you're communicating and what you can what you can get them to tell you. There are some, some pretty basic online stuff you can go in and look up about good communication in veterinary medicine, and you'll see some basic things like open-ended questions, um, listening, empathy, things like that. Mm-hmm. Start figuring out what those are. That'll give you a leg up in terms of your interview, as well as, um, Absolutely. you know, as well as getting, you know, do to be a good veterinarian. The other thing I would do is start looking at some of the things like the Partnership for Healthy Pets. It's got a really nice way of explaining how to keep your animal healthy. Mm-hmm. And again, once you know healthy, then you can figure out what's not healthy. Right. Yeah, exactly how our curriculum is set up. First year, you're learning about what's normal and healthy. And second year is, okay, when it doesn't look like that, how do we fix it? Exactly. Well, students, I think your homework today is do what Dr. Stone said, um, you know, potentially look into an opportunity in the service industry, uh, look into what makes a pet healthy. And then I'd also like you to be looking into your opinion on some of the controversial issues, specifically with elective procedures. So if you do get asked in an interview, not only will you be more prepared to have a conversation in that interview room because of the training we just talked about, but you'll be able to articulate your opinion on those issues. One other resource would be the AVDC, the American Veterinary Dental College. Mm -hmm. They have a really nice page on some of those controversial issues. Perfect, and then you'll be able to say, this is legitimate because I've looked it up on an actual organization. So always do that. Formulate your opinion based on the facts and science, please. Absolutely. Well, I'm Alex Avellino and we'll talk to you soon. Welcome to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Welcome back to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, and today my guest is Miss Brandy Phillips the Animal Technical Rescue Branch Director for the UF Vet Emergency Treatment Service for UFCBM. Brandy, welcome to the show. Thank you, Alex. The cool thing that you guys should know about Brandy is she was the pre-vet advisor, which is my job, before I had it. So we really can relate to each other's positions. And she is not a veterinarian, so she gets to bring a unique perspective to the uh, UF Vet Emergency Treatment Service. First of all, Brandy, what is it? So what we are is a kind of a two-headed team. We do both disaster response, but also animal technical rescue. 
Okay, so how did you even get involved in this? What was your background? You know, where did you go to undergrad? We always like guests to talk to us about how they got their positions. Absolutely. So my undergrad is actually a degree in psychology. And then I went on to graduate school for agricultural education and communication at the University of Florida. Go Gators. Yes. And that's where I got involved in this program was through my graduate program, I came on to help develop the curriculum for our animal technical rescue component. Okay. Um, so I came in as an educator into that training program and then really enjoyed the whole process. And so I've stayed on throughout that time. So I've been involved since 2011 um, and previously did work as an advisor at the University of Florida, um, but now focus primarily on this. I think um, we always like to point out that sometimes students' careers and passions are not the same. So while you were having a career in advising, you were doing what your passion was, right, which is this, but now you're doing it full time. Absolutely. Which is wonderful. Yes. So my friends at home, if you're thinking that you maybe get a position or a career that you aren't in love with, um, but you still get to have your passion on the side, do that, enjoy both, and then maybe eventually the passion will become the profession. Okay, so disaster response, and the other piece was? Animal technical rescue. Animal technical rescue. Can you break down what each of those entails? Sure. So disaster response is when we send out teams um, of veterinarians, of our DVM students, of technicians, to be able to perform veterinary care in disaster-type situations. So here in Florida, a lot of times that's going to be hurricanes, but mm -hmm. it can also include wildfires, um, floods for other reasons, Lots of different types of natural or sometimes man-made disasters. We also sent a team during the BP oil spill oh, wow. back several years ago to help with that as well. Uh, now, for the disaster piece, are we assuming that every disaster has animals involved? Is it always animal help that we're giving, or are we doing other things as well? So we provide animal help. Okay. We respond with emergency support function 17, which is a very fancy way of saying that that is the animal and agricultural piece of disaster response at the state level. Mm -hmm. So we only focus on animals during those disaster response. Not that we're not interested in people, right, right. but um, that is our, our role in that picture. Okay, so that's the disaster response side. Mm -hmm. What is the animal technical rescue side? So the animal technical rescue side is where we provide both response and training for technical rescue type emergencies. Those are going to be emergencies that go above and beyond what your normal emergency response capabilities are going to entail. So for us, what that looks like is overturned trailers on highways. Oh. Um, things like horses or cows that are trapped in septic tanks or swimming pools or sinkholes. Oh, God. Haylofts. All kinds of really more dramatic situations mm -hmm. than your typical, we just need a little bit of help out of this situation. What comes to mind when you said that was I'm picturing the cat in the tree and the firefighter comes and helps them, but this is for like the bigger animals, the bigger situations where y'all will come out. Yeah, absolutely. And it can be something like a cat or a dog. It just depends on the kind of a situation that they're in um, and what resources and capabilities are needed to be called in for that. So it sounds like all of these instances are not planned. Correct. These things happen. How does a veterinarian come out if they're on clinical rotations and they have things that they're doing? How does that piece work when there's an emergency? Sure. So it's challenging, um, always challenging. But we do work with the FEMA and um, our own college group of veterinarians and vet students to see who is available based on what their clinical obligations are, how can they get covered, um, what happens. Because you can't plan for disasters. You can't plan for emergencies. We do train, we prepare, but we're always just waiting. Mm -hmm. And when it happens, it happens. Yeah. Um, so finding coverage is, is the biggest thing and making sure that you've got support to be able to do that is important. Right. Let's talk about the training pieces. Um, so what kinds of training do our veterinarians and vet students go through to be prepared for these kinds of events? So particularly, a lot of our training is on the animal technical rescue side. We do heavy, heavy training there because it is so intensive in terms of skill development. So what we do at UF is kind of unique. We put our DVM students every year through our uh, multi-day operations level training. Mm -hmm. And that gives our students the opportunity to get hands on the equipment, be able to see the techniques, learn the techniques, 
put them to use with a life-size equine mannequin that we have, which is really oh great. Oh, my. Okay. I think we bring that out at open house. We do. Yeah. Yes, every year. So if you guys want to come and see what this life-size equine model looks like and kind of what the uh, techniques are for this animal technical response training, you can come to open house in April and see that. So our students go through that. Um, can we talk about one of the most exciting parts of the training, which to me would be the repelling? Yeah, so uh, we do also like to take our students repelling at the Ben Hill Griffin Stadium every year, which is a really cool opportunity um, that we're very fortunate to have here at the University of Florida, that the athletics department is supportive of us doing that training here. Um, and a lot of what we do is based on rope rescue. That's the foundation in the core of animal technical rescue. So we just apply rope rescue techniques to heavier loads in a lot of cases. Getting our students familiarized with these rope systems is really critical for their understanding of how to implement these techniques. So a fun way that we can do that is to have them repel in the stadium. I have gotten to do it, and it was super fun. Um, definitely a little scary if you have a fear of heights, but really thrilling once you get out there, and our students get to participate in that, which is wonderful. Uh, what kinds of major events, like disasters, have you been a part of yourself, and what were they like? So the most recent one was Hurricane Irma. We sent a team down to Key West and provided veterinary care to the citizens of the Keys that had either remained during Hurricane Irma or were coming back to their homes following evacuation and needed care for their animals at that point. What, what kind of emotions are going on during that time? Oh my gosh, it's so challenging. Um, you know, I've been, as a native Floridian, I've been to the Keys many, many times, mm -hmm. never under these kind of circumstances. Yeah. So it was really difficult emotionally going into a place that you know to be this beautiful place full of vibrant people mm -hmm. um, and see the absolute devastation and destruction. So our team entered in a very sobering kind of a way yeah. to get to the location in the first place. But you also see Amidst all of the devastation, you can really have an opportunity to see the great parts of humanity, Yeah, um, which was really refreshing. We had so much excitement from the community about us being there. Oh, that's they nice. They were so grateful. Mm -hmm. um, we had a lot of great support from local businesses that donated ice to keep our drugs cool. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there was just a lot of really great teamwork and collaboration and community yeah. that came out of that. Yeah. I can imagine that, you know, when it's super stressful for the residents of an area that gets hit with something like a hurricane, having, it almost feels like superheroes come down and kind of save the day and help to rescue uh, their animals, which are a part of their family and just be a part of that community. That's a lovely, although scary experience for our vets and vet students to be a part of that. And particularly because animals provide us all so much comfort and mm -hmm. Um, means so much to us personally, that's really all that some of these people had left. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, you know, gosh. You right. They lose home, their home. You lose all of your possessions, all of your personal belongings. Mm -hmm. All of that gets destroyed. And what you have left is the bond that you have with your animal. Of and course. to be able to have somebody help you care for your animal in that time of need is so much to those people. Yeah. I, I assume that there's going to be a lot of displaced animals in those kinds of events. What do we do when we find some of those animals roaming around in those areas? So our team is um, part of a bigger organization called the State Agricultural Response Team. Uh -huh. And part of what we do is, is help to um, work within that network to find the right resources to be able to reunite pets with their family. Mm -hmm. So there are animal sheltering groups. Florida SARC is one of them. That's the State Animal Response Coalition, mm -hmm. and they do a lot of pet sheltering. Okay. So they'll help to, to find lost pets, reunite them with their families and things like that. The ASPCA often comes out on these things, the Humane Society. So mm -hmm. we're part of a bigger network of a lot of agencies that are involved in these responses. Yeah, and in these kinds of situations, um, I'm sure communication is so important, strong communication skills for our students, um, for the veterinarians that are on the team. So we always try to stress how important communication is. So don't forget, in an emergency, you have to be just as level-headed and prepared to answer questions and get the help that these animals need. Absolutely. What kind of personality do you think suits a prospective DVM student um, or DVM student who's interested in joining an organization like yours? What kind of 
skills do they need to have? That's a great question. It's really important to be able to stay calm under pressure. Um, remembering that somebody else's emergency is not your emergency. You need to stay calm. You need to stay focused. You need to be able to know this is your job. This is what you need to do. Even though it's somebody else's worst day, you're there to help. Right. Right. Yeah. So you've got to stay calm. You've got to stay level headed. Um, you've got to keep your head in the game. You have to know how to take care of yourself. Okay. Because it's so important. And what we stress, particularly in animal technical rescue, um, but it also applies to the disaster response side, human safety comes first. Mm -hmm. We all are so committed to animal welfare, and that is really a core piece of what we do. But we can't promote or support animal welfare if we aren't taking care of our people first. Right. So knowing your limits, knowing your boundaries, knowing how to support yourself and take care of yourself is so critical to being successful when you're working in disaster response or any kind of emergency situation. Yeah, I always bring up the, when you're on an airplane, who do they say to put the oxygen mask on first? Yourself before you help the person next to you. Because if you're not taking care of yourself, you can't help the person next to you. You can't help the animal next to you. Exactly. Okay, wonderful. Um, what other parts of what y'all do do you think is important for our listeners to know, to understand something that maybe they wouldn't, I'm sure for a lot of us, we didn't even know this was an option for veterinarians and vet students, but what else do they need to know? Some fun things. Yeah, so this is a really great opportunity to tie in with your local community and really get yourself networked in with a lot of other great community members. And that's really what we strive to do in, in getting our students involved with these types of things, um, particularly from the side that I work most heavily with is the animal technical rescue piece. Um, our students, we train so that they can go out once they're in their communities of practice and coordinate with their local emergency operations center, get in touch with their local fire department, their law enforcement agencies. That's going to be a lot of the bulk of who we train, but they need veterinary support. Mm -hmm. right. So they're going to do a lot of the hard, heavy lifting um, and the building of systems and making the logistics flow to make the emergency response happen. But they really need veterinary support. They need sedation. They need care for that mm -hmm. animal. They need to know what they might be doing that's going to impact that animal's health. So the role of the veterinarian in these pieces is so immensely important. And being able to train and prepare these students to go out and serve their community in that way so that they can network with the correct people makes all of these situations so much more successful and so much better for the animal, for the community, for the people involved. So if I'm a pre-vet student, I might have a wonderful volunteer experience if I can get involved with my community in this way for these disaster responses, animal technical rescues, and also something to think about students. One of the VEMCAST essay questions right now is how do veterinarians contribute to society? And this is a piece that I don't see a lot of students write about, but veterinarians come in and save the day in these kind of disaster um, situations. So that's another piece. Always be thinking outside the box, not only what you can write about, but how you can volunteer and give back. Brandy, I have to assume that if some of our listeners are not in the state of Florida, they still might be able to get involved in these ways. Do other states have disaster response teams and these kinds of um, you know, opportunities in other areas? Absolutely. So Texas A&M in particular has a really great program, um, but there are also other states. Washington has some involvement, um, LSU, Mississippi. There are definitely some, some other avenues where students can get involved in this. Okay, good. So students, if you're not in the state of Florida, uh, don't despair. You probably have lots of other opportunities. And remember, you have other opportunities we haven't even introduced you to that you can be trying to figure out or explore. Brandy, what pre-vet advice do you have for students since you were once a pre-vet advisor? What is some of your biggest advice for these guys getting ready to apply to vet school? So my biggest piece of advice that I always give to students, and I did this as an advisor, um, really is based on the position that I have now and, and the role that I get to play with in this team. When I first got involved with this team, this was not my trajectory. I had no intention of ever going down this road. I didn't know that this existed. It was just kind of a weird opportunity that got presented to me. Say yes to weird things mm -hmm. because you never know what cool opportunities are going to come out of that. So if it strikes you as a little bit weird and maybe not what your actual plans are, but it looks like a good opportunity and you might learn something from it, 
take advantage of it. You have no idea what you might gain from doing something that is a little bit different and deviates from your track. Yes, I love that advice. Do weird things, especially if it kind of falls into your lap. You know, if you are struggling to find opportunities, especially something that's specific to what you think you want to do, but something else comes your way and you're not so sure about it, go ahead and try it. Because now look at Brandy, you know, a few years later, so immersed in this field that you loved and you didn't even know it was coming your way. Exactly. Oh, I love that advice. I'm going to start giving that to my pre-vet students too. Love it. So that means, students, your homework for this week is to find something weird and do it. Whether it's a gym class that you've never taken or a book that you've never read or an organization that you never joined. Maybe watch some Linda training tutorials on some kind of new skill. But go ahead and do something weird and different and see what you're exposed to to help prepare you even more to become a veterinarian. I wanna thank Brandy for being on the show today. We've learned another aspect about how veterinarians are superheroes and can do all of the things and students and professionals who aren't even interested in becoming in veterinarians can become a part of this unique and wonderful opportunity to give back to their community. I'm Alex Avellino and we'll talk to you soon.